check error occurred. Now, by pressing the stop button, you are able to go back into your code to fix it. What I did is instead of using the length plus one here for the user's input, I changed it to 20. So remember, this only contains 10 characters. If our random char is selecting anything above 10, like 11 or 12, it's trying to go to that character that doesn't exist. In its name, there are only 10 digits or characters stored. So I can't go to a character that isn't there, like for example 11 or 12. It is for this reason why it's better to use the variable i length using the length of the user input plus 1 so that we don't get the range check error. Later today you're going to learn lots more about these nifty components. This one here is called a radio group. For this lesson, all you need to know is that the words you see here are called the items of the radio group and that Delphi allocates then an integer item index to each one of these little buttons. So item index 0 is a trip to space, 1 you can train as an astronaut, we can win any of these prizes, 2, 3 and 4, 4 being nothing. When the user now clicks on the button, click to win, a random prize is selected, trip to space, and also that button is made active. So we can click another one. Oh, I'm winning a telescope. That's great. And so it generates random numbers to allocate a random prize to me. Now remember I said, that there were item indexes, integer numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we need to generate a random number in the range 0 to 4. And again, random range excludes that second number, so we'll put 0, 5. If my program generates a random number, let's say I random was 0, it will then select this first prize here. And the way that I store the input for the prize from the radio group is using the items. Remember the items are the words that we see there. And in square brackets then I put that random number. So when a zero is generated by a random range, trip to space will now be stored inside of S prize which I can then display in my show message. The next thing that you would have noticed when we ran the program is that this little button here then will become blue as though it has been clicked on. And the way I did that was I assigned the item index, that's the number from 0 to 4 in our case, to this random number that was generated. But remember, don't worry too much about this code. Later today, you'll learn lots more about radio groups, combo boxes, and list boxes. Maybe you could then come back to this program and try to see if you can code this yourself. Now look how much fun that is. Changing to random colors. This here is a panel, and I clicked on this button to make it start changing colors. To create this program, you would need a timer. So you can look for that in your palette and search for time and add it to your form. Inside the timer there, I have disabled it. If I leave it on enabled, then it will start running immediately. I'll show you what goes on in there just now. The interval property in the timer is measured in milliseconds. And that is how often that timer's code will run. So in my case, for every thousand milliseconds, the code on the inside of the timer will execute. To make my timer start ticking, I have added the code in this button here to enable the timer. So I've set the enable property to true. And the code that you would like to run 
when the timer ticks, you just double click on the timer and then code in here. Don't worry too much about where you display this timer because it won't be visible or add the timer to your form. Once you run the program, it won't be visible to your user. Here's two methods of changing the color of the panel that are called P and L change to random colors. The first one here uses the color property and for our South Africans, yes, we have to spell it this way and not that way. And we can generate a random number using a hundred thousand year to generate random numbers from zero to how much would that be? 100,000, so that would be 99, and then another three nines after that. And this code runs every time my timer ticks and then changes the color according to that. Another method is making use of the RGB function red, green, and blue. In Dr. Bond's book, you will find that he has used that much later in the textbook where one dimensional rays are covered. The red, green, and blue that needs to be used by RG, the RGB function can be allocated to random numbers from 0 to 255. These should be of data type byte, which is in the range 0 to 255. So my random range here says pick a random number from 0 to 255. These numbers are then stored in these variables and then my panel's color is assigned to the function RGB and then sending it the random values for the red, green and the blue. So you could use either one of these two methods to display random colors on a panel. Something to take note of if you are using a, a panel and you want to change its color is that in your object inspector you change the parent color to false so that it does not keep the color of the form which is its parent. I'm not always sure how much you guys can hear but the loud noises are our loud South African birds, the grey luri and the hodidar that you might hear in the background. I do not have fancy equipment at home and I do not have a sound room but that's the whole point. You don't need fancy equipment to learn how to code. The code we used in our previous example cannot generate a random number starting with zero because we're making use of only integers. Now let's say the person has to click on this button to generate a number that could possibly start with a zero. We would need to use the following code. In one of your lessons from yesterday, you learned how to build strings and use strings in Delphi code. Now that is what we're going to do in this example here. We requested to generate a random number with four digits that could possibly start with zero. I'm going to use a for loop running from one to four to generate the four numbers. And every time my loop executes, I'm going to pick a random number, storing it as an integer, using random range from zero to nine. So this will possibly pick a number zero to start this number off with. But remember, if we store a number with four digits and the first number is a zero, we will lose that z leading zero. Therefore, to keep the zero, we would have to build a string. So I've used a string or s number to build a string with my random numbers. In this way, it will keep the zero in the string should it start with a zero. Remember, when we have a variable on both sides of the assignment statement and there's a loop, we need to initialize that loop to an empty string before the loop executes to give it an initial value. 
Up to now, we've only generated really random numbers. But what if we want to generate some random characters? On page 97 of Dr. Bond's book, he has included the ASCII table which indicates the decimal values for each character. When you have a look here, the capital letter A has the value of 65 and then capital Z has the value of 90. Now remember random range only works with numbers. So we cannot pick random characters by you making use of random range and we'll have to find another way. This program generates a random string with 10 random characters. So we're looping 10 times and on the inside here of my begin and end, I'm picking a random number from 65 to 90. So if you have a look at that ASCII table, the capital letter, letter A has a value of 65 and capital Z has a value of 90. So I'm picking a random number within the range of their decimal values from the ASCII table. Once I have that number, I can use this function, I call it the char function, not to be confused with char, the data type. CHR is a function that receives an integer number and then returns for us the corresponding character from the ASCII table. So should I random be 65, it will generate an A or return an A for us and then that would be added to S code. If I random is 90, the cheddar function will return a capital Z and that will be added to our code. And in this way, we can generate random characters. Have you ever seen on a website where you have to create a username and then pick a password that they sometimes give you a suggestive password that consists of several different characters? You now already have the knowledge to complete this. Let's have a look. My program is going to generate random characters consisting of numbers, special characters on your keyboard, lowercase letters and capital letters. And it's not going to repeat any one of those characters once it's entered. So I have set S characters here at the top to all my possibilities, listing the numbers, the special characters on my keyboard, and all the lowercase letters, I did them in alphabetical order, but it doesn't really matter as long as you have them all in there. And then I added capital letters there as well. And we are going to pick a position in this string here and add that character randomly to a string to create this password. The for loop will loop the number of times that you need the length of that password to be. I made it 20 characters long, quite a lengthy password. What we're going to do on the inside of this loop is first determine the length of this string here, because you'll see that we are going to remove some characters from that string. So the length won't stay the same every time that I'm looping. So here I'm storing I length, as the length of that string. And now I'm finding a random position starting at one for I length plus one. In other words, a random position in this string. If it picks a one, it would then be the character zero. Here I'm building my string with my random characters making use of some string handling. So I am getting access to a random character according to the random position that was picked in this random range. But this, only this, will not ensure that no digits are repeated because it is possible that the code runs and picks the same character again. 
So the easiest way is to remove the character was, that was picked now by making use of the delete procedure. The delete procedure will delete from this string starting at the position that we found the character in and delete one character. So let's say I pos was 2. So the random digit of 2 was generated. That means it picked a 1. 1 is now added here to my output. And then in this line here, that one there will be deleted. So it can't be picked again. I hope you enjoyed this randomness lesson. On YouTube, you can find my channel called Dandelion Delphi. Note the 1 and the 0 because that's what people think we do as programmers code in ones and zeros, but we don't, where I explain to learners how to code in Delphi. Here are some great resources to help you improve on your programming skills. Make sure that you go to YouTube and follow Learn Delphi with Gerard, Mr. Long and myself, Dandelion Delphi. Thank you to all the organizers and especially to Dr. Bond for his book, it's a great resource. All right, fantastic. So that was Leon's session on randomization. Leon, if you're, I think you're on with this, you can join us for the Q and A here. We have a few questions queued up and ready to go. Ah, uh, there you are. I really enjoyed your session, by the way. I really liked the part where you intentionally had an error message and dealt with it because too often I, I feel like too often presenters just like get all the error messages out of their present you know their, their session and then attendees are like when they get those because you always get them that's part of programming then you don't know what's going on so um, there are a few questions here uh first one was where the code that you were showing came from and that actually, I put a link in for the GitHub that has the code up on there for everybody if they want to go download your code. Um, and then the next question is that the random range was bringing up an error message. And I think that's a missing user statement, isn't it, for that one? Yes, I, I believe. It would be a missing statement. Uh, I think you need to add to the users, you need to add the math unit. Right at the beginning of the video, I showed if you scroll right to the top where the users is, you will can add comma math. I know with a new version of Delphi, it adds system.math. But if you just type math, it will add that automatically. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Usually, uh, if you get if you have one of those error messages, usually that's what the, it's. You need to add a uh, a users in there. Um, so there's a question here about the square brackets, and I know you you mentioned that that's going to be covered later in the units. Um, but I guess the square brackets when you're using on the uh, the letters characters in the string. Do you want to maybe elaborate on that a little bit? You know, so if you have a string stored and the simplest way to just test it, yes, it's Sheldon Cooper. It's my new T-shirt. <laughs> I saw some message there. Oh, um, I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> so the, if, to test it, you can store a string and just put square brackets and put a one in there. And you will see that when you run your program, it will uh, display only the first character. If you put a two in there, then you will uh, see the second character. So the square brackets are often used to indicate an index when we are programming in Delphi. Um, I'm using now the, the string handling example where we're using strings, where we can go to specific characters in a string. 
but also if you've done maybe tab stops we need to indicate the index which one are we using so we'll use square bracket zero later today uh, you're going to learn about radio groups combo boxes and list boxes they also have indexes that are indicated with square brackets and i think later tonight is the arrays uh, where that also have indexes that is indicated with square brackets so square brackets are actually used quite often in delphi yeah uh, i i love the indexing with square brackets also i wanted to comment on i love i heard the birds again in the background i love that you pointed out your uh the birds i was like he heard something in the background during your video and you right as i heard was thinking about that you showed the birds i was like oh that's the birds <laughs> There's no way of getting away from them around here. They just everywhere and very noisy. <laughs> That's great. I was in um, Australia, and I guess it's the. I think it was. Oh gosh, I can't remember what bird it was there, but there was a bird there that was really loud, and you always heard it everywhere you were, or at least in the part of Australia I was in. So this was a question that came up um, on the form view. You had little numbers in the top left, and someone was wondering where that came from and what those numbers meant because they weren't seeing it on their Delphi. Yes, it's an add-on that I add uh, install. It's called C and Wizard Pack. Is it called just C and Pack or C and Wizard Pack? No, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, yeah, C and Pack is the website. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, pre I use that in class because also the little numbers are really indicating to you your tab order, which one, you know, would be active first and when you use your tab button, where it would go next. But what is very useful to the learners in my class is uh, that the code changes color. So if you have a for loop and you have a, an if statement inside it with begins and ends, the begins and ends that belong to each other, the way Delphi see it, sees it, not the way maybe the user typed it, would be the same color. So that really helps them to find some errors. Yeah, it, it's a really useful one. There's a couple of different add-ins, and C and Pack is, is one of the more popular ones. That, uh, I really recommend if you know everybody should probably have one of those add-ins installed. Uh, they're they're very helpful, very helpful to have. Uh, let's see here. So this is an interesting question. Um, in the past versions of Delphi, we had to use the randomized procedure to start generating random numbers. Is that required or is that not required anymore? Well, as far as I can see, it's not required anymore. I remember when we just learned Delphi, we had to use randomized because every time you would run the program, it actually picks the same set of random numbers but now it's no longer needed i actually noticed this as well and i dug into this a little bit and i what's going on is i think some of the units that get included by default up in that uses statement one of those has randomize in it and wow. so as long as randomize has been called once then it uses your clock to generate a random seed so um the answer is it depends i guess <laughs> <laughs> Usually you don't need it anymore, but it's probably a good idea to still include it uh, if you want to be positive. But yeah, because I had that same question and because I, I was like, wait, I didn't include randomize and it's still randomizing it. So that's a good question. So here's another one. Um, you're, you talked about string indexing and someone's saying, does not string indexing start from zero or is it one or what, what what's that how do strings index so, your string strings start at one so your first character in a string is one uh if you try to go to character zero i haven't tested it now but i'm sure it would probably give you that range check error that i showed you because you're trying to go to a character that doesn't exist uh, and then we do use the zero when as you will see later today in the next one where we have indexes that delphi allocates if delphi allocates a index to a radio group or maybe your tab stops and your tab set to set your tab stops um, it's going to start at zero but for strings they start at one 
Yeah, the short strings. Uh, there's a comment in there. Short strings, which are the uh, strings. If you specify the length less than two fifty five, then the index zero will tell you the length of the string. But that's not used very much. There are certain use cases we use those, but uh, generally, yeah, they start at, at, at one. So zero would be the length for short strings, but usually not running into those. Um, Right. Uh, let's see. So uh, Patrick pointed out that in a console app, randomize is necessary. So it, it depends on the user statement in your application. So it's probably a good idea to include it. And um, I liked that you did the password generation example. Although, um, so oh, someone asked about where what what seed is used for randomization in Delphi if it's the clock or what it is. It is the clock. So um, if you really want a secure password, you probably want to use a different mechanism for generating it. But that's a good example. It's not really a security consultation here. Um, funny story. It's There was a, a number of years ago when online gambling was becoming popular and people were playing poker online, some uh, company was showing how secure their code was and they showed a screenshot in a video of the randomized routine that they were using and it was written in delphi and they were just using regular randomize which is based on your clock and so somebody saw that and they realized oh they can look at the cards and figure out what the seed was after enough time and they're able to do that from playing a few hands and able to then start predicting cards. So <laughs> there, if you're wanting to get, so this is great for like simple randomization, but there are instances where you wanna have very secure randomization and uh, you need to uh, do some more. There's always, I, that's one thing I love about programming is you can do some things and then you can like start to dig into it and get down a little bit deeper and then get a deeper understanding and do it more complicated. And you can always find new things to challenge yourself, which I enjoy because then I feel like I'm, I'm learning and growing is and such. Uh, let's see here if there's other questions. I probably are. Um, Oh, so here's the question about what key Delphi uses to randomize it. That's it uses the clock uh, with randomize. And oh, let's see, here's a question, and I'm not sure this one. It says we did not reach if and else and try and catch error right. I, and I didn't know. Did you have um, try and catch an error messages in your code? Uh, no, yesterday we did the some if statements, but we haven't done the try and catch errors now. Okay, so yeah, that might be in another session later. I know it's in, in Dr. Bond's book for sure. I try to follow along, but sometimes I miss parts too, so I'm never sure if I just missed that part in your presentation. Um, Um, okay, scrolling through here to see if I missed any of the questions. Um, so, I saw some some question oh, much earlier as well about the images. But they said it wasn't available, but it is in uh, the Win32 folder. Oh, they, maybe they didn't get uh, uploaded. No, we can check that, but maybe the person just didn't go into the uh, Win32 folder, the debug folder. Oh, uh, okay. I They're will in there. check on that. Um. Let's see, a lot of people joining from all over the world. I love that. So thank you everybody for joining us wherever you're coming from. Uh, 
just because the number of people we have, I can't really go through all of the locations, but I really enjoy seeing where everybody's from. It's great. Um, and I think that is it for... I, I, I actually really enjoy random numbers, and so I was glad we had a session on that here because that, that's some of the things... Um, I remember making a program that the when the user mouses over the button there's an event that fires on mouse over and so i had the button jump to a random location on the screen I, that was that's still one of my favorite programs i ever writing uh you know just just some, unexpected behavior yeah you know, for some reason that's one of the uh, my learners when they're 16 they start taking it as a subject mm -hmm. and every year for some reason, one of the boys would code one of those <laughs> trying to click on the button <laughs> when they figure out how to move it randomly away from the mouse. <laughs> it's it's brilliant. I love it because it's just it's something you just don't expect. You know, buttons always should stay put. But uh... <laughs> and then one, usually I can because they challenge me and I'm like, I can stop the program. But now one have managed to re to code the uh when the program closes that it starts running again you can't close the program either <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i remember that and then you're like um you're like oh i could just use the tab key to get to the button or something but then you can like disable the tab stop and <laughs> all that fun stuff uh so there's a question here uh, uh, not related to your session, but will this and other presentations be available to watch later? The yes, that are all up on YouTube right now. Um, you can rewind and watch parts of the session again in the live stream and then jump back live, or you can go and uh, this session's available standalone as well as uh, this entire session. If you come back tomorrow, you can watch the entire li live stream again. So it's all up on the um, Learn Delphi YouTube channel, which I can put a link in here for that. I think, let's see. Let's see. So there is the Learn Delphi YouTube channel if you want to watch any of the replays. Um, oh, and then Patrick put in a link for Dr. Bond's book on there, How to Program Effectively in Delphi, which is a great book. It's 1,200 pages long and even uh experienced delphi developers i've talked to have looked at it like oh i didn't know that <laughs> there's stuff in here that's new to me so it's it's uh it's a good book uh da, 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 da. all right i think that's it unless you saw a question or anything you wanted to add i really i actually enjoyed your session i did it thought you did a good job explaining things no that's all thank you <laughs> Oh, there's a question here actually about the header initializing section of the Delphi program. Oh, so probably the interface versus implementation sections in the code. Um, I have my IDE open here. I can just bring it up and show real quick. This is kind of beyond the scope of your session, but we got a second here so I can show this. Um, so yeah, in when you create a new Delphi program, actually I can just make a new one right now. I'll make a new form. Add new. And then go to the code. There it automatically adds this section here. And so this is the an interface section. Um and this kind of is the the forward declaration about what's going on in your application. So right here, this is your form. That and as I add a find a button to my form, for example, button, it adds it automatically there for me. So and then as I write code, so if I go to my button and say events, click, it puts oops that down here in the implementation section. But then also puts the name of it up here. Um, there is some reasons why this is this way. It helps the compiler compile faster as far as being able to have forward um, declarations of things. Uh, a little more complicated to explain that. But uh, the, yeah, this generally, 
you, you sometimes are making changes. So you can't have your user statement down here uh, uses math here, or you can add uses math up here. And there's a few reasons why you might have it in one place or the other. But the main difference is that if you have a um, something like a button, for example, since the button is in the interface section, then it needs to be, it comes from standard controls, it needs to be up here that that's included. Because if I move this down here, then it wouldn't be there. So you have to use it before you um, use something from it. So that's kind of the basics of it. The book goes into more detail and there's other sessions that talk about this. But since there was a question about that now, I thought it would be good to, to talk about that. All right. Well, thank you so much for your session. And um, I hear someone just said, the book is awesome. Just stumbled upon it yesterday. Yeah, it's a it's 1,200 pages. Lots of good stuff in there. Yep, and then Pat or, uh, Kirk pointed out that you can double-click on the button itself to jump to the event handler. That is true. There are a, a few, always a more than one way to do things. <laughs> that goes, it goes back. It's the uh, like I said earlier. That's one thing I love about programming is that there's lots of lots of ways to lots of things to explore and ways to do things, and and it's a great opportunity to just continually keep challenging yourself with uh, with new ways to learn. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for your session. And let's see what do we have coming up next. Is oh that is uh, I don't, have, don't have the next session on here yet. Let me look at the schedule real quick. The next session is subroutines, procedures, and functions, which is really, really useful uh, session to have, learning how to do that. So if you're watching our session and didn't register, make sure you go out to learn Delphi.org and register so that you can get the follow-up emails and access to all the content. So thanks so much to Leanne for your presentation and for your involvement in the boot camp. And thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Subroutines and procedures and functions coming up next. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over. I think we have some uh, content here we're going to have in before the next session starts. So we'll see you all for Q&A at the next session. Take care, everybody. This is a project that I wrote. You may have seen it before if you've come to ask gear for Delphi webinars, because I think I did it on the desktop first or some, some other conference, one of the many things that I uh, do webinars for. And this is all done with uh, Skier for Delphi as well. And any Star Trek fan will be able to tell you what this is. This is a imitation, shall we say, of a space computer, the LCARS interface. If you're a Star Trek original series fan, then you'll know immediately what that is. And what we've got here are some um, skier for Delphi controls. And if I hit LF11, you can see it's a skier animated image. And this one is an SVG. And uh, there's some more animated images here. These are Lottie animations. So they're basically a bit of XML and, and it draws the animations. These are just simple shapes, as you can see, T-shape and a few other things as well. In the background, there's some source to make things render. But let me just run that for a second so you can see what it looks like when it's running. Oops, oh dear, what did I do? Oh, I broke it, oh no. It was working the other day, no, what did I do? Ha, there you go. It, it, when I opened the project, it automatically added skier in there. So it's playing sounds in the background, which I'm just gonna turn off because we don't really want those on. But as you can see, key things here are the font handling that Skier does. This is a Klingon uh, custom font. It doesn't say anything meaningful, it's all random uh, text. And uh, here's some colored fonts, and then there's some nice uh, column fonts and uh, justified and all the rest of it. Here's some text, there's your SVG. Here's a nice custom Star trek -y type font, and the animations, and all of this is done using open source stuff. I, I didn't create any of this myself. I just drawed them all together, put them in the same place. But it's a simple little demo, but it gives you some idea of some of the things that just straight out of the box you can do. You can get much better animations than these. I just pick ones that look vaguely Star trek -y. But it's very cool. And all of it's enabled by um, Skier for Delphi. You can download this from their website and uh, go to the repository. It's all open source. 
And uh, most of the code that you see there actually is really to do with generating random lines of text. So actually it's nothing to do with the skier stuff. It's just because I wanted to show some plausible text on there. And there this, is a, this is a VCL yeah. sample too, right? Yes, this is a VCL sample. There is someone cleverly has raised an issue against my sample and said, do an FMX version. The difference between the FMX and VCL samples is that in the VCL, these animations here are not transparent. Okay, let me just turn the sound off. On the FMX, this planet background here would be transparent. You probably can't see it very well on the webinar, but this planet image has got a black background, which by default is transparent on FMX. And therefore, the radar sweep actually seems to go around and hover over the top of the planet because I put the Z order so that the radar sweep was on top and it looked like the radar had detected the planet. But that's the only real difference um, between the FMX and the VCL versions. But yes, this is a VCL project and it's good to go. You can use this out of the box and see some of the nonsense I did to uh, make it work. But it gives you some indication of how to load custom fonts and lay it out, put colors in and the play animations. There's nothing difficult with the animations. Load the animation in and uh, get it to play. Same with the font. Their font handling is fairly easy. There's a bit of uh, font handling here. It loads in a open source font, which I do reference in my notes. I put an attribution in there from where I got it loads the font in, uh, creates the font, and then uh, chooses a yellow color, and that's it. That's your custom font loaded. So it could be any font that you like. I love yeah, the fact that you can load the font into your application. It doesn't have to be installed on the computer. That, that's a really big thing. Correct, yes. And and actually, in my notes, I actually put attributions where I got these from, and that fontlibrary.org has got thousands of fonts. I didn't find just one Klingon font. I found about 15. So if there's 15 Klingon fonts, you can bet there's all sorts of other types of uh, font that you could ever want. I just go to uh, GitHub and get it there, but actually, it's a lot easier if you go to the skierfordelphi.org um, site and then go to the uh, repository, and they credit me there very nicely. I didn't do any of the hard work. I just wrote a simple little program. They did all the hard work. loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song, and then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey get up get coffee. Code monkey go to job. Code monkey have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say code monkey very diligent, but his output stink. His code not functional or elegant. What do code monkey think? Code monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code monkey not say it out loud. Code monkey not crazy, just proud. Code monkey likes Fritos. Code monkey like to have a mountain do. Code monkey, very simple man. The big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart. Code monkey like you. Code monkey like you. Code monkey hang around at front desk. Till your sweater look nice. Offer buy you soda, bring you cup, bring you ice. You say no thank you for the soda, cause soda make you fat. Anyway, you busy with the telephone, no time for chat. Code monkey have long walk back to cubicle. He sit down, pretend to work. Code monkey not thinking, so straight. Code monkey not feeling, so great. Code monkey like Fritos. Code monkey like to have a mountain dew Code monkey very simple man Big warm fuzzy secret heart Code monkey like you Eat 
your coffee cake, take bath, take nap. This job fulfilling in creative way, such a load of crap. Code Monkey thinks someday he have everything, even pretty girl like you. Code Monkey just waiting for now. Code Monkey says someday, somehow. Code Monkey likes Fritos. Code Monkey likes Tab and Mountain Dew. Code Monkey, very simple man. Big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart. Code Monkey like you. Code Monkey like you. Code Monkey, get up, get coffee. This is actual object pass Kel code and was recorded in real time. You can compile it with Delphi or App Method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well. Welcome to session core 7 of the Delphi Bootcamp, Introduction to Subroutines, Procedures and Functions. My name is Johan Heistek, I'm the IT teacher at Ellis Ras High School in Lepalale, Limpopo, South Africa. I also live in Lepalale, uh, the previous name of our town, where Ellis Ras, and I'm passionate about teaching my students. In short, uh, we are going to look at the definitions of subroutines, advantages of using subroutines, and then subroutine libraries which we use every day, and then user written functions and procedures. Uh, we're going to reference definitions from Dr. Kevin Arbon's textbook, How to Program Effectively in Delphi for ASA Level Computer Science. And uh, functions and subroutines are chapter 13 in this textbook. The resources uh, are there on the screen uh, that are available for this session. Now let's look at the definition of a subroutine. A subroutine is a named self contained block of instructions. By encapsulating and naming a block of instructions in a program, it becomes possible to call the block from other parts of the program. Now, this is very useful in situations where the same block of instructions or actions or calculations need to be repeated in multiple places in a program. Um, if we look at the advantages of using subroutines, uh, without subroutines, all programming code would consist of inline blocks of programming instructions. Now, this would make even programs of modest size difficult to understand and difficult to program. Removing blocks of instructions from the program block and placing these in out of line named subroutine blocks reduces the intellectual demand needed to understand what the program does. Subroutines can be worked on separately, which is useful when writing and debugging software. Different subroutines can be given to different members of a team to write and debug, uh, uh, so subroutines make it easy to work in teams. Subroutines written for one program can be reused in different programs. If a subroutine is particularly useful, it can be added to a library of subroutines, which can be imported into any program which needs them. Now, Delphi includes libraries of pre-written functions and procedures that we use every day. Uh, if I can just name a few functions, int to string, copy, pass, length, rand between, and a few procedures, show message, delete, insert, ink, and randomize. Now, functions and procedures sometimes make use of parameters. A parameter is values that 
these subroutines need to be able to perform the task assigned to them. So it's basically values that they receive, which they use to do maybe calculations. Now, how can we determine whether a subroutine is a function or a procedure? A function, the calling instruction, which is the name of the function with its parameter, is always part of an other instruction. A function is a subroutine returning a single answer. Now let's quickly look at an example of the uh, subroutines, the functions in the function library of Delphi. I have declared three variables, two string variables, sline and s scores, and then an integer variable, ipos. Now if we assign a value to the variable sline, with direct assignment, I love the hash Delphi bootcamp. But let's say, for example, I am only interested in extracting Delphi bootcamp from that string. I need to know where the hash sign is. And for me to be able to identify where the hash sign, uh, the first hash sign in the, in the string start, I use the pos function. You will see the pos function uh, will return an integer answer and that will be assigned to the variable ipost. The post function uh, have two parameters. The first one is the character or the string that we are going to search for and the second one is the string in which we are going to search for the character or the string or the word in the other string. So in this case uh, we're going to search for the position of the hash sign in the variable s line and then position will return an integer answer and allocate it to the variable ipos and now it's easy to just copy from the character after the hash sign uh, to determine to extract Delphi bootcamp from the string. I love the hash Delphi bootcamp. Now I have just added a quick instruction there. Uh, it's a little bit of a cheat uh, to, to extract the Delphi bootcamp. Um, in fact, the copy function say I must specify from where we must start copying and the number of characters. But you will see I have just added 30. 30 is longer than the variable s lines length so this is a little bit a cheat it's not the 100 percent correct way you will see the instruction here below is the more appropriate way of doing that but i just want to keep keep it simple so what happens the copy function is a string function i sent it one two three parameters the first parameter is the string variable where we want to copy out the second parameter, i post plus 1, is from where in the string must we start copying. And remember, the hash sign is not part of the Delphi bootcamp that we want to extract. That's why we say i position plus 1. And then we just say uh, 30 characters, which is longer than the string i love the hash Delphi bootcamp. The more appropriate way is to to, to use the length function to determine the length of the string, subtract the position of the hash sign, and then we have the calculation on how many characters need to be carried out. So this is in short a function, uh, functions that we use. So at this stage, we use the function, the, the position function and the copy function, as well as the length function that are included in the Delphi libraries. Uh, if we can quickly look at the procedure, the calling instruction, which the name of the procedure with its parameter is an instruction on its own. If we just go back one slide and we see that POS is part of the assignment instruction, and that's how I identify that it's a function. Uh, if we look at the uh, procedure, uh, we will see that the procedure's name with its parameter is an instruction 
on its own when calling a procedure. Now let's look at an example. I've declared the variable inum of the type integer. inum will extract a value from a spin edit and let's say for example we allocate the value 100 to inum. Now, increase is my procedure. Increase have one parameter in this case. I send it 100 and it will increase it with one. And the moment I use the show message procedure, which is also a procedure to display the value, we will now see that the number will be 101 because the increase procedure increase the value by one. You will also see here, uh, increase can also have two parameters. Uh, let's say, for example, I want to increase the variable with an increment of five. And there you can see, now we have called the message, the show message procedure, and inside it, we call the int to string function. And to display inum. So you can see into string is part of the show message, but the show message are an instruction on its own. And this is how we determine the difference between a function and the procedure. Now let's move over to see how that works in Delphi. I'm quickly going to refer back to the two uh, examples that we have just uh, done in the slideshow of the uh, functions included in the Delphi library. So we're first going to quickly uh, look at the function uh, that we have just done. Uh, we're going to need to declare our variables s line and s course, which will be which will be our string variables as well as i position which will be the integer variable uh, I'm going to allocate a value to s line as we said with direct assignment I love the Delphi bootcamp and I'm just going to duplicate this instruction uh, to make it easy for us to just test it with another value uh, I love the Delphi procedures and functions uh, so then we will have two uh, variable, uh, two, two different values for the variables to take that. Now first we're going to use the, uh, the pause function to extract the position of the hash sign. So I am going to use my variable ipos. Ipos will receive the value from the position function. Sorry for that. From the position function, we are going to say we're going to search for the hash sign in the variable s line. So now we have, have the position of the hash sign in s line. And then we want to allocate Delphi bootcamp by using the copy function to the variable s course. So s course will get the value from the copy function. I'm going to send it the variable s line as parameter and I'm going to say I need it to start copying in the position i post plus one. Remember the plus one it's because the hash sign is not part of the uh, part of the string that I want to extract out of S line. And now we need to say, okay, we need to specify the number of characters that needs to be copied out. So I'm going to say 
length of S line minus I position, uh, the position in where the hash sign is. So now I I have extracted the course name, so now it will return the string Delphi Bootcamp. I'm just going to quickly uh, show it with a show message procedure. Now if I run this now and I click on function it will return the value Delphi Bootcamp. Uh, if I take another string there and I run it, it will say Delphi procedures and functions. So there we have used and see how the Delphi library functions is working. So in this case, we have used the position function. Can you see it's part of another instruction? The copy is also part of another instruction and even length is included inside another instruction. So this is how we determine uh, the difference between a function and a procedure. The procedure part, if we quickly look there, uh, you will see that we have allocated the value 100 to the spin edit. Uh, I'm going to declare my variable that I'm going to need, it, need here. I num I num will be integer I num will receive its value then from the spin edit I'm just quickly going to check what is the name of my spin edit is yet your number dot value and now straightforward I'm just going to call the inst increase procedure and send inum as a parameter and if I use the show message procedure now inside I, I, I will have to use the function int to string I num and then we will see if it is working. Remember, we allocate the value 100 to inum on the form. So if I run this, and I, you can see it will return 101. I can also use increase to increase it with an increment of 5. Then increase will have two parameters. So let's quickly see that in action. We start with 100 and then it will return 105 as an answer. So that is in short how the libraries work. Um, you will see I, I always teach my students to add comment lines between the events. In this case it's easy to distinguish and see where a specific subprogram start and end, especially when uh, the program becomes becomes large, then I like to add these comment lines so that you can easily distinguish where a procedure end and start. Now we are going to write our own function. I chose my example so that we can also see the multipurpose that writing a fun function can bring to us. We are going to write one function that we can use for various scenarios. You will see on the user interface that we are going to use a South African ID number as well as a South African cell phone number. The reason for that is they differ in the length and we want to use the same function to determine if the length of the ID or cell contains the correct number of digits. I just want to emphasize that we keep in mind that we store the ID as well as the cell number in a string variable. 
in short, we store the cell number as a whole number. The zero in front of it will be omitted and fall away. When we want to write our own written function, we need to keep in mind the steps that we must follow. The first step is to declare the function. Remember, we want to make the function multipurpose. And this means for this function, we are going to have two container variables to which the parameter of the function call the parameters of the function call will be transferred to. Now let's declare our own function. So if we go back to, uh, to the coding block, we will see that in the private section, we are going to declare our function. And if it's a function, it will start with the, the uh, uh, word function. And then after that, we will use the name that we are going to give the function. In this case, we are going to use in, call it test len. Uh, remember, I said uh, there will be two parameters. So my function will basically have two containers which will receive this uh, uh, parameters. So the first one, I just call it test len. And this uh, container will receive the variable, let's say, for example, the ID number that we are going to test, and this will be a string variable. Keep in mind, if the one parameter is string, it must be the same in the container, uh, also a string. The second one will be we're going to test for a specific length. So I'm just going to call this container I test for len, and that will be of the type integer. Uh, now, if we look at the function name test for length, the function name is basically going to return a indication if the specific, the ID or the, the, the cell number is the correct number of digits. Uh, so test for length, the function, that this will mean that this will be Boolean function. So test uh, function test len is a Boolean function. That means that it will return a Boolean variable. After declaring the function, we need to create the skeleton of the function, and we do this with the keyboard shortcut Control Shift C. Control Shift C, and then you will see it, is, it created the skeleton for this function. For us. Uh, now we can start doing the code. And remember, inside this function, we are going to work with these two containers here. And I am going to write the code here. We will say if length of s test. And remember, it will either be the ID number or the cell phone number that is going to be received uh, in this container. So if the length of S test equals the variable I test for len, then that means uh, that the specific uh, test that we carried out was successful. And now normally uh, we use result just, uh, for the returning answer. So we will say, Result in this case will be true. Remember, our function uh, is a Boolean function. That's why result equals true. You can also uh, use the name of the function. I'm just going to add this here. The name of the function test for len equals true. Whichever one you uh, decide to use, but we normally use result because it's a lot of uh, a lot quicker typing a longer name if the function have a longer name. Then else the result will be false. So there we have written our function. Uh, remember we have the two containers. The two containers will uh, catch up, the, will receive the, the parameter values that we sent them and use that to return a Boolean answer in this uh, case. Now, if we go back and I go to test for ID, we uh, are going to use this function now, and that will be the, the third step uh, 
in creating. Now we need to write the code that is going to use this function. So I'm going to start here in my variable block. Uh, I'm going to start with SID. SID will be string. And we're going to extract that the value for SID from the edit. SID. And then I just need to see my ID. ID.text. So now we have extracted the ID number from the edit box. And now we're going to call the function. And now we are going to say, okay. And remember we said uh, that a function name is part of another instruction. And previously we, we said that it can also be part of an if statement. So I'm going to say if. Uh, if you go down a little bit, you will see the function name. I normally tell my students to copy this over to the calling instruction there. And paste it there because then I have my, my uh, function name. So I say if test len and then I'm going to test the ID number. So in the place of the first container my, will be my first parameter. In the place of the second container, I will send the value which I want to test this for because, because I know I'm going to test uh, the ID number. That's why I make it fi fixed because a South African ID equals uh, 13 digits. Uh, the, the, the instruction is complete, but I know if some of the learners still struggle, I like to tell them complete it by saying if test len ID comma 30, 13 equals true. So test lane will receive an answer. Uh, if the answer is true, it will show us a message. And I'm going to use the show message function here to display a specific answer. Uh, let's say I'm just going to display ID length is valid. Else, and I always tell my students we are allowed to cheat a little bit to be lazy with, with IT because we can copy and paste instructions because that will save us a lot of time. Else show message ID length not valid. So if I run this program now and we see if I run it there. It will say the ID is the length of the ID is valid. If I take out a digit, it will say the length is not valid. If I add two digits, it will also say the length is not valid. And now again, now we are ready uh, to complete the part where we test. We use the same function to test if the cell phone number. Uh, is of a valid length. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, go back to the form, double click, get my form create instruction. Ah, uh, not sorry, not form create. My button cells click event, and then I'm just going to copy this piece of code. Remember, we've already done the hard work, so I'm going to copy that code over, and I'm just going to it quickly instead of SID I'm going to say it's my cell uh, and the cell number we will extract from the cell from the cell edit and then we will test the cell number for 10 digits and then we will just say cell and cell and there we go we can test it if I test the cell number it tell me the cell number is of a valid length if I add a digit it will tell me the cell phone number is not valid if I take out more digits it will tell me that the cell phone 
is not valid. So now we have seen that by writing a function, we can make it multi-purpose. And that's one of the uh, examples that we used as the advantages of using uh, sub-programs where we can use code over again without changing a lot on the code. In the last part of the session, we will see how a self-written procedure works. We are going to start with a procedure that has no parameters and then a procedure with one parameter and lastly, we're going to write a procedure that uses three parameters. One of these parameters is only value parameters, which mean that it is only to pass a value to the procedure. This parameter can therefore not return a value from the procedure. The other two are reference parameters, which mean they can return answers for us. This procedure will work with the South African ID number and then return the age and the gender of the person to whom the ID number belongs. Again, we will follow the steps, the same steps as we have used with the functions. First of all, we need to declare the procedure. Then we create the skeleton of the procedure, add the code to the procedure, and then call the procedure. We said that the function is used to return one answer. With a procedure, we can therefore receive more than one answer back. And that is when the reference parameters come into play. Let's declare our first procedure. We will start with the reserved word procedure, followed by the name of the procedure. In this case, we're going to use show heading. Uh, no parameters involved. So there is my procedure declaration. If I press Control Shift C, it will create the skeleton uh, for my procedure. And you will see we have a rich edit here, which we're going to use for display. So I'm going to clear the rich edit. And then I'm going to add an instruction, rich edit. Dot add. Let's say Delphi Bootcamp. Uh, now my next step will be uh, to create the calling instruction for this procedure. So I am going to my button, create the quick event of my button. Of my button and then I'm just going to use the procedure name as my calling instruction there. So if I run this now you will see that procedure will be used to add the Delphi bootcamp heading for example into the rich edit. Now as I said this is a fixed heading so every time I call show heading it will just add the heading Delphi Bootcamp, but we can make it a little bit more multi-purpose by using parameters. So instead of having, having a procedure with no parameters, we create a procedure with a parameter. So headings, I'm just going to add an S for the uh, procedure's name so that uh, the two procedures doesn't have the same name. At the back of the heading, I am going to uh, create the co container where the parameter will go into so that the procedure can receive that parameter. And we're going to call this one just as heading info. This will also be a string uh, container or then a, a parameter. Right, so there is my container uh, where the parameter is going to 
be transferred into so that procedure show heading will be able to display whatever is sent by the calling program. So press Control Shift C. And then we're going to write the code there. Uh, I'm just going to copy this code quickly from that procedure. This one we're also going to clear, but instead of having Delphi Bootcamp here, we will use this container bucket uh, where the parameter will go into so that it will display whatever is sent from the calling program to this bucket and then that will be displayed. Now the second step, we need to write the code so that we can see how this procedure works. And that is where button headings comes in. Right. Um, we're going to create a variable for this. And I'm going to say uh, create a variable s heading. And s heading will be string. Uh, S heading will receive value from the user of an input box. Uh, it's just an indication that this is about uh, customized heading, and then we will have the message please. Type your heading. And I'm going to make the last parameter there for the input box uh, a clean parameter so that the user can just uh, type uh, what he, whatever he wants to be displayed. And then we will call the procedure show headings and we're going to send a variable s headings s heading to the procedure and display now we're done and now we can test the moment i click here the input box will pop up and i will say boot camp examples If I press OK, heading bootcamp examples will appear in the reach edit. If I open it again and I say functions and procedures, it will display functions and procedures inside the reach edit output area. Let's tackle our last procedure. And uh, as a result of that, it looks like we're going to run out of time. I have pre-added uh, the code, and I'm go only going to explain what I have done here. So my, our first step is to declare the procedure, and this procedure is going to extract the info from the ID. Uh, there will be a container in the parameter list to receive the ID. Uh, you will see that the difference between age and gender, we have a var in front of the variables, uh, where we don't have a var in front of the first parameter here. Now, this means if there's no parameter, no var in front of the parameter, it means that it's a value parameter and it's only to receive a value so what that means is the calling program is just sending a value so that the procedure can work with that. The var means uh, it's a reference parameter, so it will receive a value or maybe a, a, a zero, uh, a initializing value, or maybe a, 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 a specific character. But this doesn't matter if it receives anything there because this is only to go back. So if we, there are two one-way communication when we work 
with a value parameter it's only to send to the procedure but if uh, there's a var in front there's two-way communication so I can send a value if the procedure changes on that value it will send the changed value back now the next step control shift C and again I have created a text file here so that I can quickly copy the code because we're running out of time so I'm just going to copy and paste the code into the skeleton of our procedure and then I'm just going to explain what happened uh, you will see again there is where I am going to receive the ID number and this is to return the age that was extracted from the ID number and return the gender extracted from the ID number now for this example I declared uh, a variable birth year uh, so that we can extract uh, the birth year out of the ID number uh, and we're going to use that a little bit later now we all know um, I like it to to have my where I code to have an example of what I'm working and that's why I pasted the um, ID number there as a comment line so if we look at any South African ID number the seventh character if that is larger than a five then it means the person of the ID number is male so if we say if string to int s id received the seventh character it's larger than four then gender will be male else gender will be female so now gender will be ready to be transferred back to the calling program and then we are going to copy the birth year uh, out of the id number we're going to copy out of the id number from the first character we're going to copy out two characters and then we have the birth year and then we're quickly going to do a little bit of uh, assumption here we will say if the birth year is larger than 20, 20 uh, than 22 it means then we are going to say that the birth year will be a 1900 birth year if it's smaller or equal to 22 then it means it's a 2022 at, uh, year 2000 birth year so what we're going to do if the birth year is smaller it's larger than 22 take the birth year and add 1900 to it else add 2000 to it right and then we can just calculate the age the age will be 2022 minus birth year then okay uh, i know that we could have extracted and work with the system date but we haven't done this in this example otherwise this would have take, taken a little bit longer so now we have extracted the gender out of the id as well as calculated the age of the person now if we go back to the form and we go to the info id info uh, button uh, which we're going to use to call this procedure and again to save time i have the code copied here otherwise we will not finish in time so i'm going to paste it here right now i'm going to explain quickly uh, i i need a variable uh, which will be used as the parameter uh, sid which is a string i need a variable c gender which will catch the gender back from the procedure as well as IH that will catch the H back from the procedure so SID will be extracted from the idiot.id.txt we work with the same one we've used there and now I have just allocated a value to gender and I made it on purpose a star and I on purposely add zero for the age ah we can also if we want to let's rather make it a minus one uh, something strange which cannot be an age and this is only to show after the procedure has executed it is it will replace the star with the gender and it will replace the minus one uh, with the age of the person so now i am calling extract info i sent the id and i sent the parameter which will at the end brings back 
the age of the person and then to display and this is also to just show that the procedure that we created previously show headings we're going to use this to display the heading there's actually only one problem because of the clear instruction it will only show the gender so for this explanation i am going to comment out the clearing instruction there otherwise it will look if our instructions doesn't carry out right and the code is not right although it's not faulty so if we run this now and i press this button it will return the age of the person is 50 and i know that's correct because 72 is also my birth year and now i gave away my age and then uh, that will also be my uh, uh, digit seventh digit in my id is also a five and there it return gender of the person as male and that's all from my side uh, thanks for listening enjoy the rest of your day Okay, uh, the audio seemed to cut out there at the end, but that's fine. So I have uh, Jean on here for me with the, to do some questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in there and John and I will get them answered for you. Hello, John. Or is it? Hello, John? how are you? Am I pronouncing your name correct? Is it Johan or John? Yon. Yon? Okay. I am not Yon. very good at name pronouncing. I even pronounce my own name wrong sometimes, actually. So <laughs> um I so I love the the idea of subroutines. Because I remember when I was learning to program way back in a long time ago. Um, you know, we, I just wrote all of my code out, right? Just linear writing it out and then when i learned i could write you reusable bits of code that was really powerful and it's kind of like you know the idea of uh of you know words right is that you have a word that means something right i don't need to explain what this word means each time i can just use this word and it has that meaning every time so um so there's a question here uh, since I understood the difference between procedures and functions, but what about subroutine? Yeah. So, what is the difference between a procedure and a function and a subroutine? The subroutine is just the umbrella name for both of them, if I can say it like that. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. I've heard the I heard the term method too sometimes used. So method, sub sub program, subroutine. Are all the same thing, but then procedure or functions is the the specific yes. differences between the two. Yes, I, I normally teach uh, functions and procedures to my learner, and then I taught them this is the predecessor of going over to OOP, because when we work in, with OOP, then we call it methods, and the methods is functions and procedures. Then. Ah, uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so in, in on an object has methods which yeah that's okay yeah all right that makes sense um so the question here can you not write the procedure with an added variable test for length so i guess that, that's probably a reference to one of the procedures you were writing if you could uh test the length of the variable yeah remember i see one of the comments ask the uh, or, or, or indicated that we could have say result equals length, uh, but for simplicity, this is uh, this is for beginners, so that's why why I extract it, the code longer for more understanding for the learners that still struggle. Okay, that makes sense. That's always the tricky thing is to 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 do it in a way that explains it without being too. Uh, uh, because I, <laughs> I always tell the learners also start with the longer solution as long as you can get to a solution and later the shorter uh, solutions will come by itself 
as as they progress. That's a that's a really good point. And I, yeah, I, I a lot of times I work with programmers that try to be try to, to get too clever too quick. <laughs> yeah, get, get it working. Get the longer solution yeah. first. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. Let's see. So uh, there's a few comments here about uh, var and const in the arguments for things. I, yeah, I don't know if you want I, to read on that again, or yeah, we can basically say if we have a in the parameter list a, a, a variable without a var, that's basically one way communication. So the calling uh, function or proceed uh, the calling procedure only sends a value to be used. When we add a var, it means there, there's uh, two-way communication. So if I send, for the example that we use, if I send, if I add it for, for, for the gender, a star, for the gender character, and we send the star to the calling procedure, to the procedure on top, and there's a var parameter, it's a var parameter, then if the procedure changes it to male or female, it will send back the male or female. It will basically overwritten uh, then that value. Uh, so without the var, it's one-way communication to the, uh, from the calling program. But if there's a var, the calling program expects an answer if the procedure changes the value uh, in the procedure of that specific parameter. Now, if you don't specify var or const, what is the what what is the behavior then? If you're not specifying, if if in the calling uh, uh, program, if I send if I allocate a, a star to gender, and I remove the var, and in the procedure it allocates male, then the calling procedure downstairs will still display the star and not the male or the female that was uh, determined by the procedure. Okay, uh, there's a question here from Terry. He says, perhaps I missed it, but when you are deciding which to use, how do you decide to use a function or procedure? A function normally only returns a single value. So a function is a smaller program and as the example on the uh, where we need to uh, a, 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 a subroutine that returns more than one answer, then or a larger piece of code in the, in the sub program, then it will normally be a procedure. But a, 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 a function is normally a short uh, subroutine. I like to think of functions as kind of like a, a mathematical function, right? So yes. like, if it's like. If you're going to do take some argument and do one thing, um, then yeah. yeah like, like square root, it returns only the square yeah. root. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. I realize as I'm thinking about this more, I'm thinking more from an uh, object-oriented perspective about functions and procedures, but uh, which it, we're, we're going to get into more of that later. But uh, it, it from a just a functional programming or a procedural programming point of view. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. So there's a comment here about um, if statements or question about if statements. The do you always have to use equals in if statements? Yeah, remember in a if statement it's basically where we 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 have a comparison. We compare something to one another. We don't assign a value. That's why we, we only use an equal sign and not a double point equal sign. Because the equal sign is comparing a specific value to another value. And right. that's okay. why the equal sign. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Jamie said, if I understand correctly, functions have an inline return value. So yeah, their functions always have a value that they return a result. Yeah, that return. yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, let's see. So one of the uh, examples that you showed had sender as an object parameter. What is the purpose in sender? So yeah, so sender is, it's uh, related to the object oriented programming, uh, which we'll get to later. Yeah. The, 
but uh, yeah, it, it is. It yeah, it, that's part of the object oriented programming, which we'll yeah, get to later. What really <laughs> like to to the function and procedures in this scenario? Yep. All right. Um, so there was a question here. Uh, let's see about the book. The book is available, I believe, worldwide. You can uh, buy the print copy of the book on Amazon or the e the PDF on uh, the website for it. And I believe the PDF is available worldwide. And there's another question about the slides. So uh, we're working on getting the slides published. They're not all up on GitHub yet, but they will be there shortly. So uh, everybody can. Uh, check out the GitHub link, which if you're not registered for the boot camp, make sure you are registered at learndelphi.org. And we will get the uh, an email out with all of the uh, links for the slides and code and stuff like that. So thank you so much for your session. It's, uh, you did a good job of explaining the fundamentals. It's, it's, tri it's interesting for me because... Um, it's like, oh, I didn't think about it at that level, you know, because <laughs> like I was saying, I think about more at the object oriented level, but yeah. it, it's good to have the basis, the, the fundamentals so that you can build on it with the object oriented session. Yeah, later, so. you, you, you must remember we we work with great teams that not normally, not necessarily have coding background. And so we, yep. will, have, we, we will need to, we need to start on the more simplified solutions. Uh, and then we work from there. But but luckily we are um, busy with introducing Scratch to the grade eight and nine, and then it will, will will change a little bit. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. Bye. So we have five minutes until our next session starts. So if everybody needs to stretch your legs or whatever, go ahead and do that. And if you haven't downloaded uh delphi yet i go out to embarcadero you can download the free community edition for students and hobbyists if you're a professional developer then you can find the link there as well for the 30-day trial and uh, maybe if you're on an older version of delphi go out and download the the latest version and see what's new um there is a, actually a uh, delphi continues to be updated it's uh <laughs> Interesting how often I run into people that are like, oh, I didn't know Delphi was still being updated. Yes, it is. It's still, we still regularly expanding on it. New users using it all the time and great new features being added. So go check it out and um, take advantage of uh, the, uh, the, the, the trial. And there is a new version coming out very soon as well, a new release, 11.2. All right, thank you, everybody. And we'll see you in the next Q&A.
Hi everyone, welcome to Coding Bootcamp. My name is Dijon Weyer and I'm going to explain text files and streams. So let's start. Let's look first at a text file. What is a text file? It is a character file that contains text with no formatting. Text files provide a simple, convenient and permanent way of storing textual data. When working with large volumes of data, it can be time consuming to enter data manually. We could instead use information stored in text files as input. It is easy to create your own text file by using a text editor like Notepad, or you could even use the code editor in Delphi. It is always important to remember to store the text file in the same folder as your program so that it can be easily read. There's a few methods that we associate with text files, and it's like assign file, reset, read line, close file, append, and rewrite. I will explain them in detail later on. Now let's look at streams. Streams are just ways of reading and writing data. The support for streaming is a core area of the Delphi class library. In How to Program Effectively in Delphi for ASA Level Computing Science by Kevin R. Bond, he explains that stream is just a river of data that can be accessed, and that the key concept behind this class is the sequential access. This means reading and writing from a stream of bytes. Let's start with the coding side of the bootcamp by looking at the algorithm to read from a text file. Firstly, we need to check the information inside the text file. This text file contains people's ID numbers, height, age, and is separated with different placeholders. There are nine steps to follow when reading from the text file. Step 1. Declare. The following declarations is standard when reading from a text file. The first one is the file variable myRFile that is going to store a copy of the information that was inside the text file. We need S1 line to store one line of information from the file variable. And then we've got iPlace to determine the position of the placeholder and a counter to count how many lines was there in the text file. Step 2. Test. It is never a waste of time to test if your text file is in your program folder. Using a basic selection structure, we want to use a Boolean function file exists to indicate if the given path exists or not. If it can't find the file, then the error message will appear and the event will exit. The exit is very important because else the program will crash in step 4. Step 3. Assign. The procedure assign file has two parameters and creates a link between the logical and physical file. The first parameter is the file variable and the second parameter is the file name you've tested. Step 4. Reset. The procedure resets, opens an existing file for read-only access and sets the file pointer at the beginning of the file. If a question in the exam asks you to go back to the start of the file, then you need to add another reset procedure. Step 5. Loop. We want to use a conditional while loop because we don't know how many lines are there inside the text file. The boolean function, end of file, tests if the file variable is at the end, and if it's not, then it sends back false. The condition must be true for the loop to happen, and that is why we add the not in front of the function, because not false is equal to true. So while it is not the end of the file, it must loop again. Step 6, 7, and 8 happens inside of step 5. Step 6. Read. The procedure read line has two parameters. The first one is the file variable and the second one is the variable to store the line of text. The purpose of a read line is to read the selected line of text from the current file pointer position in the file and moves the file pointer to the next line. A helpful hint here, if they want you to read more than one line at a stage, you add more read lines because each read line is going to read a specific line of code. Step 7. Extract. To start off step 7, we need to look at the information inside the text file. In this example, 
we see three values, ID, height, and age, separated with two placeholders, hash and dollar sign. Create variables to store each value and do step 7 for the amount of values in the text file minus 1. In this example, there are three values, so I must do step 7 twice. Let's look at step 7.1, 7.2 and 7.3. Step 7.1 is to find the index position of the placeholder using position. Position has two parameters, namely substring and string. So in other words, what are you searching for is the first parameter, and where are you searching it in is the second parameter. Remember that you can search for more than one character, like double hashes. Step 7.2 is to use the function copy with its three parameters to copy out of the value from the line of text, S1 line, from the beginning, that's 1, for the amount of of one less than the position of the index that we found the placeholder, step 7.1, because we don't want the hash sign to be in the ID. Step 7.3, we want to remove all the information that we already saved using the procedure delete. Delete and copies parameters are exactly the same. Out of what do you want to delete? S1 line. Where do you want to start to delete from? from position number one, and how many characters do you want to delete? I place and take away the hash sign. So after step 7.3, the only information left is the height and the age. We do step 7 again, getting the position in 7.1, copying the value in 7.2, also you can see there we convert it to the correct data type, and then removing all the saved information in 7.3. The only information left is the age, and we can give the variable age the value of S1 line. It is important to note that this place most learners fails text file questions. In, even if they question ask you to extract only a specific value and not all, don't fall for the trap. Extract all the values and just use the one you need. Step 8. Process and display. Step 8 is a place where you test the values extracted or you display the values. This is the only place in the algorithm you will use the other tools and structures. Step 9. Close. Step 9 must happen outside the loop. So that means outside step 5. And it closes the link between the text file's logical and physical file name. So what happens when you want to save the information into arrays and not variables? There's a bit of extra code that we need to add. When we have an array, it will usually be declared globally because we want to use it in more than one method. And an iComplete variable to save the amount of lines read. We start inside the loop step 5, and step 6 stays the same, but we increase the counter to indicate that we have read a line. Looking at step 7, all the code stays the same, except for adding the values inside the array instead of variables, and we use the counter as an index value indicating the container 1 gets the value, and the next time container 2 gets the value, etc., as the loop goes on. A hint for step 9 is that you save the counter in the global variable iComplete. This is going to help you to display the array in other methods. Next up is the writing to a text file algorithm. The algorithm has 5 steps, so let's start. Step 1. Declare. We want to create a file variable to link and a variable to add all the information together. Step 2. Assign. The same as step 3 in our previous algorithm, and remember that the second parameter does not have to exist yet. Step 3. Test. The reason why we want to test is to determine if the file, save.txt, already exists or not. Because if it does not exist, we want to create a new file using the procedure rewrite, and to set the file pointer at the beginning of the file. Else, we want to use the procedure append. 
that opens the file for writing and sets the file pointer at to the end of the file. Step 4. Write. After the file is prepped and ready for use, we want to write a value inside the file using the procedure write line. Write line has two parameters. The first one is the file variable, and the second parameter is the value you want to write back to the text file. It writes a line of text at the file pointer and adds an end of the line marker. Learners tend to forget to do step 5 and close the file variable. Remember, it's like a book. If you open it up, you must close it. If it stays open and you try to open it again, it will break. Here is an example of all the steps together. We have finished looking at the algorithms of text files and going to start with algorithms of streams. Like text files, we can read and write streams and the following examples are console based. So the units you need to have is classes and sysutils declared under users. Firstly, we are going to create a new text file and write information into it. Step 1. Declare. A write stream object must be connected to the tStreamWriter class. Step 2. Write. Instantiate the write object by calling Uh, gaan met die, ja, stand die eerste stuk af. Ek gaan nou weer begin tel. Let's say, 5, 4, wacht. Okay. 5, 4, 3. Step 2. Write. Instantiate the write stream object by calling the constructor of the tStream writer class. The two parameters are the name of the text file and a boolean value. False means it must create the text file and true means it must append the text file. We can use the right line property of the object that we created to add information to the text file. Remember to always free the object that you created after you've used it. The following algorithm is to read information from a stream. Step 1. Declare. A read stream object must be connected to the tStream reader class. Step 2. Read. Instantiate the read stream object by calling the constructor of the tStream reader class. A conditional loop is used because we don't know how many lines there are in the text file. To extract one line of the text file, we use the read line property of the object. After that, we manipulate the S1 line variable to get the different values out of the text file. Let's get to examples of text file questions. This question, 3.2.2, Determine and Set Distance, comes from a May-June 2022 question paper. It states, The information for each city of departure, designation, and distance between the cities is stored in a delimited text file data q3.txt. The format of each line of the text in the text file is the departure city, comma, destination city, hash, distance between the cities. Alright, so now there we see the examples of the first five lines of the text file. Write code to do the following. Extract the distance between the selected departure city and destination city from the text file data q3.txt. Set the distance attribute of the object to the distance extracted from the text file. Display the distance in the edit box. And use a two-string method to display the update information in the object in the rich edit read q3. We can see that we don't want to do the display or the two-string yet, but I will show you examples. Information to look out for is what's the name of the text file, data q3.txt and the example data out of the text file. The question asks us to extract information out of the text file. Following the steps that we have learned, step one, declare. A file variable, S1 line, I place, and I counter. There are three values inside the text file, so I declare three variables, SX departure, SX destination, and IX distance, 
Step two, test. Even though this was not asked in the paper, you won't be deducted marks for it. Always follow your algorithm to avoid silly mistakes. Step three, assign. Go and make the link. Step four, reset. Set up the file variable to start reading from the start and set the counter to zero before the loop. Step five, the loop. Loop line for line through the text file. Step six, read. Add a line of text into S1 line. Step seven, extract. Do step seven for the amount of values inside the text file minus one. In this case, we need to do it twice. Step eight, the process. This is where we use the input from the GUI and the information extracted to the, from the text file to test and do the processes. And lastly, don't forget to add steps nine outside the loop. Here we have another example of a text file question out of a previous question paper. I'm going to read the question. The folder also contains a text file named data.txt. It contains the name and the three marks of several learners. The information for each learner is provided in the file in the following format. The name and the surname, separated with a space, hash mark1, hash mark2, and hash mark3. Now question 3.2.1. The user must enter the name of the learner. The program must find the name of the learner in the text file named data.txt. And then they want us to write code to do the following. Check whether the text file data.txt exists or not. If the text file does not exist, display a suitable message and close the application. Just a helpful hint here, watch out for if they say a dialog box, that means you can choose between a show message or a message dialog. The second bullet. If the text file exists, search for the learner's name in the text file. If the learner's name is found in the text file, Extract the learner's three marks, use a boolean variable to stop the search process immediately, and instantiate the object marks object with the required values. Now, let's start out. We know step one is going to declare. I want to declare my file where I have a text file variable. I've got my one line. I've got my three variables for my marks and my variable for my name. I've got my placeholder. And I've got my Boolean flag. Now the user is asking, the user must enter the name of the learner. So what we're going to do, first step always, get your input. So we're going to say the variable gets the value of the edit.txt. Then we're going to move over to step two. They say this time I must check for if the file exists. So this is a very important step. And this is another example. Instead of using a show message, this is a message dialog that's got four parameters and usually a helpful hint once again is to press control space to choose empty error and to choose MB yes or no. You don't have to memorize it. You can just press control space while you're in Delphi. We move on to step number three, assign file, where we connect the file, the file variable to data.txt. Step four where we reset the file again to put the pointer back on top. And remember, before the loop, we're going to re uh, we're going to initialize a flag boolean, or we're going to say th to the counter it gets the value of zero, always before the while, not inside. Then if we look here, if the text file exists, search for the learner's name inside the text file. Now we're going to do step five, where we test while not end of file of the file variable, and I'm going to have another condition to say if the flag is down, it's false, then it still must go on. So that means whenever the flag goes up and becomes true, this statement, this condition is going to be false. And if one is false, then the whole while is going to stop. We see there the read line or step six that's in step five so that we get the first line of the code. And then we start out with our seven steps. Now, we're going to extract the first value here, where we, 
we get the uh, value of the placeholder and we uh, copy the value from one to the placeholder minus one because we don't want that placeholder. And then we delete everything. Now, remember, they are telling me that I need to search for that person. So I'm going to take the name, the input that I had, and the value I extracted out of my text file and immediately make the flag true. Then inside this if statement, I can do my follow up step sevens or I can do the before the if statement. So we extract mark one, we extract mark two, and then the only value left is mark three. So once again, remember how many times do we do step seven? The amount of values there are minus one. In this case, there are four values minus one. We're going to do step three, uh, step seven, three times. So this last question where they say use a Boolean variable to stop the search process is where we used it. We initialized it. We had it in the while and we did the if statement. So if the if statement activated, it's going to stop the loop. And then the question asked to instantiate the object with the values that we required. So we just instantiate the, the mark. The following is an example out of the 2020 November question paper, question 4.2. The question states, display the weight of the containers loaded onto the ship in a rich edit component. Write the weight of the containers loaded onto the ship to a new text file con called tons.txt. So we're going to focus especially on that specific question. So where, where do we start? Step one, we declare. We create a file variable and S1 line. Step two, we assign. We make the link again between our file variable and the text file's name. Step three, we test. This paper specifically asks to create a new text file and not to append. So we only add the procedure rewrite to create and slash overwrite the information in the text file. Step four, write. The values extracted early in the question that we saved inside S1 line is written back into the text file. And then step five, close. That is a wrap from my side. I hope that everyone watching sharpened their text file and All right. Hello. Thank you for that session, Dijon. If you want to join me now, we'll do some Q&A. There's a number of questions here coming in already. But if anybody has any additional questions, go ahead and put them in. Ah, there you are. So are you actually in the catacombs or is that a virtual background? Oh, no, no, that, that's, that's my own yes. Um, we, we've got a, a specific architecture. Wow, that is fantastic. I love it. Actually, I really want to come visit South Africa. That's on my list of places that I would love to visit. So someday I'll come down there and check out your architecture. That's great. It's, a, it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, so there, um, actually there's a few questions that maybe we can handle in like a, a general discussion here about if there's other ways to work with text files or if this is the only way or anything, or if there's better ways or so on. I don't know if you maybe have some general statements you want to make about that or before we get into uh, more of the questions. Uh, so one question, can we use a CSV file? Yes, you can. Um, we've got, we can use text files and CSV files. Um, I saw that global class one um, where they asked for a class. So we teach our learners in South Africa. Uh, like you saw the, the the nine steps that we have done. Um, it's it's it, We don't use the properties of a class because the file, uh, the text file, is. Uh, we, we try to assign it to the procedures and functions that we have. Um, so we don't have a very close there. But yeah, yes, we can use it. Yep. Yeah, so... Um... Let's see. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, if not file exists is more elegant as far as like a coding style. Yeah, there, yeah. The, there's always lots of ways to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like that more, but uh, sometimes we, we say a, a, a condition must have comparing two values to one another. So we teach that mm -hmm. to our learners. And then we see the file exists as a function that's getting a value and we want to compare it to another value. So in the beginning, when we have that not and an or, operators then it's difficult for them to understand why that does the condition 
don't have two, co two values being compared. So that's why we, we try to teach them that in the beginning, because we do text files in the end of grade 10 and the beginning of grade, 12, uh, grade 11. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. And um, this, one of the things I, I really like about programming is it feels like it's it's one of those things that you can continue to get better at and learn different ways and why you would use different things for different ways. But uh, I really appreciated in your session and the rest of the sessions that do a really good, you do a really good job of like doing it in a very basic, consistent, uh, understandable way. And then uh, over time, we could, you know, the developers can continue to refine their skills. So that's great. Yes. There are a few, a few conversations about best text editors uh, Notepad plus plus and Ultra Edit, uh, not really related to the content, but uh, it, it, there is a the Notepad plus plus is great. I use that one. Uh, Ultra Edit is owned by Idera, which is Embarcadero's parent company, and uh, they're both great editors out there. There's some special offers if you buy Delphi to get Ultra Edit for free, I believe, right now as well. So good text editors for working with your text files there. The cool thing about Ultra Edit is it can open any size file, which uh, I use that. A long time ago, like 20 years ago, I think it was, uh, I had a huge file that was, everything else just died on it. And I had to get down and edit the very end of the file. And I was going to write a program. I think I was going to write it in Turo Pascal at the time. And then I discovered Ultra Edit could go out and do that. So very cool. Lots okay. of great editor options out there. Uh, everybody, I, I think all developers have a, uh, need to have a good text editor beyond their IDE as well. <laughs> Yes. Uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite uh, text editor, John? I, I must say we use in uh, we call it Cat. It's one of our other subjects. We use Notepad Plus so Plus. That's always okay. free to download, and anything three is free is always nice. Um, but I just want to say about that. I saw also a question about the amount of lines or amount of ticks, um, and that was quite interesting. Um, I saw one of my learners were on on here, Ken Aguilera. He was one of the four. Uh, candidates that was in the uh, South African team to the International Olympiad for Informatics uh, this August and South Africa oh. did us very proud. Um, so, but we, we did a, a solution where we tried to do Pi and we wanted to download Pi. So we downloaded a text file that's got 1 billion characters of Pi mm -hmm. uh, to, to work into our program and it worked perfectly. So we, we, there was no, uh, it was just the size of the file. I think it was 1.4 gigabytes um of text file that how big it was uh, so we we extracted that and we had no problem um getting the information out and and reading text also i saw that one question about how big can it be yes uh, one billion characters etc yeah it, it, yeah when you're reading it in delphi it, it, it you're you're constrained by the memory you have and then even then you can just read parts of the file you don't have to read all the file in the memory so yep absolutely it's what's one thing I love about programming, and I realize I'm going off topic here a little bit, is just that you can, um, you know, you're using a piece of software. Sometimes it has these limits on it. And then when you start programming, you're like, well, why does the software have these weird limits on it? I could just do this in code and I can accomplish anything. It's like, it's like unlocking a superpower, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um so there was a question here about, let's see if I can find it now. Oh, uh, so Jamie's asking, says, when you open a stream, do you lock the file while you're working on it? So so if you use a, the, 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 the property uh, load from file, um, if you say stream.load from file, then you lock it. Then then it's you can't access it anymore because that load of file takes it. But if you add it into different streams, then you can access the streams concurrently. You can, you can access the streams and use the streams uh, so it's only if you use that specific property. Yep. Yeah, there's there's different options. And I know there's other ways to open files, and there's usually some way that you can uh, open it uh, shared or unshared and stuff too. So lots of options out there. That's great. Um, so I use a stream to read and write from a text file. Since the stream is moving characters while text files are still are still in stored characters, I'm not understanding that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like we said, the okay. stream is stream is going backwards and forwards, and you can access both at the same time while reading and writing. But text files, yeah. uh, like we said, it's like that book mentioned that I mentioned. When we open up a book, we want to close the book before we open up the same book again before uh, because we're going to break it. So yes, I agree with that statement there. 
Uh, the one is more but lenient, but like we said in South Africa, we, we use text files more. We don't use stream streams a bit more console based. Um, it, it's very nice. I, I enjoy it a lot, but, but we use the text files steps a bit more than streams. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's good to have multiple th options because you get, do get a chance to uh, try different things. Does the right lens function in Delphi push the data to a buffer? for printing or saving to the file at a later stage, or does it immediately flush the data to the file? And Mr. Myers, whoop, whoop. <laughs> so yes, that's Mr. That's, Weir, that's sorry, sorry, sorry. No, he's the learner that went overseas. Um, so yes, that that's a nice question. Uh, I'm really going to hate it. But the thing is about right line is it's end, uh, it's putting an end of line marker at the end. Uh, so it's it's there after the procedure happens because it's a procedure. It, it happens. It puts the end of the line marker and it goes on. I really believe it's the same as database manipulation uh, when we've got the post. Uh, I, I believe if you go to any next record, it activates the post. Uh, so when it goes after that line, the right line, I feel it's going to to write the information inside the text file. Yeah, I I know that there is. Um that the operating system can have cache in there as well. So you, 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 you're, uh, there's some minutia to get into <laughs> if you're trying to make sure that it's written a disk or not. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's see. So CSC files, yep, good. So this is an interesting question. Um, it says, do you have any ideas on how to survey a list of files on a NAS from Delphi at a fast refresh rate? So someone got a, a network attached storage. It says, I use find first, find next recursively, but are there other ways of doing that? And this is, kind of goes probably beyond the scope of your session here, but maybe you might have some things, suggestions you can point them in the right direction here. Unfortunately, not, not anything better than that. Um, it's find first, find next. I, I saw, yeah, but I, I can't see anything that's going to improve on that. Not for me that I've got experience in that right now. Yeah. Um, what you could do, and I think, um, so Patrick's in there, one of our MVPs in there making some comments and stuff like that, and he suggested some things. Uh, one thing you might do, though, is, um, and I don't think we have a session on threading, but if you use threads, then you can have it updating in the background and there's other techniques you can do. Uh, the reality of th threads are interesting, and this is again where I realize we're getting a little off topic, in, in that it doesn't actually speed up the program, it actually technically slows it down, but it allows you to do two things at once. So you can have, you can be displaying the list of files, you can be scrolling through the list of files while you're populating the list of files at the same time, so. Um, let's see here, is there a better, no better file object type which avoids global functions. Oh, I think we did we discussed this one already. I can't remember. Yes, uh, we we talked about it. So it's not a class. It's not in the library. So that we we want to use that to 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 ease out. And and like I want to say once again at that step step seven point one, seven point two, and seven point three. Uh, like I talked about, it's it's we we want to make sure we equip the learners with the correct tools. Uh, it's not always the, the best and fastest way, but if they have that in their bag and they do it, and then uh, we call it like a puzzle piece. Uh, we are building a puzzle when we are solving a problem. And then when you've got all these pieces together, it's way easier to fill in the middle as when you start just randomly at a place and trying to put one piece puzzle piece onto another puzzle piece. So that's why I love this nine steps. And I usually tell my learners when they see a text file, do all nine steps. Extract the data. Don't read the question even yet. Just do everything. And then afterwards, when you read the question again, it's quite easy then. Um, all of a sudden, the question makes sense and you don't feel lost and you don't feel stressed. And then you program way better because we, we've got a three-hour examination. That's the my grade 12 pupils are going to write on the 30th. Uh, so but so I get, give them their tools. When they have all the tools, they can get their marks and also they, they're less stressed because they can do it much easier. Yeah, you know, that's a that's really good. Actually, I I really appreciate that because uh, that's um yeah. Th there's a, actually I was just thinking about the, there's a number of things I do that's like I have these patterns that's like oh I'm gonna do this. I always want to do set this up first, and then your whole thing about the puzzle piece. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, let's let's make sure we have the basics and we understand what's going on, and then you can start looking at uh, ways to to improve on that. So yeah, that's great. 
Um, does Readlin need text files to be character turn line feed terminated or can also process Unix text files that are line feed terminated? So that's interesting. I don't have yeah, too much experience in that. Um, so so I, I would look that up, unfortunately, to, to, to come to it. I didn't have a previous session where I've, I have this error or this. Yeah, actually, I'm thinking, I know I've worked with files of different line feed types, but I'm not sure the answer to that either. Uh, it, it, uh, so this is one of the things I love about programming, honestly, Richard. Try it. Uh, I, I love that, that it's so easy to write a little test program and try something and see what happens um, and then get that feedback and then you know the answer. So yeah, yeah, give it a shot, Richard, and try it out. Um, so a good question. Okay, let's see. Uh, there's more questions coming in here. Oh, wow, there's a lot of questions here. Can I write a line of code uh, in Delphi into a variable and then execute it. In Fox Pro, this is possible. Oh, interesting. So uh, I, if, if I understand it correctly, so in my example that I uh, used, I, I combine everything together into an S1 line and then I write, write it back uh, into the right line. But I assume that this is something a bit different. Yeah, I'm guessing like trying to like write a line of Delphi code into a text file and execute the Delphi code. Not really. I mean, you could technically write out a Delphi program. I mean, because a program file, a unit file is a text file and then call the Delphi compiler and execute it that way. <laughs> if that's what you're asking, uh, I may be reading too much into that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I wonder if they also mean that they can use a variables property site like variable dot right line or right to file something like that. Um, so so no no in that regards. Um, but but we can combine everything and then use the right line procedures. Um, uh, is there a best practice in dealing with reading and writing files with different encodings? Uh, I'm guessing like Unicode encoding versus ASCII. I know that there, there are, um, and I can't remember them offhand, there are um, encodings. There actually is uh, encoding support in Delphi, and I can't remember the syntax for it. If you if you look in the doc wiki, um, Esmar, you should be able to find there's a way to do it. Uh, it, it what it will do is it will actually try to, um, it'll try to guess the best encoding automatically, but then you can tell it not to and override that. You got a uh, number of people <laughs> saying, thank you for the great session here. It's great. Um, so this is this one probably beyond the scope of this here. I need to extract text from a PDF. Can I use these commands or any libraries would recommend? So unfortunately, I know from experience that I tried to do that to extract the text from PDF. So unfortunately, there's these um, uh, programs that you can use, uh, but not from Delphi that I found any solution yet to that specific problem. But yes, you can use a program to to convert from PDF to to, to Word or text files to anything, and then from there on, it's it's quite easier. But unfortunately, not not anything inside. And I think that's why you 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 buy that programs because <laughs> they they've got a quite of code inside of them already been done and executed. Yeah, and of course the uh, one of the beauties of it is um, if there's a component or library out there that does it, and you're like, I don't want to buy the component or library. Well, they wrote that component or library in Delphi. <laughs> it's a, it's a matter of do you want to write it yourself or do you want to pay someone else to write, have written it for you. Uh, is there a line length limit? I recently saw a Unix line that was over thir or 13,000 lines characters long. And this goes back to what you're talking about with Pi, really, because Pi was just one. I mean, it was a text file that was one long, uh, one big long line, really. So, yes. yeah, there, there's not really a line length. Uh, this is a related question here. It goes, if a line was long enough to overflow the standard Unicode string, would it automatically return 
a wide string. Um, I think it would, yeah, it would automatically, unless you explicitly tell it you don't want a wide string, I think it would automatically give you a wide string, if I understand correctly. Yes, I, I believe also it's going to go to a wide string. Yeah. S -s -s Something again, want to test that first before we confirm that's, but that, mm -hmm. yes, like you said, that's the lovely thing about programming. I I every time, uh, especially this programming Olympiads that's on its way now, uh, round one, it's always nice to see different types of questions. And w when you try to get an answer, uh, yeah, th that's always the nicest thing for programming from my side. Uh, that's what I love programming is to, to, to get these problems and to solve these problems. Yeah, I've been programming for a really long time. Um, every time I think about it, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's been that long. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I still, um, I have a ton of programs where I'm like, oh, I wonder, and I write a little program and test it out. And like, oh, that's how it works. So it's, it, you're never, uh, my uh, nephew just recently was going to go into uh, a career in cybersecurity. He was going to take some classes on it. And they had, one of the requirements was programming. He hadn't done any programming. He came to me and was like, I, I don't know. I'm kind of nervous about this. I said, the beauty thing about programming is you're not expected to know everything. You just expected to do the basics and then know how to figure the rest of it out from there. That's and, and that's the great thing is you just, you're looking things up, you're testing things and always discovering and learning new stuff. A helpful link that I can give is there's a nice place, uh, Project Eula, um, where you can find this, they've got an archive of a thousand different problems uh, yeah. that I love to go to and to to, to give my learners to, to try to program. Um, so it's a, it's a very nice, it's very easy, short um, questions, usually easy to understand. And then, uh, but to, to, to build the program and to solve that and to do it in a specific time limit, that's, that's the thing that we try to chase in the class. And that's what we do try to do when we do a, a bit of extra curricular work. Yep. I just put a link in the chat for that project Euler. Yeah. I remember going out and trying some of that. It's, it's fun. And it's, the, one of the things I love about programming and I, is, is that they have that tight loop and you know that you can like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. And you hit the button and you're like, oh, now I know. And then you're like, let's try this. Let's try this. And you can just keep going at it and trying things. Uh, to give an example, there's one uh, where you can get the answer, but it takes for Delphi or the program plus minus five minutes to do. And then to give the challenge to the learners to say, okay, but how can you improve the looping structures and how can you improve the, the processes uh, and to get it down? And I know one of my learners, uh, went from five minutes to 0 0.002 seconds um, for the same. And then that that's when it gets really nice and interesting. And to, to for them to then explain the code to the class and say, why did they use this? And how did they get to that place where they used subroutines and uh, methods and to minimalize everything to get to, uh, to the quickest possible answer? Because the answer is easy, but to get the answer as quick as possible, that then you're going to use your different tools that you learn in Delphi. Yep. I uh, I used to work at a place that we did uh, generate a lot of reports for people, and we uh, would come to a company that had these reports that would take literally days to generate. And they're like, we need a faster solution that we just can't take days to generate our reports. And I remember doing that, trying to figure out how to how to speed up this report generation and getting you know going from days down to seconds. Uh, oh. It. Yeah. I, that's awesome. It's so fulfilling to do that and be able to like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, look at this. It's actually fast now. Uh, yeah, that, that is, that's great. And it's a really great skill, a great thing to practice and to get to keep working on it. It's something you're going to keep doing forever, for sure. Um, so let's see. Uh, Kirk said one measurement is better than 100, 100 expert opinions. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, da, 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 can I write? Uh, did that already? There's a few questions in here. So, uh, Kenya again is asking, is there, uh, so it's kind of beyond the scope, but is there a markdown renderer in Delphi? Uh, there is not one built in, but there are a number of libraries out there for that, or you could write it. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, and then Alf pointed out, 
the Jedi JCL, which is a library out there, it has tools to convert text uh, files types, most possibly Linux line strings and many others. Okay, yep. That's where the person was asking about different line feed types. And I know, actually, there is a uh, there is some stuff built into Delphi for that as well. I just don't remember the details on it right now. <laughs> Ah, yes. There's a, a book, Cracking the Coding Interview with Lots of Puzzles. Actually, Kirk, I uh, was reading that recently. That is a really, if you really want to um, look at like some really great uh, things like how to do map reduce, which is something I'd heard of before, but never done anything with, that, that book talks about how to do map reduce and stuff. It does a good job of like presenting these interesting things like Let's say you wanted to index all the files on the internet. How would you do that? And it's like, and it like breaks down. This it's like, oh, okay, that that's interesting. I actually would like. I want to do a uh, Kirk at some point would like to do maybe some webinars and kind of go through some of these challenging problems because they are really interesting. Uh, and Kirk also says that teaching is a great way to submit one's understanding, which I'm sure uh, <laughs> you've discovered as well, right, Dijon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I must be honest. My world went up when uh, we when we tried to you know, train for this uh, informatics Olympiad, uh, and then when my scope from Delphi from uh, being a teacher uh, went way beyond to getting all these algorithms and how to do stuff and uh, what type of different problems there are and interactive problems and oh, then then I noticed well my understanding of Delphi was like this and th there's so much more and that's and that's a nice thing. We are a lifelong learner. And that's what I'm trying to teach my children in the class. I don't like to do, we're trying to improve all the time. We're trying to learn new stuff. We're trying to uh, get new techniques to improve. And that's why I, I believe that's like the basic steps. If you've got that basic steps and you've got the tools, it's about how you use the tools. It's not about the tools. Mm -hmm. um, so we must make sure that the learners learn the tools first. And it's simple stuff like just even or uneven number or prime numbers or anything. All of that stuff is tools, and then you can combine them all together to to answer a question. Um, so yes, start out small. <laughs> There's so so much out there. Your comment about realizing your Delphi knowledge was small. Um, I've been, like I said, been programming for a long time with Delphi and a number of other languages, and. Actually, I've done quite a bit of interviewing at companies where I interview candidates, software developers. And one thing I found is that uh, programmers that think they know all of it don't know very much of it. <laughs> it's when it's when you reach that point when you're like, oh my goodness, there's a lot here to know. That That's when you really start to understand it is when you realize that there's just way too much to try and understand. Uh, that's true. That's <laughs> absolutely true. Uh, so there's a comment here, uh, t-string list working with small files is much easier than reading writing files. Yeah, th there's a number of ways to handle text files. I love t-string list. Oh, my goodness. Um, I was I, working in C-sharp for a while, and I actually made my own implementation of t-string list for, for C-sharp because it's such a powerful, useful uh, thing, and there wasn't a uh, – I mean, there's some similar stuff, but not exactly, at least not at the time for me. So, yeah, t-string list is great. There's lots of other – Great ways for working with files. Uh, type files where you okay. There's yeah. Uh, there's other ways for working with type files where you define a record with in one block to read command. All worth re researching. Databases yeah. Databases are great. Um, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a number a number of questions here going off beyond this. And yeah, go out there, do some searches, do some tests. And you will discover a lot of uh, a lot of great things out there for uh, how to answer this. And as Kirk said, you know, one one test is better than um, a hundred expert opinions. And that that's I, I love I love that that it really it gives you that ability to just go out and test these things and try them out. So thank you, Dijon, for your session. This was great. And actually, I would love to talk, or if there's anything I can do to help with your. Uh, information Olympiads or whatever, let me know. I would love to be involved with that. I, uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, like, like I said, uh, this Thursday we're going to do round one. Uh, there's three rounds, so so oh, wow. round one, the learners uh, go through to round two. And and last time, my, my learners, I've got 22 students in grade 12, 
Uh, we are only 80 learners in the in the grade 12 group, so we, it's it's a very large group in the northwest uh, where we're from in South Africa. Um, and I really, my kids are brilliant. They, like I said, Kenna Kenna is, was one of the team. He went through to round three and got got a very high place and was picked for the team. Um, so we we're trying to improve on that and getting maybe two onto the team. So we are we are. Holding on thumbs, but like I said, that that book that I saw there, I, I really, really want to work through it and anything else that we can get, um, because like I said, United States is, and the the China is way beyond our uh, our capabilities uh, into problem solving. So we want to improve from South Africa's side. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'd love to. I hope it goes well. Good luck to everybody that's uh, participating in that. And, uh, wish you well, and I hope to hear you do really, really well. Awesome. All right, thank, well, you thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dijon, and I will uh, talk to you later. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So coming up next, we have – oh, it's not on here yet. Let me look on the schedule. Uh, working with lists, uh, list boxes, combo boxes, and radio groups. There it is. Oh, that one's, that still says the old one. Let's try it again. There we go. Working with lists, list boxes, combo boxes, radio groups. This is actually um, kind of where we're going to take some of the stuff, the basics we've been learning, and learn how to put it into into practical uh, practical use. So, if you haven't already downloaded Delphi, make sure you go out and download Delphi so that you are uh, ready to go and start can putting some of these doing the tests right. It, I, I've talked to a lot of people that are like, I want to learn the programming. I've watched all these videos and read all these books. But I've not actually ever opened an IDE. I've never written any code yet. It's like that's like thinking you can learn to drive a car by reading the the owner's manual, you know, until you actually get in the car and and move the wheel and shift the gears. You're you're not really learning how to drive a car. So uh, download download your car today, Delphi, on um, Marketero's website and get started. Fire up, fire it up, and uh, give it a go. And with that, we'll get got a few minutes here. It looks like about eight minutes before the next session starts. So you can uh, take a break, stretch your legs, refill your drink. So, uh, I got my four liter drink here. This usually gets me through the day. And we'll see you after the next session. Take care, everybody. In this video, I'll walk you through installing the free Delphi Community Edition from Barcadero Technologies. Before installation, make note of your serial number, username, and password from when you registered to download Community Edition. You also need to install the .NET Framework version 3.5, which is included with Windows 10 as an optional feature. You may already have it installed, but double check and install the latest Windows updates while you're at it. Remember, Community Edition does not work alongside any other editions. You also need additional devices for multi-platform development. I've already installed Java on this system. From here in Control Panel is where you install .NET Framework 3.5. It takes a few minutes as Windows downloads and installs it. Now we'll launch the Delphi Community Edition installation. All editions of Rad Studio use the same installer, but it is your serial number that determines what gets installed. Here is where you need your serial number, username, and password. Now it is installing the main program files. Once that is done, you can select the platforms you want to develop for. I'm going to select all platforms. You can also install additional components. This is where you can select the Android SDK, NDK, and Java JDK if you don't have them already installed. I usually install Java manually and then let this installer install the SDK and NDK.
since we are installing the Android SDK and NDK, we have to agree to the license agreement. Now we give it a little more time to let it download and install the rest of the features. After the installation is completed, you're greeted with this welcome screen where you can choose between the light theme and the dark theme. The light theme looks better for videos, but I really recommend you to check out the dark theme as it is beautiful. On this screen, you can set up your source control. It comes with Subversion pre-installed, but if you would rather use Git or Mercurial, you can set those up here too. It's also convenient to turn on autosave so you don't lose your work when something unexpected happens. And with that, Community Edition is installed and you're ready to start developing. Check out our other videos for more tutorials and visit Embarcadero.com to learn more about Community Edition and our other products.
Good day to you. My name is Georgina Ramsamy, and I would like to take this opportunity to enlighten you about some of the selection components in Delphi, which include the combo boxes, list boxes, and radio groups. So today I would like to show you a little presentation that I've made. And once we've completed that, I will take you into an actual Delphi program where we can type in code and see how these components work. Okay, so remember that because these are selection components, you would have to make a choice about which component, com component you want to use depending on your application. So here it says the list box, the combo box, and the radio group components allow options to be selected. And what are some of the advantages of these components? It enhances the visual presentation of options. So basically you have all of your options in these boxes and you can easily see them so that you can make a selection. Automatic validation. Only a valid selection can be made, so it prevents the user from entering an invalid value. So, for example, if you usually use an edit box, it means then whatever is being typed in that box would have to be validated. So, for example, if you ask them to choose or, or to enter their uh, gender, which is male or female, and if they enter something else into the edit box, you would have to first validate that. So the advantage of a selection component is that it avoids a bit of validation because you are making a choice. Options can be string, numbers, dates, and other types, but whatever you extract, you have to convert it into the relevant type that you want for your application. So whatever you extract would be a string initially, and then it has to be converted. It's also very easy to extract and manipulate data using code or the properties in the object inspector. Common properties that you can change in components would be the name property of the component. So usually you can use um, a list box. The prefix will be LST, for example, LST fruit. If you're using a combo box, you can call it CMB. And an example would be CMB fruit. If you're using a radio group, the prefix is usually RGP. For example, RGP fruit. The caption property is used to set the heading for the radio group. So the combo box and the list box don't have a caption property. But a combo box has a text property for the heading. The items property is used to add items to all three components. If you want to add an item into the fruit list box or into a combo box or into a radio group, you use the items property. And if you want to point to the position or index of an item of any of these components, you use the item index property. So the different selection components look like this. Uh, the list box, for example, if we have these different types of fruit, apple, banana, pear, guava, and pineapple. So here we are illustrating the item index of each of those options. So you can clearly see that in all of them, the item index of the first item is zero. And then the second item will be one and so on. So remember that if you have to count the number of items in the selection component, it will still be a normal count. For example, here we have five items. But because the item index starts at zero, the last item index will be one less than our normal count. And in this case, it is four. So if you had 10 items, the first item index would be zero and the last item index would be nine. 
And that applies to all of our selection components. So here, uh, notice that in our list box, our name is LST fruit. Our combo box, the name is CMB fruit. And we can change the text property to select fruit. So then it'll take you here and it will put in select fruit. And notice that there is a drop down arrow in a combo box. So usually when you place a combo box onto your GUI from your tool palette, you'd find that it just appears with your capture with your text area and uh, it has the option to be collapsible. So it shows you this little drop down arrow and only when you click in the drop down arrow, then you'll be able to view all your options in the combo box. So your radio group has a name, RGP, and in this case, fruit, because of the content of that radio group. And your caption is select fruit. So notice again, the item index is exactly the same as the other two components. I'm gonna use a list box as an example, but the same properties will apply to the combo box as well as to the radio group. So step one, if you want to use a list box, you will go into the tool palette and you will choose a T list box component. And that is a part of your standard um, category. When you click in standard, you go to the bottom and you see there's a T list box. And when you select that, it will place that in your GUI or in your interface. And then you can rename it to LST Fruit. And when you want to place items into the list box, then you click in the ellipse, which are your three dots. And that is a part of the items property. And when you click in your ellipse, you find that your string list editor will appear. So in this window, you will type in your items. Okay. Uh, then you can move on to other properties that are available once you have created your selection component. For example, you can clear all the items in that uh, component to clear the list box. You can say lstfruit.items.clear. You can also count the number of items in the list box. So inum, which, or you can say I count, is equal to lstfruit.items.count. You can also add an item. So usually when you, you say, um, lst.items.add, it will add the item into the list box, but at the end. If you want to delete an item, remove an item at a selected index, then you'll say the component name.items.delete, and you have to specify the item index that you want to delete at. So for example, if you put two inside the bracket, it will delete the third item. Because remember that the first item has an item index of zero. So the third item will have an item index of two. So remember we said the add item will add to the end. And if you want to add to a specified index, then you would have to use the insert property. So you would then say lstfruit.items.insert. When you use the insert property, then you would have to specify the index where you would like to insert. So in this case, you are saying one, but remember that's actually the second position, comma peach. So now you're inserting a new fruit at the second position. What happens to the fruit that was at the second position? It will now move into the third position. 
And then you have the index of property, uh, the index position of an item. So here, this will return an integer value. I position is equal to LST fruit items dot index of guava, for example. So guava is a fruit in the list box. It will find the position or index of that. So if guava, for example, is at position four, it will return zero, one, two, three, because that is the index of guava. And what happens if guava is not a part of that list box? Then it will return a value negative one. You can also work with your selection components and text files. And these are some of the properties you can use the load from file and the save to file. So what does the load from file do? It populates a list box with options using the data from a text file. So whatever it is you have in a text file, you can use that um, information to populate a list box or a combo box or a radio group, for example, LST fruit dot items dot load from file and the name of your text file must be inside the bracket with the file extension dot txt so here it means you are loading from fruit dot text uh, txt into our list box component so the note here says it will read the data from the text file fruit dot txt and save the data as options in the list box so note the text file must be saved in the same folder as the Delphi project. So if it's not in the same folder, it will not work because it will not be able to locate your file. Save to file will save the options from the list box into a new text file. For example, LST menu dot save to file menu dot txt. So what does this do? It will extract whatever information or whatever options you have in your list box called LST menu. And it will save all of those options into a text file called menu.txt. So if no selection was made, so remember that all these components are selection components. So what if you do not make a selection? Then your selected index will become negative one. So if the selected index is anything from zero upwards, it means that you have made a selection. And if it returns a negative one value, it means that you have not made a selection. So that comes to that brings us to the end of our presentation and now we're going to go to our Delphi interface where we're going to explain how some of these properties work. So I've made a little interface here that has list boxes in my page control, a tab for combo boxes and one for radio group. So I'm coming back to list boxes. So here, I have a list box of fruit. And in the list box, I have items. And currently, I have five items. So usually, if you want to put items, as we said in the presentation, you go to your items property and click in your ellipse and you add the items to your string list editor. And this is where you add the items. You click on OK. Then you can use various properties from the list box to manipulate and get your information out of it. For example, if I want to count the number of items here, what will I do? So let us write code to count the number of items. OK, I'm just going to delete some of these, the code that I already have so that I could go through it with you. OK, 
Okay, so coming back to number of items, it wants to count how many items there are in the list box. So you can make a variable I count, colon integer is going to return an integer value. And then here we're going to say I count is equal to the name of our list box is list fruit dot items dot count. And we want to display that value in our edit box, edt num items. So here we're going to say edt num items dot text is equal to, because it's an integer value, we're going to convert it into string i count. Okay, so let us see how that works. So we want to count the number of items um, that are in the list box. So we're going to run that now. I'm going to share that with you quickly. And if I click on number of items, it shows me that there are five items. So position of the item selected. So if I have, I don't have code under that right now, but if I click banana, and if I click on this, it must tell me banana is at index one, because remember apple is at zero. And pineapple would be zero, one, two, three, four. So we're going to write code to display the index of the item selected. So I'm going to click here on the position of item selected. I index of selected item. That's an integer. The index of selected item would be equal to list box dot item index. And that's the property that we're going to use. And then I'm going to go into my edit box. And let's just say position of item selected or index of item selected dot text is equal to and because it's an integer, you're going to say into string I index of selected item. Okay, I just want to make sure that that is I pause of item, yes. And we're going to run that quickly. And if I go to Banana and click there, it'll tell me that index one, guava is there at index three, apple is at index zero. Okay. So now I want to work out the item that was selected. So if I, for example, clicked on banana, it must display banana. If I clicked on guava, it must display guava. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to make a variable called S item selected. And that is a string. So to extract the item selected, I'm going to say item selected is equal to list box fruit dot items now i can do it like this and make it a bit long and say list box stat dot item index or i can split it up into two steps and take this out take that out create a i item selected or item index which is an integer. So here, I work out the index that was selected. There you go. That's the index that was selected. And I'm now going to put that into this bracket to get the item at that index. And then I want to display that. So I'm going to say item selected dot text and this is a string value so there is no need for a conversion so i'm going to display that
So I'm going to click on pear, and there you go. It shows you that I've selected a pear or a pineapple or a banana or whatever you want to select. Okay. So now we're going to uh, the index of item. What does index of item mean? The index of item means that we want to display the index of a specific item that was selected. For example, uh, I'm looking for the index of the fruit guava. So I need to know exactly which index it is. So it's easy to see it now. But if we had a lot of items in that list box, and we want to know at what index is the specific fruit, then we don't have to go and count or follow the index from zero up to a certain point. We can just work that out using the uh, item index. And so we're going to say, I index selected, I index selected is an integer. And then here, you're going to say, I index selected is equal to from your list box fruit.items. And we want to know where is the guava? What is the item index of that? And then we're going to display that in our item selected. Index of item. Index of item is equal to list fruit, which should just be into string. Um, dot text is equal to into string i index selected. Okay, so let's run that one. Uh, dot index of at the index of guava that should give us the position of guava in that list box. So we're going to say it's at three. So zero, one, two, three. So whenever you want to search for the position of a specific option, you can use the index of um, function to do that. Okay, I'm going back to design. Okay, now we want to add an item. So to add an item, you would have to use uh, the items.add. So for example, if I say list fruit.items, dot add, and I want to add, for example, the fruit called kiwi. So remember we said that when you use the add property, it adds to the end of the list. So if you look at that, and if I click on add item, you would see that it added the kiwi at the end of that list. Okay. So now I'm going to insert an item. So if I want to insert another item to a specific position, like maybe I want peach to be the second fruit. So I'm going to say list fruit dot items. Um, we can just say dot items dot insert, and then you say one comma peach. So that means that you inserting the fruit peach at index one, which is actually your second position. So if you run that,
And if you say insert, you'd notice that it put the peach at the second position and it moved the banana into the next position. Okay. Okay, then we're back here and we're moving to delete an item. So when you're deleting, there's different ways of deleting. You can delete, for example, the second option, or you can delete um, a fruit at a specific index. There's different ways of deleting. So let's just say we want to delete peach, uh, which is at index two. So I'm going to say list box fruit dot items dot delete. And I want to delete, okay, let's just say one. So one means that we added the peach and now we want to delete it. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, so we want to first insert the item peach and then you want to delete it. So then it's gone. So it deleted the one at index one, which was the peach. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, still the delete, but we're going to search for an item and then delete it. So we're just going to comment this one. So let's just say I want to delete uh, the fruit called pear, but I don't know where it is in the list box. So what I will do, I will first one find the index of pear. So I'm going to say I index to delete. That is an integer. So it's going to work out the index of that fruit. So I index to delete is equal to from my list box dot items. And I'm going to find pair, index of pair. Is it? Now I want to delete it. So we're going to copy the same code that we had here. But we're not going to delete from one. We're going to delete the index of that fruit. Okay. All right, so we have pair, which is here. And if I go to delete, it would have deleted pair because it looked for the index of pair and then it deleted it. All right, so now I want to go back to delete. And this time I want to select any fruit and delete that. So if I want to select any fruit and then delete it, then I'm going to do this. I'm going to say I index to delete is equal to from my list box dot item index. So this will tell me exactly which index I've selected. And then again, I'm going to copy what I had initially. And this time, I'm not going to delete one. I'm going to delete the index that was selected to delete. There you go. All right, so we're back here and I can select the guava and say delete that. You see, so we can select any item and delete and it should remove it from the list box. Okay. And we're now moving on to the next button uh, to test that there's no selection that was made. So remember we said that the first item index is zero and the next one will be one and so on. So if the uh, result is negative one, it means that you have not made a selection. All right, so you can make a variable if you want, or you can just do it directly if you want. I index selected. 
and that is an integer. Index selected is equal to from my list box fruit dot item index. So that will tell me the index that was selected. And now I'm going to see whether you have selected anything or not by testing that. So if it is negative one, then we going to say in a show message that there was, a, they need to make a selection. So I'm going to say, please select a fruit because they haven't selected a fruit. Okay, and then otherwise you're going to say you have made a selection. You have made a selection. So you either need to select or you have made a selection. Okay, so if I didn't select anything, it should tell me, uh, please select a fruit. So now I'm going to select the guava. And if I click there, it should tell me you have made a selection. So what we are testing here is to check to see whether you have made a selection or not. And how will you know that you have not made a selection? It will return a value of negative one. All right. Um, to clear your list box, you just need to say list fruit in this case dot items dot clear. And that will clear out your list box. Okay, so we have gone through the count, the item index, dot items, dot index off, and then we learned how to add, then we learned how to insert at a specified position, delete at a specified position, and then how to test if a selection was not made, and then how to clear the list box. So now we're moving on to load from file. So what load from file does is that it works with the text file. So let's just say, for example, we had a text file called flowers. And in that text file, we had a list of flowers. And we want to load that in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to write code to load the data from that um, notepad file into this list box. Currently, this list box does not have anything. So if I click in this, I'm going to say uh, list box flowers dot items dot load from file. And the name of the text file is flowers.txt. So what you need to make sure of is that this text file flowers.txt must be contained in the same folder as this project. If it is not there, then it will not find that file and it will not load. So if I click on that, it shows me the different types of flowers that are saved in that text file. So what we're going to do next is we're going to save these names that are in this list box called names to a new text file called uh, names.txt. Okay, so I'm quickly going to go show you that folder uh, where we have this project. So I'm going to go to bootcamp, selection components. So if you look here, this is my Delphi project. There's my Delphi project. And I have flowers.txt, which I have loaded already into my list flowers. And there's my uh, files for my project. So I currently do not have names.txt here. Okay. So I'm going to close that and then I'm going back to my Delphi project and I'm going to save this into that folder. So I'm going to say lst names dot items dot save to file and the name of the text file that I'm creating 
is names.txt. So it's going to save all the names into that text file. So let's see how that works. Go here and I'm going to click on save and close that. And then I'm going back into my folder. Let's go into my folder quickly. Okay, so there's it here, bootcamp, selection components. And I'm going to share that with you now. And there's your names.txt. And if you open that, you will see that these are the names that were in that list box and are now saved in that file, in the file called names.txt. Okay, good. So that is how a list box works. And these are the various properties that you can use with the list box. So now coming to combo boxes, everything that we've learned um, using a list box will also apply to a combo box. But very often you would see that when you extract values from a combo box, you would find that many people use dot text. So let's see what's the difference between dot text and dot items, dot item index. So let's do that quickly and see what's the difference. So var, we're going to say s index selected. Well, actually, this will be f item selected first. S item selected. And that's a string. So here we're going to say s item selected is equal to combo box. So here we're working with the menu. So menu dot text. So we see that very often. And then we also see the other way of extracting like we did in the list box. You say I uh, index selected, which is an integer. And then here you'll say I index selected is equal to combo box menu dot item index. And then you say S item selected is equal to combo box menu dot items. And in your square brackets, you put your index that was selected. Okay, so I'm just going to comment this first and run the first one and see what it does. So where you have just the combo box menu.txt. Okay, we have a uh, an edit box that we can display it in. So let's do that. Let's display that. So combo box or the edit box item selected dot text. Just want to make sure that it is item selected. EDT fruit selected. EDT. Okay, I'm just going to change. This is not fruit anymore. This is now our menu selected. Menu selected. So here we're going to say edt menu selected dot text is equal to s item selected. So you're going to select an item using the dot text. So here, if I don't select an item, it's going to say select from menu. It's going to give you your heading. If I did not select an item, it gives you your heading. And if I select sandwich, then that's fine. Okay. So now notice that it displayed the heading if we did not select the item. So what happens now when we use the other code? Let's go there and comment this one. And we still want to display it. So I'm just going to cut that out and display it here and see what happens when you use the alternative method of getting the item. 
So if I didn't select anything, so I'm there, I didn't select, and can you see what happens? It doesn't say select from menu. It just leaves it blank, which I think is better because you don't want to see there select from menu. You can just leave it blank. And then if you do select an item, then it will display that. So that's the difference between the dot text and the dot items and item selected. Because here, the one will display your heading, the dot text, and the other one will leave it blank. So what we're going to learn next is how to copy one item at a time. Okay, so we're going to copy from our combo box and we're going to display it here into our list menu. So let's just say, for example, I selected pizza. It must add pizza to my list. Then if I selected a burger, it must add burger to my list. Okay, so let's try that. We're going to first work out the item index of what we selected. So I, item index, which is an integer. We're going to work out the item index of the one you selected from the combo box. The so combo box menu dot item index extract the item index and now we're going to go into our list box menu and add that so items dot add and where are we taking from we're taking that from our combo box menu dot items dot items and in square brackets we're going to put the item index Okay, so that's being able to copy one at a time. So let us now see how you're going to copy all the items. If you want to copy all the items, then you're going to have to run a loop because we don't know at this point how many items there are because we have the option to add and remove. So we're going to run a loop and we're going to say for I, equal one, two, combo box menu dot items. So how do we know the number of items? You do a count. Now, remember that your index starts off at zero. So you change that to zero. Your item index starts from zero. And if there are five items, the last item index will be four. So that is why we are saying here 5 minus 1, which is 4. So that will allow you to start at the first index. So you have access to the first fruit. And well, in this case, menu. And then you go to the last one on the menu. And what do you want to do? You want to save into the list. So list menu dot items dot add and where are we taking from we're taking from the combo box so you're going to say combo box menu dot items and your index will be dependent on the value of i so when i is zero it will go to the first index and it will copy the menu item at the combo box into your list box okay so let us try out that one Okay, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to select a pizza and copy that. Then I'm going to select a pasta and copy that. Then I'm going to select the curry and rice and copy that. Okay, I should have just cleared out the list box before we did the next one. Otherwise, it's just going to add under that. So I'm going to go and before I copy all the items, I'm just going to clear it out first. So our list box menu dot items dot clear. So I'm going to clear it out before I display all the items at once. I'm going to go back. There you go. So there I'm going to copy all. Okay, so it took all the items from our combo box 
and it placed it here. So move one item at a time. What does move one item at a time mean? It's going to delete the item from the combo box as it displays in the list box. So if you, for example, selected a pizza and place it into your list box, it must delete pizza from the combo box. So how would you do that? It's the same code as copying. So I'm gonna go here to copy one item at a time. It's exactly the same code. Control C, and I'm gonna go to move. So it's the same code, but this time after it copied, we want to now delete it from the combo box. We're gonna say combo box menu dot items dot delete. And we are deleting at that item index that was selected. Okay, and then you're gonna do exactly the same thing again. When you are copying all items, this is what you did, control C. And when you want to move all the items, you do the same thing. And this time, when you're inside, you're gonna say combo box menu dot items dot delete. And at what index? At I, because now you've got many to delete. Okay, so then it should leave your combo box empty after you've now moved everything into the list box. So if you, for example, choose a sandwich and you say move, so it moved the sandwich there and notice that it removed it from the combo box. So if you choose a pasta and move it, so it's here now, but it's not in the combo box anymore. Okay, and if you're gonna move all the items, so that's all you have left. Back. So move all items would be, um, yeah, so you're gonna clear that and then you're going to move one item at a time. And then as you move the item, you're going to delete it from the combo box. All right, so we're now moving into the radio group. There's not much left um, in order in terms of the properties because we have discussed everything that applies to list boxes and combo boxes and the same um, um, functions and same properties apply to the radio group. Um, the only thing that I'd like to show you about the radio group would be the layout of your radio buttons inside it. So here, notice that you have all the options one below the other. Burger, pizza, sandwich, pasta. So depending on the amount of space you have on your interface or the layout or how you want it positioned, you can choose the number of columns that you want for your radio group. So in this case, by default, the column setting is one. So if you go here, click in your radio group, and you go to the column property, which is here, by default, it has been set to one. So if you change it to two, let's see what happens. It means then you have two columns. So if you have two columns, then it's going to place the items like that. Okay, I'll just show that to you. There. Okay, then obviously you want to extend it a bit because notice that it was cut. So here you're just going to make it a bit bigger there. If you change it to four columns and then you find that you just have one horizontal line with all your options in one row but four columns like that. So you can change your column setting based on um, your layout and how you want it positioned uh, in your interface. All right, so that's your column setting and all the other functions will apply as discussed for your list boxes, your combo boxes, uh, the same things will work with your radio group. I'm just gonna save all of that. Okay, so thank you very much for attending this discussion. And I hope that 
I have empowered you and I've capacitated you a bit on uh, selection components and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much. Well, hello everybody. Um, just make sure I'm not muted. Yes, that's good. That's always a good start for the first uh, link of the day. Um, thanks very much to uh, Georgina. Uh, excellent video and the good news is um, this section is live that was a pre-recorded video and I'm pleased to say that Georgina is joining me live on the Q&A now hello Georgina that yeah, I'm not sure she can hear me hello Georgina oh no hi how are you is that ah, there you go <laughs> Uh, there's a bit of a, a bit of a delay. Hi. I think it's actually it's actually Ian. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for the video. Really good. Um, I know you're having probably a little bit of trouble with your connection. I noticed. Um, so we'll pretend you're out in space. Yeah, I am having a bit of uh, trouble. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll just pretend you're with our spaceman here, and that we're we, we've got a little uh, NASA uh, delay whilst you're standing on the moon. How's that? <laughs> okay, so, okay no problem thank you okay so um very comprehensive video and um what i'm going to do is um go through some of the questions there were a few questions um some of them i'll probably answer just to save you um a bit of a delay there the the main thing that um people asked about was sorting um uh, items in the list and um, then saying, oh, well, what happens when you sort in the list? Um, if I just uh, share my screen for one second, which is this one, hopefully. Uh, there you go. There is actually a whole example. You can see the, um, the URL there. If you go to .wiki.mparkadero.com and then go through the code examples, um, there is a uh, example of how to uh, uh, sort things. I did try and do an example, but I've got so many windows open for the uh, the presentation that I actually managed to crash a load of things. So I didn't do that example. But uh, there is a sorted property, um, as you can see um, down here. And if you set that to true, when you add items to your list box um, or, or uh, manipulate them, then they're sorted into alphabetical order. So um, I'll probably answer that one, I think. So let me just um, turn the screen sharing off again. Um, right. A um, couple of questions about um, count. When you've got list box count, someone said, do you have to have an item selected? in order to return the count of, of uh, items in the list box. Um, I'll let you answer that, Georgina. No, you don't necessarily have to have an item selected. So if you work out uh, the count, that would mean you just want to know the number of items you have in that component. So you don't necessarily have to first select an item. So it is possible to work out the count without having selected an item yes yeah Can. and in fact that um if if they think about it uh really what you're trying to say is what are the the total count of items in the list box so it would make sense to say well i've got one one count uh, one selected and it returns a count of one it's actually um, returning a property of how many are in the list there is actually um a property which is a selected um uh, count. I think I get confused because I swap between different components, but I think there's a selection count property as well. Y yeah, there's a cell count property as well. So um, if you if you want to know how many are in the selection, uh, and that's what you're trying to um, look at, then there's this property here called cell count, uh, and you just uh, query that, and it'll tell you how many items are selected in in the list box rather than uh, how many items are in the list in total so if you had all the letters of the alphabet uh, a to uh, z that would be 26 letters but you might only select the vowels for example and then you're gonna uh, select five unless i've misremembered what the vowels are so um there was that question um what was the other thing what ha happens if um you do not have an item selected um, what does it return? 
that was one of the questions. Okay, so if an item is not selected in a selection component, it would usually return a value of negative one. That is right. the value by default because the first item in the selection component has an item index of zero. So it yeah. would return a negative one if you have, have not selected an item. Yeah. Yes. And, and in fact, the, the same person who uh, um, uh, kind of guessed what the answer was there, and actually asked it as well, was also the person that asked about, um, does that mean that the count doesn't be selected? So uh, Jane, which is, I apologize if they're pronouncing their name wrong, wrong, you know, Jane Bucket or Bouquet, I don't know. Uh, um, I apologize if I've got it wrong. But uh, Jane, yes, you're quite right. So well done. Uh, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're a new programmer, you've picked it up perfectly. And if you're a senior programmer or an experienced programmer, then you know what you're doing. Um, what was the other thing? What happens if you an item is not selected, which I think we've just answered, um, you'll get a minus one. And um, the other question was um, from Richard Frank, if the list of items is not in ascending alphabetical order, how can it be sorted? And uh, does the, um, let's see, does the items, does each of items index number change to the new ascending index numbers? I'll let you answer that question. Do you know the answer? <laughs> okay. So you're asking is if the list of items is not in ascending alphabetical order, how can it be sorted? And how does yeah. each item index number change to the new ascending index numbers? Okay. So usually um, the combo box, for example, does have a dot sort property using the cell index. So you can use the um, dot sort. Uh, property if you'd like or you, you can transfer the values into a uh, an array component or any other way of sorting and you can retransfer it back into your selection component so if you want to use the dot sort that's like an automatic sort where it will sort it in, in alphabetical order uh, but if you want to program from first principles and you want to move everything into an array sort it there using first balls and transfer it back into your selection component you could do it that way as well yes yeah, so, so if they were trying to sort it by let's say it was a list of names with the first name and last name and they wanted to sort a list by last yeah. name even though alphabetically it wouldn't wouldn't make sense because it's first name and last name then they could put it into an array uh, sort it uh, using their own yes. method of sorting and then put it back in again yes. is what you're saying. so you would clear the list and we add it but obviously yes. wouldn't have the sorted properly set to true that's correct um uh, someone clear suggested the there was a bug and, and he uh, repopulated yeah yeah and have sorted set to yeah. false yeah exactly um someone trying to suggest that there was a bug in one of your your examples uh, i i didn't actually see that particular example because i uh, took over halfway through and what was happening but um what they were saying is in the move all example or items example if you um if you went to move the items in the list box then you should do it in descending order by index otherwise if you try it from the start of the uh list then the index is changed i didn't see the example it sounds like they may be right but it may also be incorrect uh, what was your take on that what what they're saying is if you've got a list like this um and let's say it's from a to z okay uh, i'm not 100 following that but we will right. try that one out we will try it because what the um the person is saying is perhaps yeah 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 i don't I, they may be right they may be wrong i i didn't see the example yeah it's one it's an exercise for the reader Okay, well, um, we are got to wrap up because it's time for the next session. But Georgina, can I just thank you for uh, yes, uh, taking part? Yes, you could try it out that way as well. I haven't tried yeah. it out that way. No. Okay, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Georgina. Um, I don't know if you're on again, but if if you are, um, I'll talk to you another time. But if not, thanks for uh, taking part. Appreciate it. Thank you. And the next video, um, if I don't get cut off, is an introduction to single.
Dimensional Arrays by Brandon Long. See you soon. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks to all. Welcome to the Coding Bootcamp and this is session core 10 where we are looking at an introduction into single dimensional arrays. Hi, I am Brandon Long. I am a teacher. I teach information technology, which is a programming subject as well as computer application technology, computer literacy subject and mathematics. I'm currently teaching in a high school in Abeja, South Africa. Yes, you heard that correct. And I have also taught in New Zealand. I love programming. I love creating programming videos and tutorials, and I like to post them on my YouTube channel so you can go find me on YouTube. If you search for Mr. Long RT and Cat, I'm an Embocardero of MVP, and I'm very passionate about superheroes. In fact, I'm just teaching now until I can find out what my proper superpowers are, and then once I find that out, I'll go into the superhero industry full time. But until then, I'll continue teaching programming. So let's get into today's lesson. We're going to be looking at arrays, as we said in the introduction. Um, so we're going to focus on what is an array, for those of you who don't know. And we're going to look at how we can declare an array, how we can initialize an array, how we can assign values to that array, and then do some things with those arrays, like displaying them and doing some special calculations on those arrays. So if you are following using Kevin Bond's book, how to program effectively in Delphi, then this is chapter 14 from that book. If you want to use it as an extra resource for supplementary material, so that's pages 229 to 236 if you want to use that book for supplementary material. So let's start off with an example. Let's pretend I want to run in the Olympics and I want to do the 100 meter race. Now, for me to do that, I'm going to have to do a lot of training because I'm definitely not fast enough to run in the Olympics. So I'm going to run as fast as I can and keep track of my time. I'm going to use a stopwatch and record my time. And I find out that my first run is 13.26 seconds. That's definitely not fast enough to be in the Olympics. I'm very slow. So I'm going to have to keep track of that and try and improve on that time. Now, I'm going to create a program that's going to keep track of all these times. So I'm going to make a variable called R time and I'm going to make it real because as you can see 13.26 that looks like a decimal number and I'm going to store that 13.26 in that variable R time and basically a block in memory is going to be created for that real and it's going to store that that value. So now we've got it in memory. That's great. But if I want to run in the Olympics, I'm going to have to do a lot of running. I'm going to have to improve on that time. So I'm going to try to do that run again. So let's try to do that run again. I'm going to run again. Go as fast as again. There. And this time I improved on my time. I got 13.01. That's great. And I also want to record that time. But I want to keep track of all my times. I don't want to lose the previous time. I want to keep track of them so I can do calculations, see if I'm improving and so on. So let's make another variable. Let's call it R time 2. And we'll store, we'll use that for this new time. And by the way, we'll just rename the previous one to R time 1 because it makes sense that we've got R time 1 and R time 2. And we're going to store that 13.01 into the second variable, which is also real of R time 2. And a second block in memory is created to store that value. Okay. But as I said, that's definitely not fast enough. I'm going to have to keep on running. So I'm going to have to run again and again and again. And I want to keep track of those times. So I'm going to end up creating a whole bunch of other variables of type real for R time 3 and R time 4. And as you can see, it's starting to get quite uh, congested there at the top. So what's happening is all those variables are going to have their own little blocks of memory to be stored. So there's R time 3 and R time 4. There's maybe even R time 5. There's probably going to be a lot more. And our memory is getting very complicated and we're getting lots of, of variables and our calculations are being quite complicated to be able to work out things on the, those times. And so it gets, it gets very messy. If only there was a way that we could combine all of those into maybe just one super variable, some big variable. What about like something like a list? Let's take this, for example. Let's take that list and let's pretend, okay, let's take that R time one. I want to place that R time one into position one of my list because that was the first time that I ran. And then R time two, let's move that into the second position in my list because that was the second time. And then we'll do the same with the other times like R time three will go into the third place. R time four into the fourth place, R time five into the fifth place. And we're basically keeping like a list of all these times. That seems a lot nicer 
to keep track of. So that's basically what an array is. It's almost like a list of different values. And all those values seem to be the same type, but they might have different actual values. So that's what an array is. And so I'm going to call my array ARR times. I like to use the prefix ARR so I know that it's an array. So it's going to get very piratey for the rest of the video because you can hear me say R times a lot of the time, but that's because of the prefix. But R times is not a real value. It is a bunch of reals or a list of reals or what's the way to be learning? An array of real values. So that's how we define our array times, which is an array of real. And then we can include square brackets after the word array and then specify how many values we want to store in the array. And in this case, we want to store 10 values starting from one until 10. So that's how we declare our array. And so now this list that we see is actually a variable or what we actually call a data structure of reals. An array is a data structure and it's going to be called R times. So that's great. So let's just talk about the terminology regarding the array. So let's first look at those values at the top there. Those are actually the index or the position or the location in the array. So you have a one, two, three, four, up until 10. That was defined by when we declared our array, that one to 10. So the first value is at position one, and then the second one at position two, it goes incrementally from one upwards. And that's the position or the index in the array. Where the actual block where we store the real value, that is the value in the array. It's actually got nothing to do with the fact that we used integers for the index. The value is a real value and that is stored in the value part of our list. So let's take an example. Let's take, for example, that little block there or cell, however you want to refer to it. So that block, if we had to specify or use the terminology, that is a value of 13.01 which is stored at position or index two in the array. So we need to make sure that we understand the difference between the value in the array and the position of the array. So make sure that you understand the difference between the index and the value. Let's go have a look at that block now. Let's say we want to put a value into that block. So that cell that's over there, that's the third block. So how do I do that? Well, we're going to first off, we're going to call our array times array. But obviously we can't put the value into array times because array times is a whole bunch of reals. Which real value do we want to put in there? But where do we want to put it? Well, we're going to put square brackets next. And in the square brackets, we're going to put a value which is going to represent the position in the array that we want to store the value. And now that three is connected with the position in the array of where we want to store that value. And then I'm going to assign that a value of 12.86. So what's going to happen now is that real value is now going to be placed inside the array at position three or index three. So that's where it's going to be stored. As long as we're storing the correct data type in the array. So this is an array of reals. So we can only put reals or real values into that array. We can't put strings or things that aren't reals in there that don't convert nicely. So how do we declare an array? In other words, when you declare a variable, you declare an integer, you would declare an array as well. And this is the general formula. You have the array name followed by a colon, followed by the word array. And then in square brackets, you will have the lower and upper bound separated by two dots. And then you have the word of followed by the data type that each value in the array will have. As you saw in our previous example, we had an array R times is the name, which is an array from one to 10 of real. So each block or cell in that array are real values. And the first value is at position one and the last value is at position 10. Let's do another declaration. Let's take this one. R years is an array from eight to 12 of integer. So what does that mean? It's going to create a list or an array that looks something like this, where the values start at eight and go to 12. It's only got five values in it or five cells because it starts from eight and goes to 12. That's the length of it. But the first value's position is at position eight and then nine and 10 and so on. And each block in that array will be its own integer value because this is an array of integers. Let's take another example. Our list is an array from negative five to five of string. So can you think about how many cells are going to be in that block? Did you say 10? If you did, you're wrong because don't forget that zero. So it's negative five, then negative four, up until zero, then one, two, three. So there are 11 cells in this array. So even though we started with a negative number, that's fine. As long as they go incrementally from a small value to a big value, then we can use them. And each block in that array are going to be strings or text. 
Now, that value that is in the upper bound and the lower bound it must be what we call an ordinal type. An ordinal type is any value that has an order to it. You can give it, get a value and say, what is the next value going to be? So if I gave you the number one, you know that the next value after one will be a two and then a three. But if I gave you like a real value, like 3.2, you don't know what the next value is going to be. Is it 3.3? Is it 3.21? Is it 3.2001? So real values don't tend to have order to them, but an integer does. And integers aren't the only ones that have order to it. You could have something like this, where we have an array or R grades, which is an array from A to F. Now here we are using characters for the lower and upper bound. So it's going to look something like this, where the index is represented by characters, because characters have order. If I give you the letter A, you would know that the next letter would be the letter B. And that's because of the ASCII values has an order to it. And so this array has six cells, and the first cell is at position A, and then second at B, and so on, until F. And each one of those blocks will be an integer. Now that we understand arrays a little bit, and we know how to declare them, how do we use them? Well, let's try that out in an example. So let's go try some examples out on the program. Now here's the example that we're going to work with. Now I'm using a VCL application. For those of you who don't know, when you create a new program, you can go new and we, there we go, it's the new VCL application. So I'm using that. Some of you might be using a console application. That's great as well. You can still do that. I just like the Windows ones because I like buttons and I like to be able to see the things using buttons and that. I just like to use that. So let's take an example. First of all, let's go to the code and let's go and declare some arrays. So let's click over here and go to the code. So I'm going to scroll down and here you can see I've already declared some arrays just so that we can see. So over here, we've got an array, array years, which is an array from 8 to 12 of integer. Now, if I've got more than one array, I don't need to just do that multiple times. I can actually just put a comma just like you would do if you were declaring two integers. You could just go comma and the second name of the integer the same thing here, you can do the second name of the array, and both of these array, arrays will be an array from 8 to 12 of integer. And this array temp will have different values to the array years, if we give them different values. So there is array list, we saw that example, which is an array of string, and then we've got array grades, which is an array from A to F of integers. So let's go and declare our array, we actually want to make it array times, I prefer that word. So let's go, I'm going to declare array time, so we give the name of the array, followed by a colon, followed by the word array, open square bracket. Now we want to have 10 values, so we're going to go from 1 up until 10. And they are each going to be a real value. So we're going to say the word of, followed by the word real. So that is my array. Sometimes you might notice that in textbooks and little examples, sometimes the bounds that they use would be from naught up until 9. Sometimes they like to start with 0 as the starting value. You'll notice in Delphi, a lot of the components, the first value starts at a 0, like the radio group and so on. So some conventions like to start the arrays at 0 up until 9. So that is another possibility if you see examples like that. So that is the array, it has 10 blocks, and each block is a real, and those blocks currently have nothing in them. Now, we want to give the real values to this array. Now, you can initialize the values. In other words, you can start this array with default values in it already. And to do that, I'm just, it says here, initiate the values to the array. So the first one must be that, and the second one must be that. How do I initialize the array? Well, to initialize the array, to give it its starting values, after the word real, we're going to put an equal to sign. And then I'm going to have two brackets, an open bracket and a close bracket. And inside, in between these two brackets, I need to list all the values in the array. Now, here's the trick. Those values obviously need to match what type you are wanting to put into the array. That's the first criteria. And the second criteria is that you need to have exactly the right amount of values. You can't just put in the first five. I need to put all 10 values in. Obviously, if this was an array from 1 to 100, I might not want to initialize it because it's going to take me forever to list all those values. So the first value we're going to give is 13.26. Okay, and then I'll put a comma. And the next value is going to be... 13.01, so 13.01, and then I'll put a comma, and then I'm going to put eight more values in. I'm going to go ahead and do that just to save time. So there I've gone and added values. You can't see them. There they are. I'm just going to, there's one, two. This is my third value. This is my fourth value. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. Oh, there's only nine. Remember, we said we must put in the exact amount, and how many does this one need? It needs from 1 to 10, it needs 10 values. So I need to give it a 10th value. Make sure that you fill in all the values. I'm just going to give it a naught for this, for that value. Just pretend it's blank. So you see the errors disappeared. 
So there we go. I've initialized my rating. It's very difficult to see. I'm actually going to put this all on one line so we can have a look and see what it looks like. Just to visually see it so that it makes a bit more sense. There we go. So it looks a little bit better like this. So we can see all our 10 values. There we go. All looking very pretty and so on. No, don't delete that. We want to go to a new line. Press enter. And there we go. So there are my 10 values between two brackets. Remember there's an equal to sign. And those are the default values. So this array, when it gets created, will be an array of reals from 1 to 10. And that value will be in position 1 as the default. That will be in position 2 and so on and so on and so on. So that is our array. That's great. So we've initialized it. So let's go do some other questions here. So let's go have a look over here. We want to add a new time. So what I've done is I've created a edit box where we can fit, put the value that we want to put into the array. And we can then specify using the spin edit where we want to put it in the array. Okay, so we're going to do that. So I'm going to click on here. To, oh, no, don't click on there. As long as we want to go to the add new time. Let's go to that one. So I've already done the input for us. I've recorded the new time, which is a real value. Why? Because we want to put real values into our array. And I got it from EDT time, which as you saw was that edit box. Great. And we got it from the text property, but that's a string. So we converted it from a string to a float because we want it to be, yes, a real. And then the position we got from the spin edit, SED position, that's that one. There we go. And we got it from the value property. And when the value property is an integer, our position is an integer. They both match, so that's perfect, and that's because we, that's the index. We want to put it at position, which is an integer. So how do we want to do this? Well, we said we want to add a value into array times, and then in square brackets, we will specify the position of where we want to put it. And maybe I want to put it into position 3. Maybe I want to put it in position 10, because we know 10's got a blank. Maybe I want to do it in position 1. Okay, so you, we want, you can do that, and then I'm going to say equal or sign. It to its new value. Now I can type in the value like 12.05. I can do that as well. Or I can use a real value instead, which I've got one there. That's the new time. Our new time. Now that will always put it in at position one. I want to specify using that. So although this is an integer and we want to put a number there, we can put an integer variable in the position as well. So I can actually put our position there. So even though it's not exactly an integer value, it's an integer variable which will have an integer value. And so it will put the array times in that particular position for that new time. And then we go, hey, let's add new values. So let's try it out and see what it does. Run it. So there it is. It's compiled. So let's try it. So we want to put in a value. Let's say we want to put a value in at position 10. I'm going to add a new time. And it says that a new value is added. Now we can't actually check that because we can't display anything. But let's just test if what would happen if I said position 15. Now let's ask yourself, is there a position 15 in the array? So let's see what happens when I press that button. It says a new value is added, but it obviously wouldn't be able to, because that value doesn't exist. There's no 15 in the array. So we would probably do some sort of try catch area to see if there was an error to avoid that particular thing from happening. Or, what you could also do is you could put a limit on your spin edit and say we only want values. If I come here to the spin edit, we want a max value of or a min value of one because we can't go lower than one and we want a max value of 10. And that way they can't put in values that are outside of our range of our array. So you could do things like that. So, so we added the value. It didn't give us the error that we wanted, but we know that that should work. Well, we don't actually. Well, let's go and display the array so that we can actually see what's happening. Okay, so that's what my next button is going to do. I'm going to display the array. In other words, I want to display all the values, all the times in the array, in that rich edit, that rich display. That's this one over here. And I want to display it like this. I want to display the first time and then some spaces and then the time that was what's what, I think 13 point something blah 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 I think 225 or whatever and then the second time was I think 13.01 so that's what I want it to look like so I want something that's going one two three four up until ten and then the value at position one the value at position two and so on so think about that how are we going to do that so I'm going to just put that to the side so we want to display those values. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to, in the rich edit, so rich edit display, we've already cleared it. That's great. Dot lines dot add. We're going to display a one plus, how do I get a nice little gap? Do you remember? Well, to get that little gap, that's a tab. So we can say hash nine plus the value in the array, 13 at position one. So that's going to be the value in the array at position one. 
So there we go. That's what I want to display. Now remember, a rich edit needs a string. The whole thing needs to be a string. So is one a string? No, that's an integer. So we're going to convert that from an integer to a string. And then plus the hash nine, that's fine. But when we add this array times, that's a problem. That's a real value. So we can use a float to string to display that because that's the conversion for a real number. And then we put our semicolon at the end there. There, there we go. We've got everything. That looks fine. Okay, so there we go. I'm going to put this on a new line just so we can see it. So you can visually see it. There we go. So that's going to display the first bit. Yeah. Now we're going to do that again. So I'm going to copy this. And we're going to paste it. And now this is going to be the second value. And we're going to display a position 2. And then I'm going to take this and copy it and do it for position 3. And so on and so on. Are you getting the idea? Now this is taking a long time to do, Mr. Long. Is there not an easier way? Well, if we had done this the old way, where we had a whole bunch of 10 variables, 10 separate real numbers that we wanted to display, we would probably have to do something like this. So let's first see if this works. Let's just see if it works. And if it works, then we'll see if we can make this a little bit easier. So this is only going to do the first three. I'll have to do a lot more of copy and pasting to be able to do it. So let's display the times. So there we go. There are the first three times. Okay, I think it's working. But we want to do that for all 10. I'm going to have to copy paste this again and again. Now that's a waste of time. But the beauty of arrays is that we can see, I'm doing this, I'm doing that one, two, three. That looks like a, a variable that can go one, two, three. That looks like a for loop from one to 10. And then I want that to go one, two, three. That's also like a for loop variable that's going one to 10. So I want to just, I basically want to do this line of code 10 times, except for that value and that part must change every single time. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually uh, say, hey, put it in a for loop for r equals. Now, what's the lowest value in my array? That's one. That's the position, the index, and the highest is a 10. Okay, so we can do that. And what I want to do 10 times, I'm going to display a value that's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. Do I have a variable that goes 1, 2, 3? Well, I don't actually have a variable. I'm going to declare my variable here, variable r of type integer. Do I have a variable that's going 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, up to 10? Yes, that's the r variable. So instead of displaying 1, I'm going to display r. And then put a hash 9. Then I want to display the value in the array at position 1. And then the value at position 2. And the value at Do I have the value at position r? Because r is going 1, 2, 3. So I'm going to put an r there. Now because of this, do you see, this is technically one line of code. So this one line of code is the same as having that thing copied again and again 10 times. This is a lot more efficient. Imagine... If I had a hundred elements in my array, I would have to copy it a hundred times. Where yeah, I can just literally do that and it would work for a hundred times. That's the beauty of this, of using arrays. Do you see how it's made our code so much more efficient? Well, we hope so. Let's test it. Let's go see if it works. So let's go first see if the code works. So first of all, we're going to display the times. And there we go. That technically one to that for loop with that one line of code is what is doing all of the display. And be, it's because we are using an array and not 10 random different variables. So there we go. So now we can do some testing. Let's go. I'm going to change. I'm going to put 12.05. I'm going to put it at position 10. Let's add it. A new value has been added. Okay. But nothing's changed. Ah, oh, that's because we haven't clicked on display times. Let's click on it again. There we go. Our new value has been added. Now let's say we want to change that value. Let's change that to a new value. So we're going to change position 3. And we're going to give it a value of 12.00. Let's do that. 12.0. So look at position 3. We want to change that from 12.56 to 12.00. Add that time. We'll change that time. Okay. Doesn't look like anything happened. No, but we haven't clicked display. Click on display. Now keep your eye over here. Keep your eye over here. Do you see a change? Now because it's displaying the real, it didn't put the dot zero zero, but it's the same thing. Do you see it is technically working? If I'd made that 1201 and added a new time, you'll see it's it is it's definitely working. It's doing the right thing. So there we go. So that shows you how efficient it is to use arrays. While we are here, though, I just want to teach you about a function quickly. There is a function called a length function. So I can actually come here and change that 10 to the length of the array name. So that's array times. And that will send back how many blocks or cells there are in the array. It won't tell me what the last value is. It'll just tell me how many blocks there are. So if we're starting at 1, then you can go to the length of array times, which will be 10. So if I looked over here, so the length of that 
array here would be 5. So I wouldn't go from 8 until the length because the last value isn't 5, it's 12. So just be careful of that. But if you're starting at 1, you can actually go to the length of the array. So let's test that just to see if it works. And let's run it to display. And there we go. It does basically the same thing. Okay, so there we go. So let's try that other example. Let's go look. Let's do the average time. So we want to calculate the average time. So as you saw all those times, the average would be all those times added together. And we want to divide it by 10 because that's how many times we had. We're going to, we'll add one to the last one. So let's calculate the average time. So to do the average time, I'm going to need a variable that's going to record the sum of all the, the times. So I've got R sum, which is going to be real. And then to calculate the average, I'm going to have a array variable or our average variable, and that's going to calculate the average. So it's going to be the sum divided by 10. Okay, so let's work this out. So I need to add all the times together. Okay, so let's go. So it's our sum. We want to add the first time, which is array times 1, and then we're going to add array times 2, and then array times 3. And uh, oh, you see, this is taking quite long. I'm going to have to, up until like 10, that's quite a bit. I'm going to have to copy and paste it. But yeah, imagine if there were 100 times, then this would take me forever. But wait, we don't have to do it this way. We can use a for loop like we did earlier. So let's replace this. Let's go, okay, wait, 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 wait. We can do a for loop that goes from 1 until 10. Okay, because there are 10 values. So let's go and put my R variable over here. I is of type integer. Oh, integer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the sum variable, take whatever's currently in the sum variable and add the value at position 1, and then the value at position 2, and then the value at position 3. And what variable is going 1, 2, 3? That's my R variable. Then I don't need all of this. I can just put a semicolon there. So it's going to take that first value and add it onto R sum and make that the new R sum. And then the next time it's going to take the second value and add it onto R sum and make that the new value. But just take note, the very first time we do this, it's going to take the first time, which we saw was 13.26. So it's going to take 13.26 and add it onto what? What is R sum when it starts? Well, it doesn't have a value. It doesn't have a value at the beginning. So we need to give it a starting value. In other words, we need to initialize R sum to zero because at the beginning there's nothing in R sum. So remember to initialize, or if you're in America, the Z E at the end, if you want that. I think we spell it with S, you might put it with a Z. Initialize R sum. So the first time it does it, it takes that first time, that one, and adds it onto zero, and that becomes R sum. And then it's going to take the 13.01 and add it onto what's currently in R sum, and so on and so on. And then when the loop is done, when it's added all those values, so we finished with the loop. Then, and only then can I work out the average. I can't work out the average while I'm adding all the values. I can only do it once I've added all the values. So the average is going to be whatever is in R sum divided by how many values? 10. Or you could have actually used the length of array times if you wanted to as well. That would also be a possibility. So R sum divided by 10, and that will give me the average. And then we can display that in the rich edit. Let's display it in the rich edit. I'm going to display it at the end of everything. Dot lines, dot add. I'm going to just put a new new line. Do you know how to make a new line? Hash 13 plus, let's put the text average is, and then I'm going to add R A V E there. Okay. But is this whole thing needs to be a string. Is that a string? Well, that is considered a string. Is that a string? That's fine. That's not a string. That needs to be, that's a real. It was converted from a float to a string so that it fits so there we go so I'm gonna put that on new line just so we can see it you see the code let's run it and see what it does first of all we're gonna display the times so we can see them all and I want to change that 10 I definitely want to change that 10 let's go add in a value I don't want to add naught to my sum so add a new time so there we go it's been added so let's look there we go it's been added now let's work out the average time and I'm pretty sure if I added all those values together, I would get 12.511. So that is the average of all the times. Still not good enough for the Olympics, Mr. Long. You're going to have to do a little bit more faster running. Okay, so there we go. So let's do another example. Let's do the best time. So the best time is obviously the, the, the biggest or the smallest. The best time is the shortest time. In other words, the smallest time. So we want to find the smallest value in the array. So how do I'm going to do that? So let's try that example. So I created a variable called our best, which is going to store the value of the best time. And so I need to check now if our times one is the smallest. In other words, is that smaller than array times two? 
and at the same time is array times one smaller than array times three no no, no. this is going to take me forever because i have to check that for all other nine variables and then i'm going to have to check it again for like, a, like this is very complicated i don't think that's going to work but we don't need it to work we can use our loop and loop through all the values and try to find it that way so let's try this we're going to loop through the array from one until ten so I need an i variable. I'm going to make an i of type integer. And what am I going to do? I'm going to go and say, okay, if, let's put a begin end just for interest sake. I'm just going to put an end of the for loop here. If the value in the array at position one, if that is smaller than my best value, because this is going to store my best value. If that is smaller than the best value, then do you agree that my best value isn't small anymore? This is the new small one. So then I'm going to say, okay, then if that's the case, then we must change our best to this one, because this is the new champion. This is the new winning time. So that's going to be array times one. And then we will do it again for number two. If two is better than the our best, then we'll change it to a two. And then if three, but it'll only do this if three is smaller than our best so we are checking one two three well, we are checking if r is smaller than our best and if r if our array times at position r is smaller then our best must become our best at the position r whatever that or r times at position r so that's how we do that so we check if the times value at that position is, is smaller than, if that is and that's our new champion and that must now go back into our best because our best is not small enough anymore now, just like we did with our sum, we need to give our best a starting value. There are lots of ways of doing it. Some people give our best the value of the first value in the array. I just do this. I say our best must be initialized to the opposite of what you want. We want to find the smallest value. So the opposite of the smallest value is the biggest value. So I'm going to initialize our best to a really, 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 really big number so that I know that the very first value that I check against our best will definitely be smaller. So therefore, array times one will definitely beat that. So it will start off with array best being array times one. That's just my little way of doing that. And then we can display the best time. Because once it gets to the end, whatever's left in our best will definitely be the smallest in the array. So I can then go, okay, so we can say rich line display dot lines add, and we're going to display a hash 13 plus the best time is our best but our best is what it's a real so we must convert from a float to a string and let's put that on a new line so we can see it so there we go so let's try that out and running it come over here so we're going to display all the times so let's just have a look at them I'm going to actually put in this at 10 again so that we don't have zero as the best time because there's no way I'm going to run a race in zero times. So there we go. So which is the best time? Do you see it? Do you see it? It's that one there. There it is. So let's find the best time. The best time is 11.97. There we go. And if I change one of them, let's say I change the second one to 11.05. That's definitely the best one now. So I'm going to add that new time. I'm going to display the times. You see, there's the new best. It's on the best time. There we go. It found the new best time. So just to understand the difference between the value in the array and the position of the array, I want to do something of the I don't only want to display what the best time is. I want to display which number that best time was. So was it the first time I ran or the second time I ran? So I want us to do that. So I want not only want the best time, but I want to find the when that best time was run. Was it the first one? So the, I'm going to say, ah, pause the best you know which the position of the best and so what i'm going to do is when i find the best time i'm not only going to record the new best time but i need to record its position uh, pause best and what is its position so remember array times r is the value in the array and the r value is its position in the array so array times that's the value at position r so if i want to find its position where is it then that's going to be my r variable so there we can see the difference between the value in the array and the position of that value so that's at position r and that's going to be the value at position r so you can see the difference so when i display i'm now going to just add a at position 
and then put a plus and then we can put a new little r best pos now that is an integer which we can convert from an int to a string okay can we see it clearly i'm just move this back a bit so you can see it so that's the code that i want to do int to string r best pos there we go i think we're missing something are we missing all right so it's r pos best not r pos best, best pos r pos best the position of the best one so there's i said that's the r value that's the array times r so we can see the difference so let's run it let's put that value at position 10 and display it and so when we say the best time do you see it's first displaying r best which was storing the value in the array at that position r but if i scroll down R pos best stored the value which was R at that time, which was position 8, which you can see it is the value at position 8 that we had the best time. Now, as you saw, when we did the calculations, we did the average of the array and we found the smallest value in the array. You can also just modify that slightly to get the biggest value. But I want you to see how easy it was to do a loop through the array and do those calculations. If I had separate variables, like I had in the initial, when I explained how I was going to do my running with separate variables, it would be a lot more difficult to do those calculations as simply as what I've done today. So you can see the power of the arrays. And what's also useful is that there are lots of recipes or algorithms that have been developed already you don't need to recreate the wheel there have been people that have developed the best case scenarios for a lot of the algorithms of what you might want to do with a list of numbers or a list of strings so for example there might be a sign where you want to insert a value into an array and shift everything up there's an algorithm that exists to do that there's an algorithm where you can remove an element from the array and shift everything back in place there are algorithms where you can take two different arrays and merge them into one array. There's algorithms where you can search through array for a particular value. Even maybe you want to put those array, those values in the array in a particular order from ascending order or descending order. There are recipes or algorithms that exist already that you do not need to recreate. You can just go research those algorithms and apply them to your arrays. Even if you don't 100% understand how the code works, if you just use the code and are able to adapt it to your scenario, then you can use that recipe to do the function that you want it to do. So not only does arrays make your code a lot simple, it also allows you opportunity to see other people's code or other formulas or algorithms that have been used that you can apply to your code to make your life easier. Let's try an example quickly while we've got some time. Right, let's take this. There are lots of different sorts that you get. You get a bubble sort and a selection sort. Yeah, is an insertion sort. Uh, there's the code for it. And maybe you're looking at this guy and say, I don't understand what that's doing. We can just believe that it works and we can apply it to our scenario. So let's pretend we found this algorithm and we want to sort our array. And I'm not just going to apply this to our actual example. So let's go try that out quickly. So let's go to the example. So I've added a new button called sort array and I'm literally going to put the code up on the side there. Let's delete all this stuff that I had. I had some little notes at the bottom and I'm literally going to apply this code that you can see on the side there to this particular scenario. So I don't even know, need to know how it works. I actually do know how it works, but let's pretend I didn't. So I can see there I've got a couple of variables. I've got an I and a J variable, which are type integers because they're going to be for my for loops. And there's a key variable that, that I assume it's got, as you can see, it's storing a value in the array and we've got an array of reals. So I'm going to make an R key, which is a type real. And I'm simply going to interpret this code as it is. So the first step there was a for loop. Let's take the J value, which starts at position two until the length of the array. Well, let's just say we know our array has 10 values, so we'll use that. And what are we doing inside this array, this for loop? So let's put our begin and end just so that we can do lots of things. This is the end of the J loop. And we're going to, okay, so we're going to say the key value is equal to the value in the array. So they say array, we've got array times because that's the name of our array at position J. And then we're going to take i is equal to j minus 1. I'm just interpreting the code. Now there's a while loop. While the value in the array times at position i is bigger than the value in the key. And i is greater than 0. Now because we've got an and, remember we must put brackets around our conditions. There we go. And we're going to 
in this while loop we're going to put a begin and end because i might be doing multiple things there this is the end of the while loop and what are we doing in this while loop well we are setting a new value for array times r plus one to be whatever is an array times at position r so we're shifting things up there it looks like and then r is equal to r minus one and then outside the loop over here somewhere before we get to the still in the for loop but we can say array times i like just to make it a little more specific at position r plus one is now going to equal to the value in my key where's the one there's the one so have a look at the code did we apply the code correctly as again you might not understand what that code's doing but i just i've been told that it's a source and that it works so we can just apply it and see if it works let's go try it so I'm going to first of all add that tenth value. I should have actually done it from the beginning. So add the value and display. So we see you can see they're not in in order. They're in any order. But if I sort it, and I should have had a button or something that said it's been sorted. So it's been sorted in the background. So let's display them again and see if it re-displays it in some sort of order. Is it in some sort of order? There's the smallest one, and it looks like it's in ascending order. It sorted the array. It shifted everything up so that the first, the smallest value is at the top and the biggest value is at the bottom. So just taking an algorithm that exists already and applying it to our arrays made my life so much easier. I didn't have to recreate the wheel. I didn't have to recreate a sort. There's one that exists already that I can straight away apply. So that's the beauty of arrays. So let's do a summary of what we've learned in this lesson. So we learned about that an array is a single data structure that can store many values of a particular type. So there's an example of one array and each value will be of the same data type as the others. So that example there is a bunch of reals where this one is a bunch of strings. And we also learned that each cell has an index, a position and a value for it. So the index is its position. The value is the value at that particular position in the array. We learned how to declare an array. There we go, the name of the array with the array square brackets, the lower and upper bound, and what the data type is. We learned how to assign values to an array, if you remember correctly. So it's the name of the array, any square bracket with the position of the new value, and then assign it a new value as long as it matches the data type of the array and how to loop or traverse an array and go through it and do those things and we did it because we wanted to do calculations so we went from the lower bound to the upper bound and that as i said we wanted to display we wanted to find the sum we want to find the minimum value and that was all in a ways to use the array and then we how we can use already established algorithms where we can simply just apply to our array to make our life easier if you would like more practice, I suggest that you get hold of Kevin Bond's book. It's got lots of examples in there that uses the console. Look at chapter 14. Those are the pages that we refer to. You can also go look at some of the videos that I have online. I've got a YouTube channel. You can search for Mr. Long RT and Cat and look for that yellow and blue symbol and you'll find my channel and go look at the playlist for anything to do with arrays. Also, I've got some exercises and notes that you can use if you want to use a VCL application. You can download those from tinyurl.com slash Mr. Long Arrays, all the data files and all the little notes you can get from there, you're welcome to use that. So thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope that you are more aware of Arrays and you know how you can use it. You can get some more code there from that link over there. And as I often say in my videos, remember, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long Way. Excellent. That's fantastic. Do the Mr. Long Way. I love it. Yeah, really, really good video. And lots and lots of people were uh, uh, commenting on that and asking questions. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, we've actually got Brandon uh, joining us live as well. Um, hello, Brandon. Um, let me just, there you go. You're you're live on air. How are you? How's it going, everyone? Uh, yeah, I think you're the first person ever. I, I could be wrong, but are you, is the place name that you mentioned, is that in, is it Corsa? Is that how you say it? Um, yes, it's uh, one of the, the, the tribes in our area is Kosa, and um, it used to be called Port Elizabeth, but now it's called Klebecha, so 
Um, we've got clicks <laughs> in a lot of our languages, which is it's quite a it's quite a good party trick when we go overseas. Like people go, you got clicks in your language. It's, it's, it's a good party trick. But yeah. yeah, it's I, I had to mention it because you can't possibly mention it like that and get it and get away with not mentioning it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's a great language. I, I've I've actually had a look at a few things in there. I don't think my math works that way. I've still got a British accent. I've lived in uh, the US for 13 years, so I don't think I'm going to pick up any other languages too easily. Um, One okay, of my favorite so things is, is the Q, is a click. So whenever I tell students we can do SQL, I always go, we can do SQL. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, talking about students, I must mention uh, one thing that we had, um, uh, and that is a, a comment from Keith Gibson, uh, who said he used to be your teacher. Is that right? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm lucky to be on the shoulders of giants, and he is a, a giant in the RT profession when it comes to South Africa with the teacher profession. He is a, an amazing teacher and mentor to a lot of people, and I've had the privilege of being taught by him. So if all of my legacy is all because of him. So it's very nice to see my old teacher yeah, and mentor. Well, it's, it, it's great. And, and then this is one of the great things about being a teacher as well is is uh, passing on the knowledge and then how the people then passing on the knowledge. And I, I think, you know, I've always said to people, this is how you live forever. It's the actions that you, you uh, take and the knowledge and the way that you touch people in terms of how you impart knowledge is, is how you, you can live on forever. So it's really great. Well, yeah. well, thanks a lot, Keith, for mentioning that because that, that was fantastic. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, uh, a few people saying thanks for the uh, videos and training. A um, couple of questions that are kind of related to um, the video. Um, one of them was... Um, must all array values be of the same type? And I kind of answered that in the questions, but um, wondered yeah. if you wanted to sort of expand on that a bit. Well, when you declare an array, you normally each little block in the in the memory is going to be of a bit of a same type. You can use a variant. Um, that is one way. Um, another way, if you if you, when we get obviously there are going to be other sessions that talk about objects and records and stuff like that, where you can actually create an array of those objects, and those objects could have different variable types in them. So there are ways around it, but most of the time are they, they, most of the time they're going to be of the same type unless you go some special way around it. Yeah, and in, and in fact, the the following question from that was someone um, asking about dictionaries. So presumably they're they're used to uh, other languages as well because uh, yeah. dictionary is not something that springs to mind. And I, I did actually include a link um, to there because there is, um, let me see if I've got it here. I'll just share my screen for a second. Uh, let me just, uh, there, there is indeed a dictionary type and um, they're called generics. Um, that's kind of way beyond what we're doing in this particular video. Um, you know, dictionaries are a special type of array, I suppose, is one way of looking at them. And they're not really even arrays, um, but you can enumerate them and you can you can iterate through them and, and all sorts of things as well. But there are um, quite a few different um, uh, what we would call structured types and, and also um, yeah, different types of array as well. So what you were really um, focusing on in your video was, I would think, the... Um, uh, just the single dimensional arrays and yeah. that's kind of you know no you can't fundamental deal yeah you can't you can't really have more than one type in in the array at the same yeah. time so that, that that's it um okay so what else have we got um yeah um this one is um a question which i ha i had to ask them to explain what they meant what the core distinction between tables and they mean database tables and okay. array. Um, I don't know whether you want to just cover that um, or if you. Yeah, well, the tables, you can store obviously a lot more different types of data, and it's normally stored in an external database, normally that you're linked with. Um, the the index of, of that as well is like you can move them around a little bit easier. There are little features, obviously, with databases that are a lot more powerful. Uh, what what I like about arrays, and I think there's another question earlier on that someone asked, like when you would use arrays. I think the the one aspect is especially when you want to control your access to external files and you want to avoid that read write all the time to a text file. If you can store it in an array and use it in the local memory while you're manipulating the data, that might be an, an, uh, an area where you would want to use arrays in that instance to avoid having to, for example, like a text file having to read write to a text file and avoid that type of 
type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, read, reading databases is what we would call an expensive um, activity in, in yeah. development. Um, and uh, long-term developers, when they talk about something being expensive, and I'm using those air quotes, and I hate myself immediately for it, but um, uh, expensive means that it takes a lot of time for the computer to process that particular um, functionality. So going down to the database, uh, even one that's a, a big relational database like MySQL or SQL Server, still takes time because there's a indexing and lots of reads and writes. And even with the yeah. great memory caching, it still takes longer. Whereas an in-memory array uh, is the speed of the, the memory and the CPU and the implementation of how yeah. it plays. So, That's especially important when it comes to your mobile development. You want to try to keep it as close to the actual application as possible and minimize the reading of other applications normally when you do mobile development. Yeah, and funny enough, I mean, mobile development, one of the um, the side effects of mobile development is that when I first started coding, and I started it in the late 70s, uh, and uh, it was a different world then, and really, you know, professionally in the eight, early 80s, and when we wrote programs at that point, every single bit of memory counted. You didn't have gigabytes of, of uh, yeah. data. I mean, I, one company I worked at, we had 250 employees, connecting to a unix box and the total memory for the entire unix box was 300 megabytes uh, and nowadays you know there are programs out there uh you know like uh, a spotify or something that's probably bigger than that on its own and yeah. uh, and so we always used to have to code bearing in mind how much memory we would use yeah. and uh, and and then of course windows came along and lots of computers had gigabytes of ram uh, uh, but once you went back to coding for mobile, then doing things like keeping arrays in memory became more important that you didn't just store huge amounts of of data types that use a lot of memory, like lots of arrays of strings, yeah. for example, things like that. So, um, you know, it, it, it is quicker, but you've also got to trade off how much memory a mobile device has. Some, some Android phones have got very little RAM at all. Uh, memory at all to uh, fiddle with so you know especially if you've got a very old phone i've got the latest yeah. one so you know. <laughs> uh, so what else uh, let's find another excellent question um gene uh, freeberg who actually asked a lot of questions does delphi uh, delphi contain any built-in functions for arrays for example using um for and do um to calculate an average how about a function ar average that calculates average uh, of an array yeah there are they, i think in the, the math library i think there are some array functions like i think you would use the mean one um so, so there are lots of little functions there that work with arrays i think they're quite there we go there we go those there's some nice little functions in there that work well with arrays and if you if you can't then you can always i saw there was a session earlier about subroutines i'm sure you can create your own subroutine that will do it as well um, that isn't a way around if it doesn't exist. But that's also the beauty of Delphi with all these library files that you've got access to that someone's already created the recipe for it and you can just use it. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep telling people over and over again, I am a lazy programmer. <laughs> I'm very productive because I use Delphi and it, it writes programs, you know, produce programs quickly, but um, I'm not one for working very hard if I can get away with it. And uh, and uh, why should I? You know, it's uh, time is money. And so, uh, you know, if there's a library out there that's done it already, it's probably done it better than I can make it up anyway because, you know, that's the way these things are. So, yeah, the answer is um, lots of arrays. How are we doing for time? Oh, we've got, we've got enough time yet. Um, I think you showed this um, already, but can we initialize the array using loops? Um, yeah. I had a very small array, so that was very easy to do it when you declare the array. Uh, but if you were going to give it initial values, maybe on the form activate or, or somewhere around there, then you then the, the easiest way is, I mentioned there, like a loop of 100 would take a while, unless you, for example, were going to do like a for loop, um, they could loop from the first element to the last element. And for example, if it's an array of integers, you could initialize it to zero for all the values. And that's the other beautiful thing. Like if you were doing like a, a, an array where each value is a particular sum that's going to sum the total of something, you would normally initialize each individual variable. But with an array, you just have two lines, a, a simple a loop, a for loop that goes through it and initialize each element, and then you sort it. You don't have to do each and every individual element. So those are part of the, the benefits of using arrays there. 
Yeah, and I, and I think the the example I gave in reply as well that is that you can use low and high, which are two um, yeah. um, keywords as well that can work out what the low and high of particular types of ar arrays yeah. um, and stuff like that can be as well. Um, you know, arrays are pretty fundamental to um, development, and and so yeah. as you would expect with something so key to development, there's an awful lot of stuff that. Um, helps you manipulate them and work with them and, and things like that. And there, there is actually, um, I think I just showed this a second ago, but um, there is a uh, a whole library. Um, if you go to .wiki, um, .embarkadero.com, which is, um, you should be able to see that. Uh, I'll just highlight it because it sometimes shows up a bit better. If you go to that uh, um, .wiki, embarkadero.com and then search for arrays you'll come along um, these things called structured types and there's an awful lot of information there it's kind of a summary of some of the things we've been um, talking about in terms of you know how you can store things in arrays um, it starts to get a little bit scary for beginners when we start talking about packed arrays and, and yeah. arrays of arrays and duplicate arrays but that's <laughs> I think your next video yeah your video is next isn't it and that's uh, multi-dimensional yeah. Right, so uh, we don't want to terrify the new people uh, <laughs> straight away. Um, here's my cursor. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that is probably um, most of the ones um, we already said about when we would use consider arrays. Um, uh, this particular user, I just thought you might like this. They're just saying all the instructions have been very patient and clear. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that's been very noticeable this year, in, and you are particularly one of them as well that I've noticed this, that the quality of the videos that you're making is absolutely top class. Uh, you, know, you know, I, I have produced a lot of videos for the kind of work I do, and the same with... Um, uh, Jim and people like that, and we're used to making videos day in day out to demonstrate certain things. But you guys, um, as educators, it is an absolute pleasure to see how well you impart information, how professionally you are are at doing it. So you know, a little uh, clap for someone who appreciates. I think uh, it's it's an uh, unfortunate it's a it's a good side effect, unfortunately, of the COVID pandemic. I think I think with the with COVID, a lot of teachers were forced to find alternative means to cope in the classroom and that and it was a combination of both finding another way to teach their students from home but also um teachers will always tell you that if they can have a, a set of time where they can create resources um COVID almost forced us to be able to do that and so that was wonderful for us to say okay i've got this time what can i do with this time because i'm in lockdown i can create these resources that i've got the time to learn and so it, cre it created the the opportunity so uh, COVID wasn't great, I think, for the world, but I think this is a, a, one of the, the the better side effects of of COVID that we can create uh, the content that we are. And there's so many te wonderful teachers now online. So the beauty is, even if you don't like a particular style of teacher, you'll find another teacher that'll have the uh, same content but in a different format that suits you. Yeah, and and you know what? Uh, it, it's true. It is the silver lining in the dark cloud. I mean, the whole COVID thing. You know, we don't need to mention how horrible it is for the entire world and lots and lots yeah. of people die in fact my my brother-in-law is an er doctor and uh, he has covid again even though he's multiply yeah. uh, vaccinated uh he keeps getting it and and um you know what can you say these things are it's annoying when someone says it's a, a, a hoax I, I can tell you it really isn't <laughs> um but uh but uh yeah i think uh if the benefit out of all that horror has been that uh, it's helped educators, um, you know, produce some resources and and encourage people to think of, you know, distance learning like this. Uh, yeah. I think that's a I think that's a good thing that's come out of it, even if yeah. everything else was horrible. Um, so anyway, it's good. Um, how are we doing? We've got a couple of minutes. Um, was there anything you kind of wanted to finish up on in terms of arrays or anything like that before you? Yeah. you appear in your next video which is yeah. um introduction to multi-dimensional right yeah so. the, there was something that i saw in the comments that talked about when you initialize the when you specify the dimensions of the array like how can, if you can use like for example variables you uh, you could use a constant I, i've tried i've used a constant before but i think if you're thinking about an array where you want to be you don't want to be too specific about how wide or what it is then i think you need to look more at the dynamic arrays there are dynamic arrays where you don't actually set the bounds and then when you are writing code you actually have a set i think it's a set length method if i can remember correctly where you right. first set how many values are in the array and then you can change that as you need it so if you are very if you are unsure about how many values in the array that you're going to want 
then you can do that. I know um, in a lot of examples, particularly in our school systems that we use, we we have, for example, a, a one to a thousand. Let's assume that you've got a thousand. Then we have a, a global variable called n, which records how many values are actually in the uh, array that you're actually storing, not the max value, but how many values are currently being stored. So there is a way that you can programmatically do that as well. Yeah. Well, uh, I think you answered that pretty comprehensively, and I added to. Um, well, uh, we're over to you again. Uh, thanks for your time. So far, but I think I, I'm not sure if it's me going to talk to you next in the live Q&A or Jim, but it'll be one of us anyway. But uh, your video is up next. So thanks a lot, uh, Brandon. And we'll talk to you, you again uh, shortly. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. No problem. Thank you. And we're over to introduction to multidimensional arrays again with Brandon. This is session core 11. In our previous session, we looked at single dimensional arrays. And so we're going to step it up a level and give you an introduction into multi-dimensional arrays. Hi, I am Brandon Long. I am an IT teacher. IT is a subject for programming and a computer applications technology teacher as well, which is computer literacy. And I can also do a bit of mathematics. I'm currently teaching in a high school in South Africa in a city called Abeja. Yes, you heard that correctly. And I've also taught in Auckland, New Zealand. I love programming and so I like to create programming videos and tutorials for my students and hopefully they can help other people as well. You can find me on YouTube if you search for Mr. Long RT and Cat. I'm an Ember Cardero MVP and I love superheroes. So much so that I've probably got over 50 superhero t-shirts. Some people might say it's an obsession. I just call it a passionate interest. So we are looking at multi-dimensional arrays. If you are using Kevin Bond's book, How to Program Effectively in Delphi for ASNA Level Computer Science, I highly recommend the book. It's a very good book. Go to chapter 14, and this is the chapter on arrays. In our previous session, we looked at the first few pages of this chapter. We're now going to move on to the next section of pages. 237 to 243 are the main concepts that we're going to be looking at. And we're going to be, first of all, recapping what a one-dimensional array is, or as we learned in the previous previous session a single dimensional array and then we will progress to what is a two dimensional array and then how do we use this two dimensional array and we're not going to just stop there because obviously this is multi dimensional array so we can't just look at two dimensional arrays we'll look at the other multi dimensional arrays that are available First of all, what is a one-dimensional array or a single-dimensional array compared to what we spoke about in the previous session? So if you remember correctly, we were doing an example where I was trying to run for the Olympics and I wanted to keep track of all the times that I ran for the 100 meters and I was doing this for my training. So I did 10 different runs and I want to keep track of all the different times and instead of storing those 10 values in 10 separate real values, I made an array, a single-dimensional array that can store 1 to 10 values and each one of those values are a real. This made it very easy for me to do calculations as I could just use the one data structure or the one array and do calculations on it to find each and every value in the array. So that was very useful. And if you remember correctly, that range at the top, that was the index that tells me the position of each value in the array. So this was an array of real values or real numbers, and it starts from 1 until 10. That was really useful for our 10 runs that we did in the previous lesson. I wanted to sprint 10 times and record their times. But what happens... If I want to go to the Olympics, I obviously want to run multiple times. 10 runs is not going to be a lot. And let's pretend these were the 10 runs that I did in the first week. And I will probably have to train for more than one week if I'm going to go to the Olympics. So I'm going to have to train for another week. So I've got a whole set of 10 other numbers which I recorded for the second week of my training. But again, two weeks is not a lot of training. So I'm going to have to train for maybe a third week and I have to tr keep track of those numbers. And there'll probably be a fourth week and a fifth week and so on. And I want to keep track of all those values. Now I could put them all in one array and then just extend the range instead of going from 1 to 10 to 1 to a really big number. But then I can't determine or keep track. It's going to be very difficult for me to work out what were my times in the first week and the second week. And it's difficult for me to do calculations based on a weekly average or what was my best time for each week. So I would like to keep them in separate variables. So I would maybe do something like this where I declare the first array is an array time week one and then the second one was array time week two and array time week three and so on and so on and so on. But now we are getting to the exact same problem that we had in the 
previous session. In the previous session, we wanted to store multiple reels and we would have multiple variables and that would become quite cumbersome to be able to do calculations on. And now we've got the exact same thing. The only difference is instead of having multiple reels, we've got multiple arrays of reels. So that's making my life quite a bit more difficult. But what happens if we could join them all together? For example, if you look, all of those arrays all have 10 values in. So they all have the same dimensions. They all go from 1 to 10. So what happens if I put them in some sort of table like this, where each row represents a week and each column represents a run or the first run or the second run or the third run for that week? So let's just change those weeks once to actual points of reference. So we can say each row. So the first row is going to represent the first week and each column will represent the number of the time that I ran for that particular week. For example, number three would be the third run of that particular week. So that's how we would probably like to use it. Now it's all in one big data structure and each row represents the different weeks and each column represents the different times for that particular week. So now I don't need all those variables at the top. Now I can just put that in one data structure. We'll make it in one super array. So let's take all those variables away. We'll take them away. We don't need them. And now I've got one super array. It's still called array times and it still contains real values. But instead of going from one to 10, we now have a one to five comma in front of the one to 10, which means there are five rows in this array. And in those five rows, each row in this array is represented by one to 10 values. And each of those values are reals. So that's how we would declare an array that has two dimensions, or as we would say, a two dimensional array. So you can see how we declare it is exactly the same way, except for we now have an extra set of lower and upper bounds separated by two dots and then a comma in front. So the first set of numbers represent the rows and then the second set of numbers will represent the columns if you think about it visually. Before we get into practicing this two-dimensional array, I just want to tell you about a component. I'm not too sure if you are aware of it, but there's a component called a T-string grid. And the reason why I just want to talk about it is because I'm going to use this to visually display the array so that we can see what it looks like if we use a VCL forms application. So just to cover a T-string grid is basically a bunch of cells or like a table and each block contains a string value or have a string value in it. So it's basically like a table of edit boxes. So the concept that you need to be aware of, you'll notice that, I don't know if you can see very clearly, but that first row is slightly shaded and that's normally the heading row and that is called the fixed row and at the moment its value is set to one. You could set it to zero and then that shaded part will be removed and so there won't be a, a heading row for example, but if you want a heading row you would have fixed rows and then on the side there you will see that that's also slightly darker and that is the fixed column which is set to one. Again, if you don't want a fixed column or fixed row, you can set those values to zero and then they will be gone. Now, if you want to put a value inside a string grid or in one of the blocks in the string grid, we use the cells property followed by square brackets. And then in the square brackets, we give it a number where the first number represents the column followed by a comma. And then the next value represents the row. Slightly different to the actual 2D arrays where we had rows and then columns. This one is first columns and then rows. The way I always remember with string grids is that string grids are alphabetically in order. So they have its columns first, which is C, followed by row, which is second, which is next in the alphabet. C is less than R in this case. So let's take that blue block there that's highlighted over there. If I wanted to put a value in there, I would put it in its cells property, but what numbers would we give it? Well, in this case, the numbers are one comma one. And we call back to all the other components that you might have used. You might have used a radio groups item index or something like that, or maybe even a list box item index. You'll remember that most of the components in Delphi start with a zero. So the first block, the very top one there at the top, that would be the first row and the first column. So the first column is zero and the first row is zero. So that's why it is zero comma zero. And so therefore our block that is selected, that one in blue, you'll see that it's the second column. So column zero, then one. So that's why it's a one. And it's the second row, row zero, and then row one. And there we have cells one comma one. Let's just practice and let's see if you can work out what that cell is going to be. Have a look, give yourself some time. See if you can work out what the cells or the numbers will be in the cells for that particular block. Give you a couple of seconds to try working out. 
Okay, so let's talk about it. Let's see. So that we want to look at the columns first. So the columns, you'll see there's one, two, three, four columns in total. That is the fourth column. But remember, they start at zero. So it's actually zero, one, two, three. So that column value will first be a three comma followed by the number of rows. The rows, this is one, two, three, four, five, five rows. But remember, the first row starts at zero. So it's zero, one, two, three, four. So that would be the fourth row. So that block, if you guess correctly, or if you worked out correctly, it is cells three, because it's the third column, if we start from zero to three, and it's the fourth row from zero to four. That's how you reference that particular block or cell in the string grid. Now that we know that, we can go and try a couple of examples in Delphi. So here we've got a program that I'm going to work from. I used a VCL forms. If you come over here to VCL Windows, VCL application. Some people use the console application and then it's just using right lines and so on. I'm just going to use this one because I like to visually see all my components and like to see how it's going to work. So that's just my preference. So let's go straight to the code and let's start declaring some 2D arrays. I'm going to scroll down a bit over here to here where we're going to declare it. Now I'm just going to start with a very simple array. Let's call it array code. And I want to display a table of three rows and two columns of codes of strings. So I'm going to make this colon and this is an array followed by how many rows we wanted one to three rows followed by a comma followed by how many columns in each of those rows. So it'll be one to two. So something along those lines. And then I can close the square brackets and then I'm going to put an of followed by what data type I want to store in each one of the cells or blocks in that table. In this case, because they're codes, I'm going to make them of type string and then semicolon. So the only thing that's different compared to our previous session when we did single dimensional arrays was we've added an extra upper and lower bound followed by a comma. So remember that indicates the rows and that indicates the columns if you are thinking about this table visually. So that's what we've got. Now, if you remember in the previous lesson as well, we learned how to initialize an array. In other words, give it default values. And what we did in the previous, we would say equals, open bracket, close bracket, and then we would just give it, for example, the 10 values, if you remember, something along, followed by commas. So it looked something along those type of lines, and we had to fill all the different values. So I've got a two-dimensional array so that we have to initialize it slightly differently. So what you need to do is you actually need to, and this is the way I think about it, you need to do each individual row. So each row has two values. So I'm going to give it some values. Let's say I give it ABC is the first one and the second one is going to be MNO. So there we go. So that is the first row in my string grid. Okay. And then, as you see, I put that row in its own separate brackets. I'm going to do the exact same thing now and do another row. Let's say this is going to be JKL and we're going to say comma. This is going to be XYZ. As you can see, they're all strings. So that's why I'm putting them in brackets or in quotes, sorry. So that would be the second row. And there's a third row, which I'm also going to put in brackets. And let's say this one's going to be DEF and it's going to be rst as the second value in the third row so there you can see i've created three rows with two values each and i've put them each in their own brackets and then what you do is you put that entire set of rows inside their own brackets followed by a comma to separate them so there's a comma so then we go to that one which is a comma which is then and then this is the end of it so that's how you can initialize the value. So if I put them next to each other, just so that you can see what it looks like, it would look something along these lines. I want to put them next to each other. So there we go. And then at the end here, we will add the other value and let it come. There we go. So if you were going to initialize a 2D array, you got to initialize each individual row in its own brackets and then separate those rows by commas and the entire set of all those rows must be in their own set of brackets so something along those lines and then we put a semicolon at the end and there we go so we go home so that's how you will initialize a 2d array so what i've done is i've done another array i've declared another one which we can use for the times which is an array of five rows and each row has three times so there were three times obtained over every five weeks and i've already initialized it i've made it a bit smaller just to make my life a bit easier when we do calculations but there we go you can see that i've also initialized it with a row of three values followed by a comma 
followed by another row of three values. So let's go to the programming part where we can actually write code and display the array just so that we can see what it looks like. So if I come here to the program, you'll see I've got a string grid, if you remember correctly, a little string grid. If you come over here, you'll find the string grid. If you search for it, string grid, there it's on the additional palette. So you can get a string grid and you can set the properties. So there's, I don't want a new one, but this is the one. And you can see that I've got a bunch of fixed rows if you see fixed columns and fixed rows i've already got them there and if i scroll down you can see there's a whole bunch of other properties over there that we can use and you can see that the name of the string grid is sgd data i'm actually going to set the fixed rows and columns to zero i don't want any heading so i'm just set them all to zero so it's just a normal block of cells there's no headings or no side headings or column headings so let's display the codes. So I'm going to show you how we're going to do that. Let's click on this. So what we want to do is we want to put those values from the array, if we think about it, in the string grid. So this SGD data is what we want to change. And we want to change the cells property. And there you can see when I said cells, I don't know if you noticed that, when I said cells, let's go dot cells. You can see there it's the column and then the row value. So we want some sort of column value and then the row value like that. So I'm going to change those words now. And that's going to be equal to a value that we're going to get from the array, which is going to be array codes. And if you remember correctly, the codes has first the row, then the column value, if you remember correctly. Now this is an array of strings and this is a string grid. So that fits quite nicely. So if we think about the first value in our array codes, it's all, it'll be a one and a one, if you remember correctly. So that's a one and a one. So here we are. So there we are. So this is going to be a one, and then that's going to be a one over there. Okay, so one, one. But what's the first value in my string grid? If you remember correctly, the first value in the string grid is a zero and then a zero. Actually, what I'm going to actually do to make it fit nicely, I'm actually going to just set the string grid its values, its row count and its column count. So string grid data dot col count. This is the, the how many columns it is allowed. So the col count, we've got how many columns? We've got two columns, if you remember correctly, and we've got three rows, if you remember correctly row count that must equal to three so i'm just setting that so that it just makes the number of blocks that we need for our table and we said that that first block over there is zero zero if you remember correctly so that's going to be zero zero so that's going to be the first one and then that's going to display the first value okay and then for the second value if we think about it control copy I'm going to just paste it. So now in this block over here, that is the, which first look at the column, it is column one because it's zero one, but it's still row zero. So in column zero or column one, but row zero, we are now putting in the second value in my array, which is that one, which is going to be what it's not going to, it's going to be the still the first row but it's the second value so it's going to be one and a two so we're going to scroll down yeah it's going to be one and a two so let's just test it to see what that looks like so there we go it's running so let's display the codes and there we go you see how it's displaying them it's made that made the the blocks only three rows and two columns but there you can see the first two are correctly displayed and so i can keep going like this but this is quite complicated if you're working it out if you think about it so if i had to do the next one it would look something along the lines of this so it would then be it would then be this would be the second row because remember the row is first in the array and the row is the second value in the cells of the string grid. But instead of row zero, we are zero, row one. So that would be a one and that would be a one. So let's run that and see what it looks like. So there we go. We're getting that display, but this is actually quite complicated. Imagine if I had a massive table that wanted to display. You can't just do this, but we can see that there is some sort of pattern that's occurring. You'll notice that the values over there are always similar the only difference is obviously it's first the column and then the row and so it's the inverse of these so then the here it's the row and then the column but you'll notice that they are out by one so here we've got a one and a zero and a one and a zero 
so they're out by one but here when we go one and we compare it to that that's out by one when we move to two that is also out by one so there's just a difference of one between them so what i can do here is i can have a for loop and what i do to make my life easier is i declare my looping variables as r row and r call and it will make it a lot easier for me to understand which one am i using let's make that proper row and so i'm going to loop first by my row and so how many rows do we want we want three rows so i'm going to make this from one to three because there are three rows and then i'm going to have a for loop that goes for through the different columns and there are two columns so it's going from one to two one to two there we go and we are going to display the string grid something like this so just one of them we don't need all of these but let's just think about this so we know that the first row is one and the second the first column is one so we want this to be the row and the column value but great codes it's first the row value our row and the next value is the r call now for the string grids it's the opposite way around this is the column and this is the row but you'll notice it's not a one it's a zero so it's whatever that value is minus one so we actually for the column over here so the column is first we're going to say r call minus one and then we're going to say r row minus one just to make it fit if you wanted to you could have gone from zero to two and zero to one and then you would have just done the plus ones on that side but that would also work oh no, cancel we're not going to do that we want to delete all this code first because we don't need that so now we just got three lines and it'll display hopefully the entire string grid i'm still running the program so close that quickly so let's run it properly this time so now when i display the codes you see those three lines and it displayed everything so if it was a much bigger table the only difference is i'm resetting those values to bigger numbers but that's how easy it is now remember this is a string grid so we're displaying strings quite easily if it was a values let's say these array times which is what i'm going to do now on this button so let's display the times it's exactly the same idea so we're going to do the exact same thing i'm literally going to copy this code and we're going to come to the display times and we're also going to use it so we also need our our row variable in our, our call of type integer but it's slightly different because we know from if we go right to the top we've got five rows and three columns five rows and three columns so yeah we're going to set the row count to five and the call count to three so i keep spelling that wrong there we go okay so now we're going to go from one how many rows to five and we're going to go from one to three for the columns and then everything else is the same except for we displaying from array times this time so this is going to be array times but we know that array times is what it is a if you remember the top there let's go right to the top array times sorry not array times array time is an array of real so therefore this array time is this each of these blocks are real so we just convert them from a float which i'm going to put like this i'm going to put it on a new line from a float to a string so that we can convert it into a string so that it can fit into that block so there we go so this is actually over there just so that you can see it so let's try that button and we can see the values in my array so we did the codes but if i display the times there you can see the five rows of times and the three columns of times there as well so now that we've got the display working let's go and try change values in the array so let's go and change the time now in the previous example you remember we had a time and we said what position in the array that we want to change but now it's slightly different it's not just the position but which week are we referring to is it week four or week three we need to know that as well so i'm going to change the time of the value in the array so let's click on that and i've already done the inputs we've got our new time from the edit box We've got the position in that particular, in the position variable, our position, and then we get which week we are referring to. Now, everything's exactly the same. Now, if you remember, we have five weeks and there's three positions. So we've got five weeks and three positions. So we want to put in week four. So we're going to say array time, and then you say square brackets. And now, instead of just what we would normally have done in the previous one, we said our position is equal to our new time that's what we did in the previous session that's how we allocated to a single dimensional array but now we've got which week which in this case says we are want to put it in this week at that position so let's try that out let's run it
So in this case, if we just display the times, so this is week one, two, three, four. So we want to change the fourth week's time at the third position. It's 13.05. We want to change it to 12.05. So keep an eye on that one. So we're going to click change the time. Okay. The new value has been added. And now let's redisplay the times. Did you notice how that one changed now to 12.05? Because it's changed the fourth week, which was the fourth row, and the third value in that fourth row was changed to 12.05. The next bit we're going to try to do is let's do some calculations on the values in the array. So let's try the best time. So we want to find out the best time in the array. And if you remember, the best time is normally the smallest time because we want to make it as fast as possible. So it must be the smallest number as possible. So let's go try that. We're going to click on here and do the best time. And I've already declared a best variable and a row and a column for us. So let's think about this. When we did this previously, we would loop from one to however many values are in each row. There are three values in each row, so that's the columns. So I would go through each column and go, okay, we're going to start from one until three. And we would have a, we would check each value. If the array value, array time at position I call, in our previous example, we just had an I variable. If that is smaller than my best variable, then obviously we have a new winner when it comes to the best time. It's a smaller value. If that was the case, then we reset the best time to whatever the R time value is at I call. That's what we did in the last video if you're on single dimensional arrays. But now we don't just have a column, but we've also got a row. So we don't want to just loop through each one, two, three for the top row. We want to then go to row number two and do one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So I actually need another loop, which I'm going to go for our row. And that one is going to go from one, two, five. And then we're going to loop from one, two, three. And so we want to get our row. So row one, column one, is that better than the best value? If that's true, then record this new row and column as the best value. But the very first time that it does this, our best needs to have a starting value so that when it compares that it at least does, it, it beats it. So what I always do is I re or initialize our best to the opposite of what I want, which in this case, we want to find a small number. So I'm going to initialize it to a very, very big number because then I know that the first value in the array will definitely beat it. And so that new value in the array will become the new best. And after that, it will try to find the next best. We loop through the, the rows, we loop through the columns. It actually doesn't make a difference whether these are in different orders. It doesn't make a difference as long as the values are going to the correct outer bound and inner bound. So from one to five, I can't have columns go from one to five and use that same value there. That must go from one to three and that must go from one to five. But it doesn't matter if I first loop through the columns or first loop through the rows. In this case, our next example, it will make a difference. But yeah, I'm just going to use a show message after the looping's all been done and say the best time is, and then we're going to display our best. Now our best is a real, so we must convert this from a float to a string so that we can see it in the show message. So there we go, page down, sorry, there we go, so there we go. So we're going to show the best time. All of this, this happens only once the looping has all been completed. So let's run it and see what it does. So I'm first going to display the time so we can see. So let's see. Do you notice which is the best time? It looks like that 11.97 seems to be the best time. So I want to say, what's the best time? Boom. Ah, 11.97. If I so happen to change, let's say I change this 13. Let's say I change that to an 11.05. And then I display. Do You see, that's now the new best time. If I click on this best time now, it picks up the new best time. So we know that it is definitely working. So that's how you loop through an array, a 2D array. You loop through the columns and the rows, all the rows and the columns, or whatever order you want to, and you can do calculations. As long as your array is referencing both values correctly, then it should be all fine. 
Now, when we did the best time, it didn't really matter if we looped the rows or the columns in first or second. It didn't really make a difference. But in this case, it's going to make a difference. So we want to work out the weekly average. So let's think about what we want. So we said, I'm just going to display it so I can visually see it. So if you display the times, this is one week. This is week two, week three. I want to work out the weekly average for each week. I'm going to use this rich edit over here to display week one's average, week two's average, and so on. So I'm looking at each individual row okay and each row has three values that we want to average so whenever you're doing something row by row or column by column the order that you do the looping is very important and what i try to do whenever i'm doing this is try to look at one row or one column at a time so in this case we want to do each row we want to find the average of each row so i'm going to look at just row one just look at row one just look at those values there are three values in row one. So that's all I'm going to do is just get row one working. So let's click on weekly average. I'm going to work out the weekly average. We need to add all those values together. So I'm going to need a sum variable. I'm going to call it R sum. And to work out the average, we'll take the sum and divide it by three because there are three values in each week. So I'll make an average. And those are going to be reals because our values in our array are reals. Again, I said just the first week, just the first week. So we're going to loop for the first week, which is going to be the different columns. So I'm going to make it R col, which is going to loop from one until three, one until three. And we are going to add all the values in that row. So we can have an R sum variable is equal to not R sum. It's an R sum because it's reals equals to R sum plus the value in the array time. But at what? We're doing only row one. So we're only doing row one. So that's always going to be a one. But the value, the second value will be a one and then a two and then a three, which is our R call variable. So that's how we add all the values. But the very first time when, it's, when R calls a one and it's got value one, one, it's going to add it onto R sum. But what is R sum starting with? We don't know. That's why we must initialize R sum to a starting value of zero. So we initialize in the value. So that will total all the values in the first row of the array. Now, once I've done that correctly, once I've added all those values correctly, I can then work out the average. And what's the average going to be? It's going to be whatever the sum is divided by three, because there are three values in each week. So there we go. So that once that loop's done, it'll go there. And then we want to display in the rich edit so let's go rich display dot lines dot add and we're going to display the words week one let's put a colon there and then we're going to add the average over there but i want to display that average which is a real number and this is whole thing must be a string so let's convert this from a float to a string and then we get our average correctly there boom there we go so there we go i think that's going to be okay so let's test that out so let's run it and we're going to just display this display the times and let's see them and let's work out the weekly average it should just do the first week so let's go there and there is a weekly average so let's first of all work out if that's correct so let's test to see if those numbers are correct so 13.26 let's add it to 13.01 and we're going to add 12.56, 12.56. So that should be our sum. And we will divide that by three and we get a value of 12.943. There we go. That is correct. And just to make my life a little bit nicer, I'm actually going to make it float to string F and display it to two decimal places. So FF fixed, comma, it's eight in the front and it's two at the back. So let's display it to eight decimal places. There we go. And then I'll actually just rich display dot clear at the top there so so there we go so it's all working it's doing the first row very nicely so let's let's think about how we're going to do this for all of the weeks for all of the rows so display the time so we know that it's working oh, we're not changing the value sorry we're going to do that so there we go so we know that that's working so now i want to do all of that again but now for row two and then for row three and row four so i'm just doing the same thing five more times so what i can do now now that i've got that row perfect the first row is perfect i can now around all of this code add a loop which will do each and every individual row now we know it's going to do it five times because there are five rows and i'm going to do everything begin 
and all of this code right until the display is going to be done. So this is the end of the R row loop. Okay, so all of this code over here is being done five times. We initialize R sum and then we loop from one to three. The only difference is I don't want to always put it in, or just, I don't want to always add up the first row. I want to add up the first row, then the second row, and then th do I have something that's going one, two, three, four, five? Yes, that's R row. So that's going to become R row. And then when I display the answers, I'm also going to be displaying week one, week two, week three. And I don't want to say week one, week one, week one. So that must change to one, two, three. Ah, oh, what must that be? That's going to also be a R row variable that I'm going to put on either side. But because of that, I need to convert it from an integer to a string. So let's put brackets around it. And um, just for convenience sake, I'm just going to put this on a new line so we can see what it looks like all together. So there we go. So I'll loop from 1 to 5, and I'm going to be initializing to 0 and looping from 1 to 3, adding just those values, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, divide them by 3, and then display it. Then it'll go, our row is a 2, and we'll then do 2, 1, 2, two, two, three, and sum them, and so on and so on. So let's see if that works for each of them. So we display the time so we can see them. There we go. So let's do the weekly average. There we go. So we've got one to five, and we can see that those values are changing. Our best week, according to this, is the third week. And if you look at the third week, those numbers are low. Even our best time is in our third week. So we can see that that is giving the correct result. So that's how it does the weeks. If I wanted to do the other way around, if I wanted to find out which was my best run, is it the first run of the week or the second run of the week or the third run, then I would swap these two around. Or I'd first need to loop for all the columns from one to three, and then the row needs to go from one to five, and then it would go each one. So whichever one you are looping, if you are doing each and every, if you're finding statistics based on each row, then that would be the thing that you loop on first. And then inside it, you would do each individual column. If I was wanting to find the best of each column, I would then loop by the column first and then by the row. And it's very important that you initialize our sum inside the loop over here. You don't want to do it over there because if you do it over there and when it gets to row two, it's going to still be the sum of the previous row, and so it's going to distort the numbers. You'll see over here, if I just moved it over there, just moving it slightly outside the loop, if we go and display the times, if we go and say the weekly average, you see those times are very wrong. It's because when it moves to row two, it starts adding that onto the sum of the previous week, which is not what we want to do. We've got a brand new week, so we're going to initialize it inside the loop. Now let's talk further about multi-dimensional arrays. Now we have talked about an array, a two-dimensional array where we record five weeks and in those five weeks we have one to ten times for every week. Now that's great. Now let's pretend that is actually, that whole table represents the first month. And again, if I want to go to the Olympics, I'm going to have to do this every month. And if I want to do statistics on each month and which is my best month, then I would like to keep this array separate. And then I would then to Keep it like this. So let's have it look like that. So that's the first month, which is a table from one to five weeks and stores one to 10 values for each week. And then in the second month, I have another table, which is exactly the same. I run for five weeks and I go from one to 10. The last week, obviously, whichever week's the shortest, I still fit them in, but those are my times. And then for the third month, I do the same. And then for the fourth month, I do the same and so on and so on. Are you starting to see that this is, that these tables together are forming almost like a cube, like a block? So instead of declaring four different arrays or two, four different 2D arrays, then I can put this all in one block and this block will then become a 3D array. So there you can see there's a third dimension that's been added to this array. Array times is an array from one to four because there are four months and there, in each one of those months is a table of, of five by 10 real numbers. So there we go. So that's how you can declare what we call a three-dimensional or 3D array. 
Luckily, in Delphi, you do not need 3D glasses in order to view 3D arrays. You can just declare them normally, but that's how you would declare a 3D array. So how do we use a 3D array? Well, if you wanted to allocate a value in the 3D array, you've just got a third dimension. So we've just added the, the different month in the front there. So it's the third month in the first week. In the first run, we got 12.12. .12. So that's all that's different when it comes to allocating values. Or if you want to receive the value, you would do that as well. And if we were doing calculations based with loops, so we would loop normally through the different rows, or in this case would be the different weeks, and then the columns would be the different times we ran that week. If we had something like that, we would just have those two dimensions. But now we've almost got the different months, or what I would maybe call the different levels of the the cube almost. So we've got four levels. So we go from one to four, and then we add that dimension to the array when we are adding them up. So when it's level one or month one, basically, we go to the first week and the first run, and then we take that value and add it. And then the column will then go to the second run of the first week of the first month and add it and so on. And once it's completed all those rows, it would move to the next, all those columns, it would then move to the next row. And once it's done all the rows of that level, it would then move to the next level or next month. It's very nice when your multi-dimensional arrays have bounds which have different values, like that one to four and that one to five and one to 10. It's very nice when they are different because then it's easy to keep track of which one's the one going to four and which one's the one going to five, makes it a little bit easier. But when they all go into the same value, let's say this was an array from 1 to 10, comma 1 to 10, comma 1 to 10, then you really have to keep your head and your wits about you when you are using the correct values in the correct positions when referring to the array. So that is a three-dimensional array. But we don't have to stop there. You know, we could even go to maybe a fourth-dimensional array or a fifth-dimensional array or an nth dimensional array. I'm not too sure. I think the correct number that, or the max number that can go into is I think a 32 dimensional array. So you can do that. And as you add dimensions, you are simply just adding more lower and upper bounds to that block of square brackets there for your arrays. But I wouldn't recommend going to the fourth and the fifth and the nth dimension. The reason why it's quite, it can be quite very stressful, it can be very difficult to manage for two particular reasons. The first reason is when you are dealing with data structures like arrays, particularly multi-dimensional arrays, they take up a lot of memory and a lot of space. So you want to minimize the use of them where possible because it can use up a lot of memory. And secondly, especially when you get beyond the third dimension, it is very difficult for humans to visualize or to comprehend what that actual structure or that data looks like. Uh, it's very easy for us to go to two dimensions or three dimensions because we live in a three-dimensional world. But once we get to the fourth dimension and fifth dimension and so on, it becomes very difficult to visualize. And then it becomes difficult to actually grasp how you are doing your calculations. So you can go see if you can try out some 3D and 4D and 5D arrays if you really want to test yourself. In summary, what have we covered in this lesson? Well, first of all, we had a little recap on single dimensional arrays. And then we took those single dimensional arrays and combined them into what we call a two dimensional array, which looks something like a table. And then we also just looked at the string grid just to help us to visually see them when we use them in a VCL Windows application. And then we declared and used that two-dimensional array. And then we just dabbled a little bit in what is a three-dimensional array. And don't forget, we also talked about the nth dimension and how it's difficult to visualize them. But you do get them in Delphi if you want to use them. And so that is our lesson on multi-dimensional arrays. If you want more practice, I really recommend you get Kevin Bond's book, is How to Program Effectively in Delphi for AS and A-Level Computer Science. Look at chapter 14. There are lots of examples that he uses in that book on pages 237 to 243. I really recommend that you go look at it. Another resource that you can use is you can go to my YouTube channel at Mr. Long RT and Cat. Just search for it on YouTube. You'll see the, the blue and the yellow L. And if you also go to tinyurl.com slash Mr. Long 2D arrays. I've got some resources and notes and some examples that you can practice on 2D arrays if you want to give it a go. So you can download those resources from there or go to my YouTube channel or go look at Kevin Bond's book. 
Thank you for spending this time going through 2D and 3D and multiple dimensional arrays with me in this session. I hope you've enjoyed it. We will now go to the Discord server. We will have a discussion if you've got any questions. And if you aren't coming to the Discord server, and just remember the way I always end my lessons are, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long Way. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. Don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long Way. I like that. Oh, what, what can I say? If we enter the third and fourth and fifth dimensions. That's incredible. Uh, really great video. I really enjoyed it. And that was um, Brandon Long. And uh, the good news is Brandon is joining us now live uh, for a live Q&A. Hello, Brandon. Hello, how's well, everyone? Yeah, we're, anybody that's watched the video before is going to go, well, hey, didn't they say hello before? Yes, we did. <laughs> doing it again. Yeah, not everybody uh, will see these uh, videos live, and some of them will see them out sequence sometimes as well, and things like that. So uh, we're not crazy. We just, we just, uh, um, yeah, we're just doing what we can to uh, keep uh, keep track of things. Right. So um, I've uh, tagged some questions. Some of them are not about arrays and a couple of people sort of say oh you know can't you do this and use a list and things like that uh, i totally get that but one uh that i did want to um show was uh from dr kevin bond himself uh just wanted to say uh congratulations on the video which is his uh this message was actually a response to when i said earlier on you know what a great set of videos um you've been doing yourself and also some of the other uh, presenters as well have done a really really good job and apparently mm. dr kevin bond who is uh you know it's his book that we're basing a lot of this on is is uh also appreciative as well so uh just thought you'd like to know that brandon well, thank you uh, well, yeah. this book's very good, so I highly recommend people access that book because there's lots of really great examples and explanations of that. And I think it's like a, quite a good fundamental of every, like of everything. If you want to learn Delphi, that's probably the the book that encompasses everything from the beginning to the end. So, really good book. Yeah, and it, and in fact, actually, that probably brings me on to um, uh, I've got I've had this URL up here for ages, but I'm going to post it in the the chat. Um, I think I can do that. Hang on, um, I can probably open it as an overlay, but I never, I never actually get that bit right. Um, but if I do that, um, we can show it on there. Talking about books uh, to do with Delphi books, if you go to this site, um, delphi-books.com, um, that's actually run by a Embarcadel MVP, and uh, it's a very, very good site. It's got all the books you could ever want uh, to do with Delphi, um, going back to the year dot. There's even some in there. I think Steve Tashira's book might be in there. Steve Tashira is now, believe it or not, the chief of product for um, Mozilla Foundation. But he was an MVP for a long time. I think he was on Team B as well. He was also previously the um, the product manager for Twitter and a few others as well. So, you know, these Delphi people, they get around. They, 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 they don't disappear. They just mellow out and do other things. Um, so that's it. Okay, so if we go to the questions that we do have, um, yeah, um, maybe this question. It's a bit of a long one. I'm not sure whether it will fit in. Um, if Brandon covers an array of variant later, um, I might have <laughs> questions <laughs> and yeah. uh and i laughed as well uh, because it's kind of a little bit um more than we're doing at the moment uh, but he said he had some components that dislike c plus plus builder because of those these arrays uh, i don't know whether you want to comment on that at all brandon no, oh, it's a very flexible option using variants they are very flexible i think you got the the var array create option there are lots of little nuances to using variants and stuff like that so it does create um as I said, the flexibility when you're not sure what type of data you are using, but where possible, if you are aware of the type of data, then you want to maybe just conceptualize it more to the types that you are using. But in the cases where you don't, then the variant is obviously going to be used there. Yeah, and I, and I think some of the people who are asking some of the questions here are probably clearly experienced programmers because mm. um, when they're talking about arrays of variants, that's not really the kind of stuff you do in a beginner's course. Um, yeah. You know, you start to uh, move on from what what a variant is for those that aren't aware of it. Instead of having integer or float and uh, things like that, a variant can be a, a variable that can hold any type uh, and has no real type of its own apart from the type of variant. And and so actually, how you deal with variants and arrays of variants is a is a very different process. So. Um, that question well, still is a more of the the object type of style more than the the variable type of style yeah yeah exactly i think that's probably an accurate um analogy that it, it is 
not really a, a fixed um, type like an integer, but it's actually it, it's a pointer almost. You know, it's a, mm, a holder yeah. for something, and that something could be anything. And it could be. I, I mean, some languages like I think Visual Basic and things like that use variants quite a lot. Um, yeah. When they were trying to call, um, you know, APIs and stuff, because they had no no uh, internal structures that would work. Um, so that was that. Um, someone said that uh, they read in the docs that there is a predefined array called T list. When yeah. uh, might one want to use a normal array, and when a T list? Is there some rule? Hmm. Well, I don't know. Well, uh, let me let me put it this way, okay? Um, why don't we um, pull up my screen, okay, uh, and do this, okay? So a T a T list is um, part again of what is known as a generic, and um, it is indexed uh, like an array in that you can go to um, some type of variable and look for the nth element in the the list but it is not really um an array as such it's it's um a generic collection and collections which you can see on the screen there are um they behave like arrays in some ways because they have what's known as a numerator so you can count them from zero one two three four five six but actually um you know in terms of how they behave, they're not really arrays. They're something quite different. When would you use them? Um, again, it, if you're asking that question, then you haven't got to the point where you need to use them, I think is the yeah. answer. Um, a T list is really used for things like um, keeping arrays of objects and, and stuff like that. And th there's a whole kind of ownership structure behind them that you don't have with an array. Um, you did touch on um, dynamic arrays, if I remember correctly, where yeah. you were resizing the arrays. And, and that's kind of like the behavior of a, of a T list. You can uh, own um, objects in there. So it's really just, you know, beyond that. So the answer is mostly arrays are for things that you know on, yeah. you know, um, basic values like integers and strings. Uh, whereas a list is used for slightly more complicated things like classes and objects and things like that. Yeah. So that's probably the difference. Yeah. Um, someone said uh, there is a 64K data structure limit. Um, I don't think that's oh, true anymore. I, I, think think, Keith, I think Keith was referring back to the day when there was a 64K data structure limit. Oh, okay, that, yeah, yeah. And that's not, I think you were talking about the, the, the management of memory, and it was like, yeah, we, you know, we in the days where you had to make I sure see. that you, you went over a certain yeah. I mean, if they're using Delphi 7, um, or, or I really hope they're not, but if they're using Delphi 4 or 3 or 2 or something like that, um, then, yes, you've probably hit some horrible limit at some point because things have moved on a lot in those years. There, there are a weird number of people that use Delphi 7. Uh, and I know that I, as a contractor, because I go and work for people, um, I come across projects that are Delphi 7 all the time. And the first thing I'm being asked usually is to upgrade them from Delphi 7. And all sorts of things don't exist in that language. If you're looking at using Delphi now, there are a whole raft of new features that make life so much easier. And uh, and certainly 64K data structure limits, which I accept is probably what he was talking about. Um, yeah, There's that, nothing that, more of it. They're frustrating, like if you're trying to debug a program and you go through the code and you know it's not a syntax error, it's not a logical error, and it ends up being just because of the, the structure of the programming language and the limitations, that's probably one yeah. of the worst ones because you can't yeah, see I mean, it directly. String, string list used to have like 64K, I think, of, of, uh, mm. of uh, uh, you could have 64,000 strings. And, of course, people who weren't really thinking about it would load everything into a, a string list and then one you know it's some file because you could say open you know read file and they would read it and in fact um, um georgina's um uh a uh, little uh video earlier on when she was talking about working with lists she did exactly that and i thought oh, okay <laughs> yeah yeah that someone will think oh well you can just open any file and it'll work fine now there is i think it's up to two gigabytes now or something like that for a, a t list uh, a, a string list but um, so, yes. And uh, Jose says hello from Mexico. Hola, Jose. I'm in uh, Dallas in Texas. So, uh, you know, we're 
kind of south of the border um, almost. I think geographically we're actually uh, further south than some parts of Mexico, so it's a bit weird. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people uh, around. Um, I think those were the specific questions that we had, um, apart from Mario, who said he's from uh, – uh, where did he say it's from? I think it's on here. Uh, Shwani, is that how you would pronounce that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's involved in tutoring le learn as well. And it actually, in fact, a lot of the people that have been commenting have been people that are instructors and educators. So it's nice to see them following along as well. And they've been around for a good few videos. I haven't just dipped in and, and gone from there. Um, okay, so we've got um, quite a bit of time. Is there anything you felt that you didn't really cover in the video or you wish you'd covered in more depth or any gotchas that you feel like might you know, spring to mind? There are other aspects with regard to arrays. You could, for example, do an array of a component, for example. Um, so that could also make it very powerful to reference a whole bunch of components that are together. So you could do something like that. Uh, the only tricky part would be to allocate the component to the different positions in the array. So you could have an array of like T edits or for example. Um, but if you were doing it dynamically, then it makes it a lot easier. But an array of components. And then I know tomorrow they're going to be doing object oriented programming. And when you create one object, uh, it's it, you can't really see almost the, the power of it. But when you've got an array of objects, then you really start to see how dynamic um, arrays can be useful and how they can be processed quite nicely when you're using um, programs so those type of yeah. aspects it's not just limited to the the data types of like integer and reals there, there's so many other applications that you can array do an array of yeah and, it, and it's funny you should say about arrays of components because actually there's one built into every form uh, and it's a form dot components and if you've got a load of components on the screen and you want to apply uh, something to those components uh, I've seen people write code out where they've taken each component name and said edit one dot something, edit two. Yeah. And you're like, you don't need to do that. You can actually go through and say for component in compo form dot components, and you can iterate through them because it is just an array. And so the, the, you can treat uh, that components array. Um, there's a little bit of um, what's known as subclassing and, and things like casting of, of components, but you can actually go through and all the components on your screen, if you wanted to, I don't know, change the font on uh, every edit box. You can literally cycle through there and change the font um, manually in, in code. And you can do that with an array and and, uh, and uh, it's a bit of code. So it's, it's yeah, it's very useful. Um, that just shows how the, the array almost forms like the backbone of the, the environment almost. Even if you, you look at the, I think yesterday there was a, a session on string handling. Um, yeah. A string is technically an array of characters. So just if you, it's, it's the array is almost the backbone of all the different like the components and like the forms and all that. So it's a very powerful data structure that is always used in the back end almost. So it shows you how powerful yeah. it is to you. Well, actually, the next session coming up is um, for, from Aubrey uh, Koza, yeah. I think is how I yeah. pronounce Aubrey's name. And uh, it is about working with string grids, which actually yeah. effectively is a great big uh, set of arrays of strings. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's core 12 as well, which is the one that follows on from this. So I think the way it's been laid out is you start with single dimension arrays, multi-dimension arrays. So the, as you showed in your video, you can refer to columns and, and uh, cells specifically. And uh, of course, a string grid has arrays of columns, arrays of rows and arrays of cells. So if you uh, if they followed along with your your two videos, um, they should now really understand how the string grids fall together. So there is a plan here. It's almost like it was planned, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very good. <laughs> yeah. I, and uh, once again, I mean, I just want to comment again, you know, how good your videos are. Very, very clear, um, just at the right pace. And, and the, the, you know, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The highlight tools and stuff like that. Use those is really great. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of positive yeah. comments. And Martha saying we've got a couple of minutes left. So <laughs> uh, um, what I'll do, uh, if I just um, briefly do a little bit of um, uh, publication, sort of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pro promoting, yes, that's uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, just to, uh, if everybody will bear with me for a moment, uh, just to be a little bit corporate. Um, the language that we've been showing this boot camp, if people haven't actually realised it, because we have said the word Delphi quite a lot, and Brandon and I both say Delphi the same way. And Jim, being an American, uh, says it Delphi. But whichever way you say it, it's still 
um, means the same thing. Uh, uh, the language is Delphi. Now, if you are um, looking to uh, use the Delphi language and you don't have your own copy at the moment, there is a free Delphi Community Edition. You can download that from this site, which is, oh, of course, I just made it go full screen and completely made it disappear. But if you go to embarcadero.com, click on products and uh, Delphi, there's a thing that says starter, or uh, you can go direct to the URL that I'm showing there. Um, it's completely free for people that are um, uh, learning the language. It has got some restrictions, but basically it's a copy of a free copy of the professional version of Delphi, slightly older than the uh, Alexandria one that's around at the moment. Um, but it, 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 it does everything you could want in terms of all the things you're seeing in this um, code camp and everything that Brandon showed you in that video, you can do with this community edition. So uh, if you haven't got a copy, download it. And uh, we usually get a few people saying, does it work on the Mac and does it work on Linux and all the rest of it? Uh, because they're crazy and don't use Windows. Um, but uh, it, it is a Windows-based application, so you do need um, to have a Windows machine or a Windows virtual machine. So if you're using the Mac, and I've got a Mac behind me, you can't sit because it's blanked out, but um, if you're using a Mac, um, you'll need to use Parallels or something like that. And uh, and if you're using Linux, same, same kind of thing, virtual machine. But uh, that's a completely free thing. Um, Martha's given me the... Uh, the my, my little uh, office school my uh, studio squirrels down there are uh, saying that we're time to wrap up for the next video uh, once again just want to thank you brandon uh, okay. and we'll make sure that the links are in the replays and things like that to your site and uh, your videos um but thank you for the opportunity yeah hey you know you know you do a great job and i really appreciate it you know I, I, you do a sterling job teaching people as a, an honorable profession even if the rest of society treats us horribly you know <laughs> Yeah. it's excellent okay well the next uh video is not by brandon uh it's actually from aubrey uh, Cosa, and this is um working with string grids and uh i think jim will be taking over from me after that um to do the live q a but there will be a live q a at the end of it um but this is working with string grids thanks for joining us stick around and welcome back and welcome back to the Coding Bootcamp. In this session, we are going to learn how to work with string grids. A bit about myself, I'm a lecturer at the Department of Computer Science at the Tswane University of Technology in South Africa and very much passionate about Delphi. I've used Delphi since Boland Delphi 6, version 6. I know most of my colleagues have used it since 1 or 2, but 6, it's still back then. And I am also a software engineer and I'm involved in various industry projects using various technology. And I am in South Africa and um, cricket will then be one of my hobbies. Getting back into the session. Um, in this session, just to outline, we want to understand how to work with tabular data. I would call it data that is represented as a grid or data that is represented in table form. So understanding the concept of table form data and accessing data records from files. In most cases, when you work with this sort of data, you need to store it in a certain um, location. So for the purposes of this session, we just going to look at accessing this data from files. And as far as Delphi, we're going to look at the string grid component and see how we can use the string grid component. We're also going to have a look at string grid properties meaning how what are the properties that we can manipulate of a string grid or we can get from a string grid and we also going to look at the tutorial i call it music delphi it's just an application that shows um artist information but applying it 
on the string grid component. And in this session as well, there is content that is created. The sample application you will get, this presentation you will get also for this session. So when I talk about tabular data, or, 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 or data represented in table form, some of you or even myself, I'm already thinking of a two-dimensional array. We have discussed this in previous sessions, just to touch on it a bit, because it is in some cases most relevant or related if you are using string grids. So as with one-dimensional array, when two-dimensional arrays must have a row and a, um, um, a column. And we know that in two-dimensional arrays, the difference now is an array, it's like you should have one data type. All elements in an array will be of one data type, which is contrast to our string grid, but just to put the concept at the back of our, of our minds. And just an example there, how to initialize a string grid, where a, a two-dimensional um, array, pardon me. When you look at it, I've just put this initialization of double two-dimensional array just to show that now you have this rows and inside this rows you have this column. So you can see here you have four rows and four columns. So this relates somehow to the, as a concept, to a string grid that you will, we want to use. And again, just to recap this, we have done in the in a previous session as well, text file procedures and functions. If you want, need to access data from a text file, you will use these procedures and functions. We know that we can, if we write from a file or we read from a file, those are listed on the screen, are the procedures and functions that we are going to use when accessing or from, 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 from a text file. The idea now is we might want to read some content or some data from a text file into our string grid and do whatever that we need to do or we want to do with it. And at the end, we can even write back into a text file. If you can imagine a string grid can be big and long and if you will need to, to type in information all the time, in some cases, you might need to just read from a from a text file. So just a recap that these are uh, these concepts we can use while want to access a file. So what is a string grid component? The string grid component is a visual representation of a grid that consists of rows and columns. You can see it in the picture on the bottom right. So it's a visual representation that consists of rows and columns. So if you go horizontally, then we, you would say um, those are my columns. And if you go now down the list and you would say those are my rows. The string grid can also be a visual vision of a two dimensional array. That's why I have touched on a two-dimensional array because if you look at the string grid and you try to visualize a two-dimensional array ideally it is pretty much the same thing but what you should note and keep in mind is that an array can only be of one data type if you can make an array of diable or an array of integers or an array of strings and we have learned by now that all VCL components or all components in our Delphi, they they represent their data as strings. Even if it's a number, it is now um, presented as a string. That's when we work with conversions. But we can work with conversions if our two-dimensional arrays of double and we want to present something in a string grid, we know how to convert from double or from int to, to string. The string grid component 
can be found underneath additional tab on the component palette. This really we borrow from our old Delphi versions where there's a um, there are tabs when you select components. But now Delphi is so cool that all you need to do you can just type string or you can just type grid. Then it will show you um under the search. You don't have to click around or you don't necessarily need to know where things are. After you search it, that's when you can um identify under which category does it fall but you can just use the search on your component palette one would make use of a string grid component to display a series of values by category this is um the, 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 there's many many possibilities and many um ideas that you can achieve with a string grid you want to list um items in categories or you just want a tabular form and totals at the bottom whatever you can think of i know some of us are even looking oh this can be an excel mini excel type of application yes a string grid will be suitable to be used in that way so still looking at the string grid component then this is a picture now we can discuss the the sum of the of the properties that we have as i said columns those are the columns moving and you should remember that we start our indexing at zero if you look at the bottom here you will see that the first cell they are called cells the first cell is index zero zero and the second one is index one zero so this simply tells you that when you index the string grid it's more like the, the same way you would index a two-dimensional array and the important part that you need to pick <coughs> apologies that you need to pick up is you start indexing with the column and then the row the first one is not clearly specified because it's zero zero you don't see which one is the column and which one is the row but this this one that um the second one is one and zero we have moved to column one but we are still on row zero so that's how you would move with it and um as i said everything is a cell and you would be able to access a cell individually on its own and just to add there are what we is called fixed columns and fixed rows if you look at this grid application there are some rows and columns that you don't really edit they they are fixed they just stay there they we use them to display headings or rows etc so those are your fixed rows and columns you can have more than one fixed row and you can have more than one fixed columns so that's the idea of a string grid if we get this concept of rows and columns and indexing starting with the column and then the row then um, string grid is easy a cell is represented as a string so we're going to be easily assigning it to a string so some properties of a string grid we are going to take a look at the following properties in the object inspector i i will show you now you know if you click a string grid then you look at the object inspector there are many properties these are some of the properties that we think um they might be useful for string grid is the column count and the row count simply now the column count how many columns does my string grid have the row count will be how many rows does my string grid have and default column width and default row height if you want to set the default widths and heights and the fixed color as we said you can set how many fixed columns you have and how many fixed rows you have and then you can say the fixed color i want my headings to be to be red or to be blue and the color as well and the grid line width and the scroll bar so these are the properties that you can manipulate to make your string grid look 
as desired. We are going in our tutorial application to look at some of those properties. So just to start for a start, we have this information in a text file. We Most of us are used to files, comma, separated files. I have a list now, I call it artist.txt, or I can also call it artist.csv, because it's a comma separated file. Then I have the name of the artist, the year the artist started performing. Um, the next one maybe would be the number of um, listeners um, the artist has, and the other one will be the number, how, how it's played. I didn't put headings in here just to um, remove the complexity of when you read this now, knowing that the first line is heading, knowing to ignore the first line. I just put it as a comma separated file that has information. So when you look at a file like this or information like this represented in any other way or in any other form, you would think of, of a grid of in, in an application, representing it like this would not be visually okay. You would think of putting it in a grid and there's then possibilities come through of what you can do with this type of information. And we are going to take that information. So this is the sample application that we are going to create. And you see now the, that data from a text file is nicely represented in a grid. There's the string grid and the other components that um, we can also use to enhance our application. So let us look at the application in Delphi. I will switch and move to my IDE. Excuse me. So this is the application I have designed. This is the string grid. And if you look at the string grid in the object inspector on the left, you would find the properties and events that you can use for a string grid. We have already discussed there's the color, the color that will be used. There's the there was fixed color default column with I said. 150 you can make it then it will change you see it's smaller or i can say 140 then to make it a bit bigger so this remember you can also change programmatically i'll show you now when we um clear or we start running our the application and all those properties you can change there's fixed cause fixed columns and fixed rows if i now say i have fixed columns i have two fixed columns there you will see now um there are two sets of fixed columns and fixed rows i can also make three then there will be three you see my data starts now here in the middle uh, but this one doesn't make sense i'll make fixed row one and fixed columns is two then or maybe rather and you can play around with it there's now i have two fixed rows so that that's the idea of fixed rows and column that your data you see the blue cell that is highlighted that's where you actually want your data to 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 to, to be in but now this fixed you can have your headings your sometimes you might need two fixed rows to put in your heading maybe a description of your heading or whatever that you want to 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 put in but for the purposes of this application we do have one fixed row and one fixed column. I am going to demo the application by simply starting by running it and after I run a certain function then show and explain the code that has been used to perform that specific function. So the application there it's running then I'm simply going to say load artists if i click this button of load artists you would see that it has loaded the information that i had from a text file and loaded it into this this application and the text file is what we had looked at in our presentation so let us have a look and how this was achieved so looking at at this so just to show off 
or just to show you you can some programmers will tell you you don't need when you read from a file you don't need to put it in arrays first then put it in the file you can just simply put it in the in the string read and that's okay but for the purposes of this session because i understand that we have also learned about arrays and we are strengthening our array knowledge so i have used two dimensional array of integers to store what we have the the year formed of the artist or band the listeners the artist or band has and the play count how many times um the songs of the artist have been played so i have created now a two dimensional array of integer to store that my apology sincerely for hard coding the seven because i have seven rows in my file just for simplicity for the purposes of this lesson ideally you would not hard code the seven you'd rather have it as a constant even so or you would determine how many rows by reading from a file rather than hard coding it but for the purposes of this session we would just assume and know that our file have seven artists seven records and we know that i have now said we have three of, 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 of the year formed listeners and play count and mind you me I didn't add the artist name into the same two-dimensional array because a two-dimensional array can only store elements of the same data type so I could not include the artist name if I want to use the one two-dimensional array I would definitely have to store everything as strings and convert it to integers later but just to show the idea of parallel arrays meaning now you have this one array which is parallel to the two-dimensional array meaning the first artist in this array the data for that will be in the first um row of our two-dimensional array just to and we have learned we're not going to go too much into the text file and reading from a text file but the idea of just to load the code back there but then the idea what we're doing here it's simply looping through a file up until the end reading each line we know that it is delimited by a comma then we're going to split the the, the delimited by, by by the comma then it splits into fields then we're going to put this field into our two-dimensional arrays we iterate with i but we know one will be our our first field the f formed two will be our listeners and three will be the play count so after we loop through the whole array through the whole file and list everything in an array that's when now this is when now we start with our application let me just go through through it quickly i'm just scrolling so that the focus is on what we want to listen to so display array values on a string grid so this is the headers we said when accessing a string grid the name of the string grid is grid artists grid artist dot cells we said cells that's when you access one cell in a string grid and we said a cell will be a string so we can simply assign a string to it so when you say said zero zero we meaning the first column and the first row remember the first one is the column and the second one is the row so if it's a header row meaning now all for this heading the row will be zero and the columns will be zero one two three because now the first column is for artist name the second column is for year formed the third column is for listeners and the fourth column is for play count so that's how you would programmatically add your header row 
by making sure that you are indexing it correctly. The index works pretty much as what you are used to in a two-dimensional array. You might be thinking now, okay, my understanding is cells is actually a two-dimensional array of strings. That is why we can index it like a two-dimensional array and we can assign strings to it. This is the trick of working with a string grid and if we get this concept right then everything will work so good because there's no other complication really than understanding what a two-dimensional array is and now this two-dimensional array that we have is visual it is visible on the screen so now we're going to loop from one to seven note that i i will always loop from one not from zero because i understand that um zero will be my header row when i'm working with rows i'm always going to work from row one then in begin i'll say grid artist dot cells then it's the columns will always move from zero to three and my iterator my indexing for my rows then will always move on. And every time after I add something to my grid, I just increase the row count. Remember, the row count is the number of rows. So after I add an element, I add another um, I'm, I'm row then so that I can add the. In fact, you can actually put this before you add an, a, a row. So as artist name, because string grids or VCL components work with strings, so a string I can just assign to cells, cells which is also a string. But now I could not assign from my two-dimensional array, artist array. I could not assign because it's an integer and you cannot just assign an integer to a string. Delphi gives you functions to convert from one data type to another. Uh, we have now converted from an integer to a string, making sure that this number that we have in our two-dimensional array becomes a string so that we can assign it to our grid. And at the end, after using a file, this is um, freeing up memory just close the file after using the file but the string grid part it's quite easy because it's technically this line from 130 125 to 135 you just populate your headers loop through your array based on your array size and add rows and populate those rows with data that's what it is did and if you if we run it now if we click load artist it will just there's our headers that we put on the first rows then we now can put information and data for our 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 rows our data rows there is another button that is developed i see there's a clear button and if you click the clear button it simply removes everything from the string grid like resets the string grid you see now you only have one row or oh, you have one fixed row and one data row and no fixed column so let's look at the code of how to clear or how to dynamically change the properties of your string grid so this is now code on click of the button. Can go to on click. There we have it. So it will clear and reset the string grid. So what it is being done here is it's moving through all the row count. Row count is how many rows does the string grid have? As I said, using the number seven, it's never a good programming practice. But for a string grid, you do have what you can use. You just use 
string my string grid dot row count it will return the number of rows and we understand now that if the number of rows is seven and we are counting from zero we should be actually ending at six so that's why we minus one to make sure that we don't overflow to a row that does not exist so we use a for loop to loop through all the string grid rows then for all the columns we just set everything to nothing meaning an empty string will be um an empty string it will be showing nothing but we don't stop there just to play around with other properties as well grid artist dot row count is equal to two meaning now that's why you only have one fixed row and one data row because the row counts two column count we want four columns for our four fields and then fixed rows we want it to be one and fixed columns we want it to be zero so we have maybe i've shown you how to use the object inspector to do this but sometimes in an application the data is dynamic and you need to change these properties programmatically so this is how you would change the properties of your string grid and you saw the initial string grid looked a bit different from the string grid that we have if we have a look at it you see now we have um, one fixed row one fixed column and I think we have one two three four five rows but if I click clear then now I have programmatically changed it and now I have two rows one fixed um one fixed row and no fixed column so i will load my artist and see this artist information i have i now want to just play around with data and see if i can go engage with this string grid with with the program so there's this button show stats that is now engaging with the data on the right you see i want to see who is the artist with most listeners who is the artist with most played um meaning now the the, the play count is higher or and who is the a newcomer newcomer will mean who who is the year formed must be the greatest then you are a newcomer the others are oldest so when i click this button it shows me now it looks at most listeners it says rob stewart then it gives me this number rob stewart most listeners is this correct yes i think this is the biggest number compared to all others so it engaged with this string grid went and searched for the artist with the most listeners and it says the artist name and it even shows you because of this number most played then it says beyonce i think on the play count this is the highest number and it takes the name as well and newcomer meaning the highest year formed is 2005 2003 years 2005 then there you have it it's a children so it has now went through the data engaged with the data and now drawing up stats and all thing images that we can draw from this let us now look at the code of this show stats button and see how um it was developed or how can we code this show stats or any other function where we want to go into the data and engage with it and get set so it's again declaration of variable when working with 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 string grids in most cases you do not want to in this for this purpose you do not want to store the values i want to store the index that is why i i showed the name of the artist and the 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 the, the number as well so that if you have the raw index it's easy now to get all information for that row that's why our we work with rows so initialize indices meaning when we start when the loop starts we assume that the first record is the is, is the one is the newcomer is the most listeners is the most place you assume when when you start with with a 
search like this then your the loop then will start at two because we have assumed that one is everything then we start the loop as two then when you start the loop at two you simply do a check if we know that our first um column one is newcomer is greater than meaning if that year is greater than the newcomer index newcomer index we know that we have assumed it to be one if we find it that the second one or anything after that is greater then we're going to set i to the to the index that we want so now we're just looping through this and making sure that if the the the, the, the element at the current index is greater than the element at the previous index or the initial index then that means this element at the current index should be the one that we are looking for so that's how you basically perform a search and it's a for loop and an if statement to check inside a for loop and again string grid cells are strings if you compare if a string is greater than another string you would find different results this we are we know that they are numbers and we want to compare them as numbers that is why we have used str to int string to int to make sure that we are comparing numbers to numbers if you remove str to int it won't give you perfect results because strings comparing um 13 and 14 as a string is different to comparing 13 and 14 as numbers and most listeners and most played use the same concept inside our loop to um, get the result and at the end what we simply do because we have the indice we use the indices we have the index will simply say from this um, the edit box text is equal to from these grid cells take zero zero is the artist name and the index that we have determined and i just concatenate it with the index of the particular newcomer listeners or most played that is how the concept will work and if we run our application again and you will see that it will show the stats and determine these values correctly so that is how you would search for stuff and this concept now of searching brings me to other ideas of aggregation i would what if we add a row at the bottom and at the bottom of a uh, row then usually the row at the bottom you you show averages what is the average year of this artist or total listeners what are total listeners or average listener you can show your averages medians totals in rows and it will be the same concept of looping from the beginning from row one up until the last row and doing all the magic that you want to do in your application that is maybe something you can pick up this application and add to you to show your understanding thank you very much for being part of this lesson i hope we have learned something in this le lesson that is worth learning thank you and thank you again and goodbye Okay, so it looks like Aubrey's not on for Q and A. That's all right. I'm sure he is uh, probably busy with class or something. But I can do my best to answer these questions here. Um, so I did find uh, Stuart or Stran, I guess, did share that he's also interested in beekeeping, which I think is quite fascinating. I know very little about beekeeping, but. Uh, that's, I just thought that was a funny comment, so I thought I would would share that. Um, so there was a comment here about it might be interesting for newbies if they can see stuff related to the on draw events, which did, he didn't get into that. But it's a really great, useful thing about um, the grids is that you can use the on draw events to actually draw within the cells of the grid. 
which allows you to do things like put images in there, change colors and stuff like that. Uh, there is information in DocWiki, which I can put a link in for that here shortly on how to do the on-draw event on grids. Let's see here. Um, Kirk asks a question about asking if you need to increase the row count of the property as he did, or if you could also use increase. So um, I didn't notice the exact way that he increased it, but one note is that <clears throat> if he is, uh, the row count property uh, is a property and you can't pass properties to increase. And that's kind of an interesting side effect of the way increase works. So um, you have to, for properties, you have to say row count equals property or the property name. So example, row count equals row count plus one, because the you're reading from the row count and then increasing it. The There is a, uh, a property is a, has a certain kind of wrapping around the variable that's holding it and might even actually be calling a method to update it. Whereas increase directly goes and accesses the memory of the variable and increases the value. So another place that side effect shows up with increase. So increase technically can be faster in some situations if you're really speed sensitive to the way you're incrementing a value. Um, but the range checking, for example, if or overflow checking, so integers, you can have a overflow checking turned on so that if you increase an integer, for example, a 16-bit integer past 32,000, whatever it is, it will um, wrap around, become a negative number. It, with overflow checking on, you'll get an error message when that happens so that you don't go negative when you mean, didn't mean to. When you use increase, it doesn't, it bypasses the overflow checking. So that's some slight nuances to the way increase works versus just actually adding a value to that. Way beyond the scope of this, but uh, that's an answer to Kirk's question about why you can't just use increase to increase the value of a property like Brokout. But there's a comment here from Sylvan, Sil 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 Sly I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I apologize. Uh, auto adapt column with, with text to a column is a little difficult and a on-call size change event will be a great instead of difficult management of GS call sizing. It, it is tricky, that's something that I've uh, tried to work on as well. A lot of third-party grids do have that function in there. Um, the the tricky thing is, is that you need to look at all of the columns in there and especially for DB grids, which is again, um, well, there was a lot of conversations about DB grids versus string grids. This was string grids. Uh, DB grids are um, the big brother of string grids, I suppose you could say, that connect databases to display data from databases. And the tricky thing about the column sizing is you need to look at all the data in the column in order to understand to automatically resize it and especially with db grids you might not have all that data yet so there there's some uh, nuances to that um but it would be nice to have that built into string grid uh, jamie shares that uh, when towards the end there when he was doing the statistics says now i get why they does the start to two and it wasn't that he's ignoring the first row so he talked about how when he's scrolling through all the data, he starts at row one because row zero is the header. Row one is the first data. But then when he was comparing it for statistics, he starts at row two because all of those are compared. Here he starts with the data from row one for comparison's sake. So that's a, one of the interesting things. Um, there's a famous quote that says uh, there's two hard things about programming. And I can't remember who the quote's by, but there's two hard things about programming. Uh, the first is naming things. The second is cache and validation. And the third is off by one errors. So, of course, the funny thing is that there's three things that are hard about programming. And the third one is off by one errors. And off by one errors is just where you make an assumption about where you're starting at, whether it be starting at one, starting at zero, where you're going to. And if you, you get that off, you're off by one of those because usually that's where it's at. There's one place you're off by. 
then strange things happen. So that's always something to remember in the back of your mind. If things aren't going exactly the way you expected, maybe look to see if you need to change where you're starting or ending your loops. Uh, let me look and see if there's any other questions here. Uh, a lot of questions, a lot of discussion about the um, uh, databases and reporting and stuff like that. Oh, someone's Gary saying that the GitHub, so the GitHub should have been updated. Let me double check real quick and see. Um, see if something is missing there or if we... Working with string grids. Okay, it looks like some of the stuff is still missing from the the there. I will uh, check with Brian who's doing that and make sure this gets updated. So yeah, I'll put the link in here though for anybody that doesn't have it yet, and we will. get that updated so the yeah the there's still some stuff missing from there but i will the slides for example aren't on there yet and there may be some other resources but we'll get those on there it's there's a lot of uh, materials that need to be organized and such uh kirk says there are 10 kinds of people in the world those who understand binary and those who don't which is a, a great fun binary joke because in binary uh zero is zero one is one but then when you go to two, since you can only have values of one and zero, then you have to move the one to the left and you have 10 or 10. I can't remember how I'd be displaying that properly on camera. Um, uh, let's see, GitHub code. Okay, look, I got the GitHub code. Index is pointing row is Okay, cool. So, um, Let's see, what do we have coming up next is building a native GUI in Python with Delphi VCL. Ooh, this should be a fun one. So looks like that's end of core for the day, or we should have, oh yeah, that's the end of our core for the day. And we have uh, built the a Python session, building native GUI in Python with Delphi VCL. So this should be pretty exciting. Diego is going to show how to use the uh, Python or the Delphi VCL library for Python to build native GUIs, which is pretty cool stuff. I'm pretty excited about that. I had a session yesterday where I touched on that a little bit as well. So we do have a little bit of time, it's about 15 minutes before the next session starts. So if you need to uh, stretch your legs or get a drink or whatever, go ahead and do that. And we'll see you in the next Q&A. In this video, I'll walk you through installing the free Delphi Community Edition from Barcadero Technologies. Before installation, make note of your serial number, username, and password from when you registered to download Community Edition. You also need to install the .NET Framework version 3.5, which is included with Windows 10 as an optional feature. You may already have it installed, but double check and install the latest Windows updates while you're at it. Remember, Community Edition does not work alongside any other editions. You also need additional devices for multi-platform development. I've already installed Java on this system. From here in Control Panel is where you install .NET Framework 3.5. It takes a few minutes as Windows downloads and installs it. Now we'll launch the Delphi Community Edition installation. All editions of Rad Studio use the same installer, but it is your serial number that determines what gets installed. Here is where you need your serial number, username, and password. Now it is installing the main program files.
Once that is done, you can select the platforms you want to develop for. I'm going to select all platforms. You can also install additional components. This is where you can select the Android SDK, NDK, and Java JDK if you don't have them already installed. I usually install Java manually and then let this installer install the SDK and NDK. Since we are installing the Android SDK and NDK, we have to agree to the license agreement. Now we give it a little more time to let it download and install the rest of the features. After the installation is completed, you're greeted with this welcome screen where you can choose between the light theme and the dark theme. The light theme looks better for videos, but I really recommend you check out the dark theme as it is beautiful. On this screen, you can set up your source control. It comes with Subversion pre-installed, but if you would rather use Git or Mercurial, you can set those up here too. It's also convenient to turn on autosave so you don't lose your work when something unexpected happens. And with that, Community Edition is installed and you're ready to start developing. Check out our other videos for more tutorials and visit Embarcadero.com to learn more about Community Edition and our other products. This is a project that I wrote. You may have seen it before if you've come to ask gear for Delphi webinars, because I think I did it on the desktop first or some, some other conference, one of the many things that I uh, do webinars for. And this is all done with uh, Skier for Delphi as well. And any Star Trek fan will be able to tell you what this is. This is a imitation, shall we say, of a space computer, the LCARS interface. If you're a Star Trek original series fan, then you'll know immediately what that is. And what we've got here are some um, skier for Delphi controls. And if I hit LF11, you can see it's a skier animated image. And this one is an SVG. And uh, there's some more animated images here. These are lotty animations. So they're basically a bit of XML and, and it draws the animations. These are just simple shapes, as you can see, T-shape and a few other things as well. In the background, there's some source to make things render. But let me just run that for a second so you can see what it looks like when it's running. Oops, oh dear, what did I do? Oh, I broke it, oh no. It was working the other day, no, what did I do? Ha, there you go. It, it, when I opened the project, it automatically added skier in there. So it's playing sounds in the background, which I'm just gonna turn off because we don't really want those on. But as you can see, key things here are the font handling that Skier does. This is a Klingon uh, custom font. It doesn't say anything meaningful. It's all random uh, text. And uh, here's some colored fonts. And then there's some nice uh, column fonts and uh, justified and all the rest of it. Here's some text. There's your SVG. Here's a nice custom Star trek -y type font. And the animations and all of this is done using open source stuff. I, I didn't create any of this myself. I just draw them all together, put them in the same place. But it's a simple little demo, but it gives you some idea of some of the things that just straight out of the box you can do. You can get much better animations than these. I just pick ones that look vaguely Star trek -y. But it's very cool. And all of it's enabled by um, Skier for Delphi. You can download this from their website and uh, go to the repository. It's all open source. And uh, most of the code that you see there actually is really to do with generating random lines of text. So actually, it's nothing to do with the skier stuff. It's just because I wanted to show some plausible text on there. And there this, is a, this is a VCL yeah. sample too, right? Yes, this is a VCL sample. There is someone cleverly has raised an issue against my sample and said, do an FMX version. The difference between the FMX and VCL samples is that in the VCL, these animations here are not transparent. 
Okay, let me just turn the sound off. On the FMX, this planet background here would be transparent. You probably can't see it very well on the webinar, but this planet image has got a black background, which by default is transparent on FMX. And therefore, the radar sweep actually seems to go around and hover over the top of the planet because I put the Z order so that the radar sweep was on top and it looked like the radar had detected the planet. But that's the only real difference um, between the FMX and the VCL versions. But yes, this is a VCL project and it's good to go you can use this out of the box and see some of the nonsense i did to uh, make it work but it gives you some indication of how to load custom fonts and lay it out put colors in and the play animations there's nothing difficult with the animations load the animation in and uh, get it to play saving the font their font handling is fairly easy there's a bit of uh, font handling here it loads in a open source font which i do reference in my notes i put an attribution in there from where i got it loads the font in, uh, creates the font, and then uh, chooses a yellow color, and that's it. That's your custom font loaded. So it could be any font that you like. I and love yeah, the fact that you can load good. the font into your application. It doesn't have to be installed on the computer. That, that's a really big thing. Correct, yes. And and actually, in my notes, I actually put attributions where I got these from, and that fontlibrary.org has got thousands of fonts. I didn't find just one Klingon font. I found about 15. So if there's 15 Klingon fonts, you can bet there's all sorts of other types of uh, font that you could ever want. I just go to uh, GitHub and get it there, but actually, it's a lot easier if you go to the skierfordelphi.org um, site and then go to the uh, repository, and they credit me there very nicely. I didn't do any of the hard work. I just wrote a simple little program. They did all the hard work. loved how readable the object Pascal programming language is. I decided it would be cool to make a program where the code was the codified lyrics to a song, and then the output was the actual lyrics to the song. So much like Walt Disney created Fantasia based on classical music, I've created a special musical number based on the music of Jonathan Colton. Code monkey get up get coffee. Code monkey go to job. Code monkey have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob say code monkey very diligent, but his output stink. His code not functional or elegant. What do code monkey think? Code monkey think maybe manager wanna write login page himself. Code monkey not say it out loud. Code monkey not crazy, just proud. Code monkey likes Fritos. Code monkey likes to have a mountain do. Code monkey, very simple man with big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart. Code monkey like you. Code monkey like you. Code monkey, hang around at front desk till your sweater look nice. Offer buy you soda, bring you cup, bring you ice. You say no thank you for the soda, cause soda make you fat. Anyway, you busy with the telephone, no time for chat. Code monkey have long walk back to cubicle. He sit down, pretend to work. Code monkey not thinking, so straight. Code monkey not feeling, so great. Code monkey like Fritos. Code monkey like to have a mountain dew Code monkey very simple man Big warm fuzzy secret heart Code monkey like you Take bath, take nap This job fulfilling in creative way Such a load of crap Code Monkey thinks someday he have everything Even pretty girl like you Code Monkey just waiting for now Code Monkey says someday Somehow Code Monkey like Fritos Code Monkey like to have a Mountain Dew Code Monkey very simple man Big, warm, fuzzy, secret heart Code monkey like you Code monkey like you
This is actual object pass Cal code and was recorded in real time. You can compile it with Delphi or app method and run it on Windows, OS X, Android, and iOS. The output is the original lyrics to the song. The code will actually work as a console application as well, and so in theory could work on other platforms like Linux, etc. Uh, just in order to make it shared code, I made it a GUI application. I hope you've enjoyed this special musical number, and my thanks to Jonathan Colton for making and sharing this great song. You can download all my source code for this song on my website at delphi.org slash codemonkey. From there you'll find links to download Jonathan Colton's song as well. Hi there everyone, welcome to the Boot Shanty 2022. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks for the guys that invited me to do pres this presentation. It's a big pleasure to be part of the team. And uh, for this presentation, we are going to use uh, Delphi to develop a nice uh, graph user interface. We are going to use VCL for our desktop windows. Uh, from that, we are going to call some Python functions. This can be a uh, handful for Python developers that want to use a, a nice graph user interface using Delphi that have a drag and drop component and it is what you see is what you get okay for the target audience for this presentation is Python devs who want a nice graph user interface Python devs curious about Delphi and Delphi devs who wants to use Python and anyone interested in Delphi and Python on desktop Windows Windows OS okay so there is never 
a tool that will be good for all tasks. Sometimes you have to find a new tool to implement something that your customer wants. Okay? And there are some uh, good Python scripts that you can use to solve some problems. <coughs> and that's why we are going to show you guys how to do that. Okay. So, basically, before I start this, make sure that you have installed the Delphi. I'm using Delphi 10.4 community edition. Okay, there is no problem at all. Uh, plus that, you need to install the Python. I'm using Python 3.19. So after install Delphi and Python on your machine, you have to install a Delphi component called Delphi for Python. Uh, we will provide you guys the link from GitHub. It's for free. And after you install this component, this option will appear on your IDA. And using this function, you will be able to export your forms to use it on Python. Also, on Python, you have to use PowerShell to install a Python library called Delphi VCL. Okay. Using this library, you will be able to import your forms and use the Delphi component interface. Let's start to implement the application. Let's create a new VCL application. This application will be a simple tool that will have three functions. The first one will be take a screenshot. The second one will trigger a HTTP request. And the last one will send an email. Let's start to implement the first one. He will place a simple panel and add an image component to load the screenshot. Here will be the file path to save the screenshot. <coughs> the photos of this presentation is to show you how to use graph user interfaces Delphi for Windows on your Python code. It's not focused on the coding itself, okay? but we will show you practical examples so let's save the project before we go ahead show you guys before after install the component you will be able to export your formulary or the entire the entire project to use it on Python so let's export this formulary and now if you open up the folder you will see this file this file contains all the definitions that we need to use the formulary inside Python. <coughs> to implement the functions on Python, uh, you can use any scripter. I will use this idle script, idle Python. I'm going to save this script inside the same folder I'm using. Python 3, let's go.
you have to import the li the Python library to use the Delphi view. <coughs> there are simple instructions that we need to follow. Here inside this function, we will load our formulary, Delphi formulary. Here we put the formulary file that we exported before. PyDFM. This file is this file generated by the Delphi components. Let's go the initialization. All this code you can download, you can get from the Delphi component. It's uh, there are many examples where you can put code from there. I did it before, actually. Let's see if it works. Let's save it first. Uh, for this first run, we will just see the Delphi formulary on the screen. Okay. Okay, we should be seeing the components on the formulary. We must have some problem on the code. Let's check it out. Rx1. The file name. Oh. Let's see if it works. No. Not a file. The 
from far to library. Okay, let's try it again. We should see the components on the screen. Oh, here we go. Now let's try to implement the first uh, function. Let's define a function that will will be called to connect the the events with the Python script. It will be called. Comps. Let's see the name of the button. Button one. Let's change its name. Button. Take screenshot. Too long. Take SS. Instead for perks. We can set change the caption. And finally, link with the event. Now let's implement this event. It has two arguments. To use this function, we will need to declare here a Python Python library called Py Arg. Save the screenshot according to the name here. We can reach the visual components with the tag self dot in the name of the component, and we can access its properties. And after that, we will load the saved image to the image component. Let's check its name. We can even trigger its inner functions. So basically, when the Python script loads, it will trigger this function and load the formulary. And also, we need to trigger this function to link the events with Python function. We just need to do that. Uh, but before we run the Python again, we need to update the formulary. We need to export it again because we changed some component names. Okay, now 
expect to do it. Let's test it. Let's put the director here. Let's use the bitmap format to the image because the native Delphi component for image will work with bitmap only. And how you can see the screenshot loaded here. Let's change the spread the, the image support. Make it be proportional so we can see the entire screenshot. Let's save and export it again. And always when you change the design components, you have to export it again so the components will update the Python, the Python file, generated Python file. Let's run it again and see the result. Oops, I forgot to put the name here. The directory actually. You see, it's uh, it's uh, really fast. Great. Uh, one thing that I need to comment with you guys is that uh, when I declare a new library here on the Python script, I have to make sure that I have installed it before I use it. And to install a new library here, you just need to open up the PowerShell and run the command pp install and the name of the library you want to install. Now let's go ahead here and implement the other two main functions we are going to implement on Python. The second one will be the HTTP request. Save it. Mm. Let's read the screen. going to implement the HTTPS request we are going to put the URI under the button here to choose the event and call the Python function and a memo here to show the response and the text memo HTTP response let's clean this let's change the caption and change its name Okay, uh, we can uh, we can implement the second one. Let's update the file and for us to use this on the well, on the Python script. Let's 
let's link the second event here. Type button column. Now let's implement the event here. Okay, we are going to manipulate directly on the components on the screen. How is it named? We will set the response directly to the to the name. Changes so basically, we are going to trigger this function that will feed the taxi on the menu on the screen. Okay, to use this function here on Python, you need to install another library called requests let's export it again to update the file okay let's try to run the second function on python Let's try to request a, an open API that we have here in Brazil that uh, will respond to it for JSON, JSON format of uh, zip code details. We have some problem here. Python is case sensitive. Let's try it again. And here, here we are. The information. Okay. Now let's implement the thirty-one function third and last one function that will send a SQL email with a nice gutting HTML body we will need uh, some edits on the screen that will be the SMTP settings we are going to use a hotmail email let's 
go ahead with the components we are going to use. Password. Okay, now we have all the settings needed to send the email. Let's put a uh, mail on the screen where we are going to place the message button. Prepared a nice body message to use here. A button to trigger the function. And let's put a, a caption here that will show us if the message was sent or not. Let's rename the needed components. Mail status. Everything is in here. Body message. Let's print lines and rename the edit components. I'm going to use the default settings to my Rotmail, my Hotmail. Yeah, I'm going to use my personal Hotmail to test this function. Password I'm going to feed on Zoom time. Let's change the password share here to hide my password. I'm going to send it to my own uh, Gmail, which is OK, 
Okay, I'm going to copy the previously body that I have prepared for today's presentation. Let's take the duplication file, starting it again, and let's implement the function. I'm going to copy the data name. Okay, now let's implement the function on Python script. implement the function here focusing the arguments <coughs> we will need some libraries here And also, hope you don't got you guys don't mind my dog barking out there. We will need to use library to attach something to the mail body, such as files. In this case, we are going to attach the HTML body. Okay, let's implement the function itself. It's kind of a bit complex here, but it's doable here we will need the the username password Python rises exception even for identification, so make sure you are doing the right identification. We can do some testing here later. Start to up. Here we are going to use some cry block. And in case of exception, we will tell the user on that label. 
and so it's here on the bottom. We will change it for perks at runtime. We can change some other properties here, like color, for example. We are using oh it's side fonts. Actually, it's here the color. Let's see if we, it's possible to change the font color here. Okay. Try some hexadecimal number here. Actually, it cannot. We cannot use hexadecimal color here. We need to use something. Okay, let's try to use it. Let's see what happens. Actually, let's see what happens. Let's update the the fishing file. Okay, let's run with to check. It will not send the email. We are just checking if it will change the label color. Don't trigger us. I don't think block will ever ever save you guys before. changes the color of the label you see it's easy to manipulate components on the screen we got some error too save fonts get error info okay let's finish it with this implementation I don't know maybe they have Oh, it's not a password here. It is the port actually. It is wrong.
bien. Entity server and port. And here we will need the SN entity username and port. No, actually, is the SN entity server also. Then we will need the username and password. Okay, now it's right. Let's prepare the HTML body. Main import, okay. The subject of the message. It is extremely easy to access the visual component, as you guys can see. Okay, we will need uh, To use the same as username here and finally mail to okay I think it's right The male body will be here. you can guys see it, it is extremely easy to get the components properties and set it to you can change its value it is awesome how you can easily work with components we're going to attach the new body Okay, so now we, we are going to send the email itself. Okay. And we tell the 
user that they may obtain free successfully. You can also change the label color to a blue color. Let's pick a blue color here. Okay. Okay, now let's try to run this. Let's update the screen again. Actually, update the definition file. Maybe change something here. Uh, let's run the application. Let's run it. See if it works. And they are saying successfully. As you guys can see, the Python script changes the label caption and also the label color. Oh. And you can see here, I received an email. Welcome. Oh, it's it's right arrived right here. As you guys can see, the email was sent. Now we can try to run all the functions. Awesome. simulate an error here when sending the email it's stuck Python send an email you see the Python script changes the formulary and that's all I hope you guys like it the presentation and once more, I would like to say thanks for the Embarcadero team that invited me to do this presentation. The source code of Python and Delphi projects will be available for you guys as the components needed. They are all for free. Thanks for watching. Okay, so. <coughs> The volume was a little low there. Apologies for that. We boosted it as much as we could on the um, platform, but unfortunately, that was as loud as we could get it. We will boost it more in the replay. I tried to not come in talking too loud here at the start of my uh, Q&A session, just in case you had cranked your volume up, but hopefully you've had a chance to adjust your, your volume. So Diego's not available right now for Q&A, but I will go through and do my best to answer the questions. So the question was, why not use PyScriptor for a demo? Um, PyScriptor is a great Python editor. I'm not sure. Actually, I'm not even, wasn't even rec and recognize what the editor was he was using. I may have just missed that part, but I looked at it at one point. I wasn't sure. But I'm guessing that might be the one Diego likes. Um, I personally use a few different editors when working with Python and other languages. So 
you know, it depends on uh, his preference. And sometimes there are some editors that are better suited for certain projects than others. But uh, PyScriptor certainly is a great one to use. And we even have a little thing here at the bottom. So you can download PyScriptor for free, Python IDE. Um, in, in regards to the um, sound being low, Stran said that he likes chat more anyway. He'll probably watch the replay later. So I'm glad I'm glad you at least found an opportunity to to uh, enjoy the chat, enjoy the conversation in here. So that's always it's always fun. Maybe next year we'll have to set up a um, a general chat for conversations that aren't necessarily uh, questions related to the to the topic. But so Jamie says, I'm guessing that uh, uh, double underscore init double underscore is automatically run. So yes, uh, anytime you see that double underscore, it's what's called a dunder statement in Python, kind of like dunder Mifflin from the office. It's uh, short, uh, what is it, portmanteau for double underline dunder and dunder init is the constructor for an object in python so we have an object if you create define a dunder init that is the constructor that's automatically called on the uh, on the object there are a number of other dunders there's a um string dunder that's str that like makes a string representation of the object um, oh, and I'm totally spacing the rest of them. There's a number of other ones, though. But when you get into Python development, that's uh, something you need to be aware of is, is dunders. Oh, that was funny. I have, so I have a green screen behind me, and I have lights down on the floor. And my dog just walked in front of the green screen. I don't know if you saw the his shadow. <laughs> he walked in front of the light, so it cast a shadow on the screen. Um, so there's also some questions here about the pass statement in Python. So the pass statement in Python is a null statement. It does nothing. It's not a comment. A comment is completely ignored by Python, whereas a pass statement is a, a null statement. It's like no op in assembly. Um, so when you aren't doing anything, you use pass to say, uh, I know that you're expecting a statement here, but I'm not going to do anything. And so that was what you, you use path. Um, I think that's it. Uh, let's see here. Let me just check. Can all of the code be... So yes, Ed, <coughs> they could have written, he could have written all the code in Delphi, but what this is showing is that if you are a Python developer and you want to uh, use Delphi for the uh, GUI design, the WYSIWYG graphical interface design, and then pass that off to be the coding to be finished in Python, if you're a Python developer and you're like, I don't know object Pascal, I just want to write Python, but I need a nice GUI then that's really what this comes down to is that it gives you that ability to do that. Now, if you do write it, if you any code you write in Delphi doesn't show up in your Python application, it is just, um, so the, once you go to the export, export doesn't export the code, it just exports the um, the, the form, the design, form design. Okay, uh, I think that uh, the comment here, this is uh, visual programming, easy as taking candy from kids. If you're trying to take candy for kids, um, that could be really tricky. <laughs> One year I decided to tell my kids that I was going to impose a dad tax on their Halloween candy, and that did not go well. I think they were about ready to rebel, and uh, yeah, so taking candy from kids is quite hard. But visual programming is easy. <laughs> Okay, I think that's it. Um, we have a couple minutes left before our next session. Can, oh, Senior Tech's asking, can you export from Community Edition? Yes, I, I believe I'm 99% sure. I don't know that I've 
specifically tested that, but it should work. And I think that was tested, but I have not uh, tested that. Uh, and then another question here from Gary, the demo only had one form. Can you create additional forms once they export it? Yes. So there was an option he didn't go into to export the entire project, which exports all the forms. And so you can do that and export all the forms and have one form as the main form and then have other forms that you can then instantiate from your Python code. Um, so yes, there's you can do all of that. And you could actually create additional forms dynamically from Python as well without using the, the designer. So all that's an option. Uh, this was just a, a simple intro to uh, doing this with the with a single form, with VCL. And um, I believe we have another session on FMX, which is the cross-platform option. And the... Um, using Delphi FMX for cross-platform. So, all right. And we still have a couple minutes left to before the next session starts. So uh, real quick, stretch your leg, get a drink, and we'll see you on the next Q&A. Building native GUI with Python is what we just finished. Isn't it? Yep. Um, the next session is Muhammad's using Python libraries from Delphi, isn't it? Let me fix that real quick. There we go, all right. Building native GUI in Python. Nope, that's still the same wrong. Something's wrong. It's not displaying the updated one for some reason. But that's what's next is using Python libraries from Delphi. So we'll see you all in a couple minutes or in a few minutes after the, the, the main video plays. Hello everyone. This is Muhammad Azizul Hakim, Embarcadero Python technical blog writer. You can call me Muhammad for sure. Welcome to the Using Python Libraries from Delphi session. This session is very useful for the Delphi developer who want to add powerful Python libraries into their program. Python developer who want to easily create desktop or custom apps outside the common TK Intergui, Jupyter, or Streamlit ecosystem. Also for programmers or tech enthusiasts who want to witness the magic of combining two programming language giants. The goal of this session is to attract Python developers to use Python for Delphi to create GUIs and learn more about Delphi. To add Python data science library powers and simplicity for Del Delphi developers and to inspire the open source community to develop more advanced use cases using Python for Delphi. So this is not a competition. Instead, this is a demonstration of how you can always find a specific task that a tool is better for, as we know that no one tool is best for all tasks. So, our agenda today, we will talk briefly about the philosophy of, of Delphi and Python, introduction to Python for Delphi, and we will take a look at the installation of, the, of all the prerequisites for this demo, and finally, we will dive into the code and demo for both Delphi and Python parts, include, including tweaking parts for each demo, as it is a core part of this session. The following demo GUI will increase in complexity. Demo 01 is about a GUI that will do web scraping and print out the scraping results on the T-Memo. Demo 02 will show two outputs on the GUI, T-Memo for text output and T-Image for image or plotting results. And we will add T-String grid for showing the data sets or any files in .csv format in demo03. 
and finish up with some useful links for you to read and try more. Before we dive in more into Python for Delphi, the following is Delphi's DNA. And the Zen of Python. The philosophy behind the two programming languages. In a lot of ways, Delphi and Python are have similar philosophies, but there are defi definitely some fundamental differences. For example, Delphi is perfect for developers' productivity as we really can easily and rapidly build end-to-end -end working product using Delphi, and it is so visual with drag-and-drop interfaces provided by Embarcadero's Red Studio. On the other hand, even though Python is also great for developers' productivity, which you can solve complex problems using Python only in a few lines of code, it is still oriented as a scripting language, not visually oriented, nor have drag and drop features. So, in conclusion, it pretty much makes sense to combine the two. What is Python for Delphi? Python for Delphi, or P4D for short, is a set of components that wrap up the Python DLL into Delphi and Lazarus, or FPC. They let Delphi developers easily execute Python script and create new Python modules and new Python types. On the other hand, P4D empower Python users with Delphi's award training award-winning VCL functionalities for Windows, which enables us to build native Windows much faster. This integration enables us to create a modern GUI with Windows 10 looks and responsive controls for our Python applications. Python for Delphi comes with an extensive range of demos, use cases, and tutorials that I will give you the links to them at the end of the slide. Next, the prerequisites for this session. Beginner to intermediate knowledge in programming, especially in Delphi and Python, will help you a lot. Red Studio installed. Here is the link to download it if you are new to Delphi. Python installed, of course. Python for Delphi is installed. Here is the link to the installation instructions. And the installation of the following Python libraries. Scrappy, Matplotlib, FastAI, Scikit-learn, NetworkX, and Pandas. A recommended practice in installing the required Python libraries is using Conda, Conda install or Anaconda distribution instead of the regular Python dis distribution. Due to their active and mature community that supports Python for data science and data analytics, it would save you from complicated conflicts between libraries when you install them. The idea behind this project is to enhance the existing Python for Delphi demos, which you can find it on this GitHub link. You can run most of the known Python libraries inside Python for Delphi GUI, as long as you successfully installed them without any conflict with the Python for Delphi. We have lots of demos and blog posts on how to use the Python library inside Delphi 
on blogs.embarcadero.com and pythonguy.org. But most of them are still implemented around the existing demo 01 shown right, which is not really sophisticated as you can see here. The Python script is still showing in the lower memo, and the output would be printed out on the upper memo. So if you are planning to create a GUI that doesn't show the Python script, the basic demo 01 might not make you satisfied. This GUI doesn't support image output, so it would be shown in the default Python image viewer instead of shown in the GUI. In this example, I run the text blob library inside the Python for Delphi GUI. And for the new GUI that I've created specifically for each case and Python libraries, I've achieved the following in this first iteration. All Python code is hidden or set up and run at the back end. Image and table output are shown inside the GUI. It also supports interchangeable between Python version and distributions, regular Python versus Anaconda distribution, to avoid um complicated conflicts for some Python libs. Okay, let's begin the demo. In demo 01, we will demonstrate how to use Python scrapy library inside Delphi using Python for Delphi or I will call it scrapy 4 d for short through this session. In this first demo session, we will need to walk through some details to make us easier in understand how the GUIs work and make us easier in developing a more advanced GUI for the next demo 02 and demo 03. What is Scrappy? Scrappy is a fast, high-level web crawling and web scraping framework used to crawl websites and extract structured data from their pages. It can be used for a wide range of purposes, from data mining to monitoring and automated testing. The following is the list of components used in the Scrappy 4D demo app, which you can see more clearly in the Red Studio. Uh, you don't need the Scrappy Start Project My Project as you usually do when you use Scrappy with Python. Instead, the default example code is already embedded in this GUI app. You just need to click the execute button to get started. Let's see what the structure looks like on the Red Studio IDE. Here is the structure of the GUI. This GUI was created by modifying Python for Delphi Demo 34 which makes us possibly change the Python version in the runtime. This will save you from the seemingly complicated DLL issues to see where we call the embedded Python code, navigate to the unit scrapy 4 dpass file, inside the form create procedure at the following line to load our basic scrappy app.py using python library from delphi from delphi this way is actually much cleaner and elegant if compared with the previous python for delphi demos as we have talked about it in the previous slide with the existing Python for 
Delphi demos we copy paste okay let's back to our slide with the the existing python for delphi demos we copy paste and run the python script on the front end of the gui or inside the lower t memo or on some of the demos the python scripts are embedded on the back end but it is written hard code inside the dot pass files Theoretically, you can change this .py file with any Python script you want. As long as you successfully install the library correctly, the Python script are already tweaked correctly to produce the output, the output inside the Python for Delphi GUI instead of other media. And the Python library or Python script suitable for your GUI design and purpose. And let's open the PyScriptr IDE to see the Python files that we will run using Python for Delphi GUI. Here it is, the scrappy app, the scrappy app.py demo o2 quote scraper dot pi demo o3 wiki scraper and spider dot pi to scrape all the machine learning query search result on google scholar let's go back to our slide again And to make sure all the library works well, set up the following path to your environment variable for Anaconda Python. What does this scrappy for the GUI demo do? It will import the Scrappy library and run the basic example by executing the Scrappy app.py on the back end. Basically, you can change or update the Scrappy app.py into anything you want as long as you import the Scrappy library correctly. We will walk through uh, into scrapping quotes from quotes to scrap.com scraping titles and urls from multiple wikipedia pages at once scraping all google scholar search results for machine learning query search and finally you can read more details and a step-by-step -step tutorial on this article And let's run it. Before executing any program, we can choose the Python version and distribution here. As we have talked about before in the recommended practice, let's choose Anaconda distribution. Click Execute to import the library and it will automatically run the very basic scrappy example inside the scrappy app.py this basic example would do web crawling into example.com and it will print out the whole process and let's try the second example load script and choose the demo o2 quote scraper.py open 
by clicking the open button it will replace the embedded scrappy app.py at the back end with this demo o2 quote scraper.py this script will scrape all the quotes from quotes to scrape.com and let's execute this and we successfully scrape the quotes let's see it let's see it clearly like this yep and again it also logging the whole details of the scraping process In the same way, let's try the demo o3 wikiscraper.py to collect multiple titles and URLs from multiple Wikipedia pages at once. Load the demo o3 wikiscraper.py at runtime by clicking the load script button and then open and execute. Here is the output. We can see the title and the URLs. Title URLs for multiple Wikipedia pages and the logs of the whole details of the scraping process. If the previous examples still do not impress you, nor your boss or colleague, let's try this advanced example, the last one. <coughs> scraping Google Scholar search result for all the machine learning query search result. Okay. Here is the machine learning query search result on Google Scholar that we want to scrape. We want to scrape all of these. The original code for this example is cre uh, credited to Ed Geeken and all the contributors of the Scrappy Examples project. I modified the code to update some obsolete Python lines, like some scripts uh, that are still using Python 2, so I need to update it into Python 3. Another modification is replacing the exception handling with the new convention as the existing code still use the old convention in writing the exception handling, installing all required libraries and dependencies for the scrap example project, and setting the code to send the output to the Delphi GUI instead of command prompt and to make it suitable to run inside of Python for Delphi GUI instead of regular command line operations. And the good news is that I edit all the working code to the coding bootcamp repository. 
and let's take a look at how it works and oh before we begin it seems that i've got banned by google scholar because of i run the scraper too often so the trick to bypass this is to turn on a vpn before running our web scraper Okay, the VPN is on. Load script. And then nav navigate to Google Scholar. Google Scholar. Spiders. And open the spider.py file. And execute. This program literally scrapes all the Google Scholar search result for the machine learning query search. The scraping outputs and processes look pretty interesting, but it needs a while to complete. Yep, it's done. Okay, that's a lot of data here. The structure of the outputs are authors, citation text, citation URL, description journal year source related text re related type related url title and url let's try to open one link here
okay and it's a valid link to the machine learning papers pretty impressive right for productivity you can even open multiple scrap before the windows and run different scrapers at once in parallel like this Okay, so what next? The following are the list that I think would be nice to have for our next web scraping GUI app. Save the output to JSON instead of only printing it on Timemo. For some scenario, we want to save the output into CSV instead of JSON and show the output in tstring grid instead of tmemo and add NLP capabilities to the GUI. And feel free to give your suggestions. You can give command, comments straight to the article or try out the demo from our repository from our repository for example next is demo o2 in demo o2 we will talk about the integration between python for delphi with matplotlib fast ai scikit-learn and network x the idea of this second demo session is to start from a natural idea to make a more useful and advanced GUI that instead of only capable to print out the text output, it can show the image output inside the GUI. This GUI actually is much more advanced than the usual Python script that shows the image in the default matplotlib or standard python plot viewer the first one is matplotlib 4d what is matplotlib matplotlib is a comprehensive python library for creating static animated and interactive visualizations Matplotlib produce publication quality figures in a variety of formats and interactive environments across platforms. The following is the list of components used in the Matplotlib for the demo app, which we can see more clearly in the Red Studio. Uh, what differs this GUI from the previous Scrappy 4D is we add the image here to present the plotting result. 
here is the structure of the GUI seen inside the Red Studio IDE. What mod made plot life for the demo do? Uh, we will import the matplotlib library and run the basic example by executing the matplotlib app.py on the back end. And we will show you two plotting examples in this demo. First, annotated heat map. The context for this example is that we often want to show data that depends on two independent variables or visualize the strength of correlations between two variables as a color-coded image plot. This data visualization technique is often referred to as a heat map. If the data is categorical, this would be called a categorical heat map. This example shows how to create a heat map with annotations which help us to read the quantity on top of the color-coded plot. In this example, we will also print out the labels of the data inside the TMEMO. The second example is the, the anatomy of a figure or plot context to get the most out of matplotlib, you need to know all the anatomy of a figure or a plot. In this example, we will learn them all, all the, all the available anatomy of a figure that is provided by matplotlib. If you need more examples, read them in my article here. I provide five plotting examples in that article to give you some insights into possible use cases for this GUI. Like creating a survey app, creating subplots, visualizing trends, and the tightness of the relations on the data, etc. Let's begin the demo. The default example is matplotlib app.py. Here. Let's run it. and execute it will import the matplotlib library plot annotated heat map and print out all the labels of the data uh, and produce the plot with the file name matplotlibplot.jpg let's Click the show plot button to show it and voila, it shows up. Again, like the scrappy example in the previous section, this plot can be shown on GUI by tweaking the matplotlib code so it would save the plotting result as a file and then we will load it into the Python for Delphi GUI instead of showing the plot inside the default matplotlib image viewer let's try the second example load script choose the demo 05 anatomy of a figure dot py file open execute and show plot 
it's a pretty cool figure it gives labels to each part of the figure make making us learn about it very easily the title x axis label y axis label the grid upper line plot shows in color blue lower line plot markers major and minor tick etc knowing the anatomy of the figure enables us to develop the best data visualizations the next library that we can implement with this second GUI structure is FastAI and we will call it FastAI 4D. What is FastAI? FastAI is a deep learning library built on top of PyTorch, one of the leading modern and flexible deep learning frameworks. It has a goal to make the training of deep neural networks as easy as possible and at the same time make it fast and accurate using modern best practices. It provides practitioners with high-level components that can quickly and easily provide state-of-the-art results, and provides researchers with low-level components that can be mixed and matched to build new approaches. This fast AI 4D GUI has the same GUI structure as the previous Matplotlib 4D. It has Tmemo to present the text output from dataset labels to the details from the deep learning process. And it has the image to present the plotting outputs. What fast AI 4D demo do? It will import the FastAI library and run the basic example by executing the FastAI app.py on the backend. And we will show you two operations in this demo. First, loading the image datasets with their labels in this FastAI embedded Python code we are going to use the famous oxford 3t pet dataset by om parky et al at 2012 which features 12 cat, cat breeds and 25 dog breeds our model will learn how to differentiate between these 37 distinct categories According to their paper, the best accuracy they could get in 2012 was, was 59.21% using a complex model that was specific to pet detection with spirit image, head, and body models for the pet photos. The second example is train deep learning model. ResNet 34 This example will train ResNet 34 We will use a convolutional neural network backbone and a fully connected head with a single hidden layer as a classifier ResNet 34 is a 34 layer convolutional neural network that can be utilized as a state-of-the-art image classification model. If you need more examples, read them in my article here. I provide the end results and a detailed, and a detailed explanation of it. Let's begin the demo.
the default example is fastai app.py it will import the fastai library and load the image dataset with their labels The image output will be saved in a file as fastaiimage.jpg, which we can click the show plot button to show it. Let's execute it. And let's see the interesting outputs. It downloads and untars the image dataset, print out the path to all the images, and print all the image annotation vocabularies. Here. Click show plot to see how the image dataset look. It show up a very interesting dataset. And let's try the second example to try the to train the deep learning model. Load script. Choose the demo o2 train model.py file open and execute this script is building a model which will take images as input and will output the predicted probability for each of the categories in this case it will have 37 outputs and we will train for for epochs or for cycles through all our data. The details about the model are printed on the TMEMU. So this is some valuable information. Training the ResNet 34 for all epochs through all our data might take a long time for a regular laptop. So we want see it through the end so you can go to our blog post on the link in the previous slide if you are curious about the end results actually we still have two implementations on this demo o2 gui scikit-learn and network x 4 d but we have a limited duration here so maybe we will just fast forward into it as the principles in running the gui are basically the same here is for the scikit-learn 4 d scikit-learn is an open source python machine learning library and prepared for this demo, it has 10 different unsupervised machine learning algorithms that are ready to execute and visualize each plot that produced by different machine learning algorithms. The last one is Network X. Network X is a Python package for creating, manipulating, and studying complex network structure 
dynamics and functions prepared for this demo it will plot graphs and networks and the second examples is to perform and plot degree analysis and as usual i've provided you with the link to read more details okay so what next the following are the list that i think would be nice to have for our next machine learning and data vis visualization gui app first is save or record all the text output instead of only printing it on tmemo add the string grid to present the structured data <coughs> it is nice if we can keep on track with the data sets this update will be shown on the next demo 03 call the data sets directly from database instead from local files show multiple multiple image outputs maybe it is nice if we have some kind of tabs to see and change between the image outputs and feel free to give your suggestions you can give comments straight to the live chat to the article or try out the demo from our repository okay the last one demo 03 pandas for delphi, delphi. What is Pandas? Pandas is a Python package that provides fast, flexible, and expressive data structures designed to work with structured tabular, multidimensional, potential, potentially heterogeneous, and time series data easily and intuitively. Pandas aim to be the fundamental high-level building block for doing practical, real-world data analysis in Python. Additionally, it has the broader goal of becoming the most powerful and flexible open source data analysis and manipulation tool available in any language. It is already on its way towards this goal. The following is the list of components using in the pandas for the demo app, which we can see more clearly in the Red Studio. What differs this GUI from the previous demo O2 is we add the string grid here to present the data set that we want to analyze, and we add the edit to show the path to the data set. Here is the structure of the GUI seen inside the Red Studio IDE. <coughs> so, what pandas for the demo do? It will import the pandas library and run the basic example by executing the pandas app.py on the backend. It also show the dataset on the string grid, perform 17 data analysis steps, and we will create two plots, histogram and scatter plot matrix. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this article is still on progress, but stay tuned on blogs.embarcadero.com. Let's begin the demo. Here is what the Python code looks like inside the PyScripter, PyScripter, PyScripter IDE. <coughs> it has 17 data analysis operations here.
you can see it in the comment example in this demo version if we want to plot the histogram we need to comment on the scatter plot matrix manually like this and save let's open the red studio IDE the default example is pandas app.py it will import the pandas library and it and perform the 17 data analysis operations let's run it and load the dataset by clicking the load.csv file open the churnmodeling.csv data okay and it loads perfectly let's see it by scrolling to the whole data yep it has 10,000 rows and also a lot of columns what is really good about this if you are an experienced python developer that has experience in using jupyter notebook you might find that keep on track of your dataset is a bit challenging as if you show the dataset on the notebook you cannot scroll them to take a look at the data and the data would block a huge space in the notebook that might not be good uh, visually but you won't encounter such problems with this GUI and then let's execute okay that's a lot of useful data analysis operations here we might not dip deep into them one by one as it is outside the scope of this demo but if you are curious about it stay tuned to blogs.embarcadero.com as i will publish the article about it there let's show the histogram plot for a selected query okay and if you still want to look at the relations among the data by visualizing it using a scatter plot matrix let's go back to the PyScripter IDE and comment the scatter plot matrix code chunk and put a comment to the histogram code chunk save go back to the red studio rerun the pandas for the GUI load the data again execute and show plot okay okay and it's done
so what next the following are the list that i think would be nice to have for our next pandas data analysis gui app we want to save or record all the text output instead of only printing it on timemo create more dynamic more dynamic tables using this string grid to present the output instead of timemo because sometimes we want to alter the table and see it in the form of a table instead of just some text or data frame we also want to call the data sets directly from database instead of only from local files and we want to show multiple image outputs so we don't need to comment and comment script each time we want to present different plots and feel free to give your suggestions you can give comments straight to the live chat to the article or try out the demo from our repository here is the list of useful references and links that you might need If you want to try and reproduce what I've shown you in this section today, feel free to add and develop more advanced use cases using the existing Python for Delphi demos as its basis. Okay, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy this session and learn some useful things. Thank you for your time and. All right, thanks, Mohammed, for that session. Um, there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of questions, and it was a full hour-long session, so we're going to go ahead and go right into the next session. Well, hello, and welcome to Delta FMX for the Python session. I hope you're having fun with the bootcamp workshops and the talks on various programming technologies. If you're following our sessions from the beginning, you might have an idea of what are we going to do, what are we going to talk about in the session. To point out, we'll learn and explore the possibilities of Delphi and a Python programming languages together. Well, a Python is a powerful programming language that works in various environments. The libraries and frameworks can handle multiple heavy jobs for you. And it is really easy to do science projects and solve real world problems using machine learning, data science, and more. On the other hand, with Delphi, with its ECL and FMX GUI libraries, you can design and create fully functional applications in no time the components, the productive environment, and the idea of building GUI apps with a drag and drop and altering properties stand unique. There are platforms and integrated development environments for Python with various unique features and free and open source IDs are also available, like PyScripter. This PyScript page is a free and open source ID for Python lovers with its integrated Python debugging Python interpreter, editor views, project manager, integrated unit testing, and file for a beautiful design. You can enjoy writing your Python scripts. I'm sure I should mention that this PyScriber has more than 1.3 million downloads. Here, as you can see, this is the PyScriptor um, repository on GitHub, which is open source, as you can see. There are features screenshots and several blog posts that will teach you how to use this uh, the ID here as you can see oh hey look it is built with Pascal object Pascal that means Delphi right since Delphi's GY libraries are one of the stable modern secure and solid libraries in Windows and cross-platform development you might be thinking 
how I build the same kind of truly native applications with Python, right? Okay, uh, you might be saying that there are GUI libraries and frameworks available for Python, like Kinter or Tkinter and PyQt. Tkinter is here the standard Python interface to the TQ GUI toolkit. This TQ itself is not part of the Python. Moreover, it has fewer built-in UI components and doesn't provide you the advanced GUI designing capabilities. PyQt uh, is a Python plugin where you can create cross-platform applications using Qt GUI toolkit. Like it is a set of Python bindings for Qt version 5. With its dozens of modules, you can create GUI apps, but the development process is not Productive and straightforward compared to Delphi's FireMonkey or VCL GUI solutions. But what if I say you can build native applications using your Python programming skills? Yes, with Delphi FMX for Python package, you can create graphic user interfaces for Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and Android. FireMonkey is not something recently created and maintained by several open source developers. FireMonkey is one of the leading cross-platform frameworks available in the market. It is GPU accelerated using DirectX and OpenGL, depending on the system, is a necessary for modern software applications. With its built-in hundreds of components, you can design any great-looking cross-platform native app with FireMonkey. Moreover, the pool of components is enormous. Delphi's Windows development tools have been enormously successful, and the company is now the uh, marketer devoting that knowledge to Python GUI development, helping Python developers to create modern looking, truly native GUI applications. Delphi's Python tools assist you in creating stunning and powerful GUIs for your application due to the outstanding online architecture of the FireMonkey and thorough attention to detail. It offers enterprise-ready functionality through visual and functional components and complete control over the final user interface. User interface design doesn't have to be complicated, right? Several Python tools are available as PIP packages you can find on the internet, but not all are good and stable. Delphi FMX is a powerful tool with numerous capabilities and customizability options. It is highly recommended for Windows-only developers due to its native support for hardware acceleration. So um, I'm going to say it again that it will be cool if you get your copy of PyScript ID right now. That will be a fantastic start for this workshop. Since the Delphi FMX is a new start, it has a bit to do with developers, like creating complete documentation and adding more functional components like effects. But here you can see this all components are ready to use by you. Like there are standard controls like button, speed button, checkbox, radio button, progress bar, indicators, switches, track bars, expanders, image control, and we have edit boxes, various and we have list box, memo, list view, like you can use dialogues here, and we have lots of shapes that you can use to create or to design some kind of really cool uh, graphical user interface. And you have option to use various colors, and as you can see lots of layouts you can choose. We have different scroll bars, to create continuous uh, scrolling applications. And we support form, frame. We have menus if you're creating the uh, desktop applications for Windows and Mac OS. And we have grids if you're creating enterprise applications with data intensive uh, layouts, as you can see. And we have media components like media controller, media player, an option to play those videos and audio files and custom action list here and we have standard actions as you can see like uh, windows close um, virtual keyboard and lots more coming also 
um, moreover, uh, there are lots of styles for FireMonkey powered applications. For instance, you cannot find this sort of uh, various great looking uh, sci fi looking uh, styles in any other um, GUI library that is developed for Python, Python environment. For instance, this one is really cool. Like, it really looks like sci fi uh, applications. Like, if you use this style in your uh, Delta FMX powered Python application, it really looks cool and like in the movies, you know. Well, I just downloaded PyScriptor here and it, uh, it configured the Python interpreter itself. Like, it selected the, the latest version here that it that is installed on my machine. And as you can see, it uses Win32 version of the Python, right? So when you're installing packages like Delphi FMX package, uh, you should be installing that package to the Win32 version because it supports Win32 and it will be uh, easy to create applications using PyScript here. Well, as you can see, this is the official repository uh, for Delta FMX for Python here. So here, as you can see, here you can read that Delta FMX is a natively compiled Python model powered by a Python for Delphi library. All right. It gives Python developers access to the FireMonkey GUI framework and is freely redistributable. It supports Windows, Mac, OS, Linux, and Android GUI development which is fantastic. Also, there is an ebook in styles bundle where you can get um, 29 custom styles and 50 pages of content where you can start uh, this Python GUI development using Delphi FMX for Python package here. And this is the, the official page, as you can see. It is the same here, the, the data and what it supports how to use them everything like this so after installing your python on your machine you can just call the pip or package manager here and install delphi fmx and this is the python for delphi main library uh, you might say that is powering this uh, Delphi FMX for Python package here. You can just um, download as a zip file and install manually, or uh, you can just open your terminal and install the Delphi FMX using this simple command. Well, I already installed Delphi FMX for Python using this uh, this command here, and we can just test it uh, if it's installed or not. So I'm gonna say Python, and it opens the Python interpreter here, and I'm gonna import Python uh, package here, the Delphi FMX here. There we go, and we can type dar, and as you can see, it is available or here we can say show the classes of these delphi fmx package what we're going to say is dar delphi fmx and as you can see these are all the supported classes that you can use to create um, truly native firemonkey powered gui applications using your python code all right now let's open the PyScriptor and we're going to create a very simple Delphi FMX powered GUI application using our Python code. Well, I'm going to say new module here and in the main function here we can import Delphi FMX, All right? Then we can say application initialize and application 
title is going to be hello app equals form application and we're going to set the properties like caption um, the first test application main form main form app app dot show application run and app destroy let's try to run this code okay we have a little error so I think I'm going to change this to from Delphi FMX import um, start. That means we're going to import all the classes. I think that should work. Save it and run it again. There we go. This is the, the first test application that is powered by Delphi FMX, which is a, this is a, a truly native um, FireMonkey powered, but written in Python code, which is awesome. This is just a little code, so we're gonna expand this application and we're gonna use RESTful API to create something useful application. All right, so let me just simply clarify what are we doing here. So here we set the application main form to the uh, form object the form object is app as you can see we created we initialized it with form and application when we create multiple gui windows we need one main form or window to control other ui controls so that's why we're setting this uh, main form as like the app here and as you can see this is just title and we're calling the show um, function here that is going to show the main form or main window and the application run starts the GUI interaction loop between the GUI and the user of the GUI application and when we close the GUI application app.destroy function takes care of not crashing it okay before starting the the main uh, workshop uh, section of the session I'm going to show that there are samples that you can learn like there is the hello delta fmx simplest and to-do list um, sample applications that you can learn how to use buttons how to use edit box how to create them and how to set uh, click functions to the components here like this and everything else all right um i'm gonna go back to PyScripter now well i already created a new folder a new project for our uh, workshop so it is called number verification so this application takes the phone number that you're gonna provide in the application and you're gonna send that number to the uh, phone number validation restful service using this uh, it's provided API right and it, it uh, checks against the rules and provides a response JSON response that if it's valid yes it's valid it's true and the number where it's located like the country of the origin something like that so this application is going to be the GUI is going to be very simple so it will have two labels and two edit box one button and one memo component where we're going to show the JSON response all right so this is just going to use object oriented style and we have this class called main window and it's form and we're using this main window here to create the app instance here, right? And we are setting this main form to this app. 
So in this class, we're going to create all the uh, event listeners and all the UI components. For number verification, I'm going to use the NumVerify API. Well, this is the API layer website. This is the marketplace for APIs. You can also create your API and promote your service in this marketplace. This is one of the best and go-to API marketplaces I use for my projects. For instance, you can have code detection API. There's IP stack where you can locate and identify website visitors by IP address, or you can also integrate into your desktop or Android applications. All right, so I'm gonna go to API marketplace here. This will show you all the 83 APIs to get started with you. There's the verification APIs, and there's the number verification API. All right, so to get started with this API, you should create your own account here. All right, then you can get the API access key. Um, all right, for instance, if you go to the documentation, this is the API access key you're gonna get after signing up on this page. Also, there's live demo and it shows you simple examples of how to integrate these uh, number verification APIs into your uh, various applications like PHP, Go, Java, Ruby, C Sharp here. So uh, that's pretty much it for, for this API layer marketplace. So you know this number verification API globally looks your phone numbers and validates it and provides you JSON response. So let's start the application. So I'm gonna create a initialization function here. Self owner and there will be self caption, the window caption here. So number validation demo self set bounds I'm gonna say 100 184 height 644 width and we're gonna create and I'm gonna create a label self I'm gonna call it API label equals label here then self api label set props parent equals self and there will be text property like insert your api access key self api label and you're gonna provide the bounds it's going to be 10, 10, 160, 25. And there, I think we can just save and rerun this code to see what happens in our window, right? Save this and run. There we go. 10, 10, 150, and 25. And we have this label. Now, create the edit box. I'm gonna call it API text box edit. And again, API text box set props parent that would be self because these components are in the exactly the main form. There is no pattern control here. So this the parent is gonna be itself. Self 
API, text box, set bounds, 10, 30, um, 250, and 20. Let's see what will happen now. There we go. We have the edit box here that we can input the API access key because everyone will have a different API access key for their accounts. Okay, uh, here, uh, how we are defining it. So this tan means, tan means uh, 10 pixels from left to right and 30 means from top to bottom. All right, so if you changed it to 50, for instance, it's going to be lower in the form. See? As you can see. And the 250, this means this we call width, and this 20 is the height. So I think uh, it is better to copy and paste this. There we go. And I'm going to say number label. Number label, change it. And here, what we're going to say is um, enter phone number for validation and top to bottom that's going to be around 50 or let's say 60 and 200 the height is 25 that's okay so similar to this label and we need a number text box so I'm going to change this API to number, copy, and paste it here. All right. So I'm going to say 90 and 250. I think it's okay. Maybe. All right. All right. Uh, this text box, this text box, this label, this label. You have to have a, a rule to follow when you're creating the UI controls because they should be similar. Like this label has 25, 25, and 250, 250 here. All right. Let's save it and run. And there we go. Maybe you can say 70 here. Oh, that's not good. There we go. Now I'm going to create a button. So after inserting this API access key and phone number, you're going to click the button and it sends those data to the API and it processes it and uh, gives you a response via JSON. So self request button. That's going to be button class. Self request button. Parent capital case. Parent self. Self request button. We need to set bounds here. 150, 175. 130 we can give 35 here for the height and self request button text um, what we say validate check let's say check number and self request button and for the on click event you should provide the function here so like there's this there's gonna be method and now we can implement that 
method here. So outside this initialization uh, function, I'm going to say dev send uh, API request API request on click. All right, self and sender. And uh, we can do uh, API uh, integration here. All right. And I'm going to say, um, this should be, I think, self that, yeah, that would work. And to show the response, you can create a list box, to list view, or use uh, labels. But I'm going to use the uh, memo component where we can just uh, input the whole text easily. So self response memo. It's going to be memo class. Self self dot response memo parent equals self self dot response memo again set bounds and uh just say 300 so it's gonna be way far than the left side like this one and 30 from the top and hide the width should be given. All right, I think that's pretty much it for the memo. Let's um, run this code. Okay, we have a simple error. Uh, maybe we can say just pass here. Okay, let's see. So I think we just need to remove this parentheses and run. There we go. Insert your API access key, enter your phone number, and we have check number here and the uh, memo component here. Cool. Um, let's uh, implement the last uh, part where it sends, it gets the phone number, API access key, and sends to the uh, endpoint. So uh, I think you remember that there were examples using Python, right? Here, um, let's open the documentation and in the validation method here, I'm going to click the live demo. Yeah, there is the Python sample and it uses import uh, the requests package. So we also need that to import in our code, import requests. And here we can just copy this code here to our project, to this function. There we go. This is the URL. This is the endpoint we can say, and we need to provide number here. So I'm going to just delete this guy and add self dot API text box dot text. So we're going to fetch the given uh, API access key text. Oh, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be number text box. I think, yeah, that makes sense because we are giving the API access key right here. So we're going to just remove it. Self API text box text. All right. Well, as you can see here, we're using the requests dot request, and this is the get method. And we are providing the endpoint. This is the URL with the number, of course. And we have headers and payload. Payload is empty. And in the headers, we should provide API key to access our API using 
from these from this application because there should be authentication that we are saying that hey we own this uh, part of the API so we can use it with this API access key and we have the status code if you want to see and this is the result and it has response dot text all right um, I think we're gonna uh, say that self dot response memo um, what response memo there's a lines property and append the result okay I think that should work let's save it and test there we go input the API access key here then we can provide a number similar to and click the check number button there we go uh, this is true as you can see and it says country code is uz country prefix is plus 998 and country name is uzbekistan and the carrier is llc unitel and line type is mobile all right um that's pretty cool you can give any kind of number to check if it's valid or not using your this uh, Delta FMX package powered Python application. I need to use this Fireman key to create the user interface. So if you remember, I said that it supports styles, right? Here, if you download it, if you click and download the bundle, it also gives you various styles for your application. Pretty cool. So let's add a uh, style to our, this number verification application. So if you see right now, it's just very simple app, right? And to add a uh, style, you just need to write this two lines of code. Self, um, SM, like uh, style manager, style manager, self, there we go, style manager, dot set style, style streaming, and load from file, you should provide the path to use path we need to import OS um, package here Look from file and uh, OS dot path join and we're gonna get the current um, working directory and the name of the style so I'm gonna say transparent dot style because transparent that style is laying around the same working directory of this main uh, main.py file here as you can see there's this transparent dot style uh, file here yeah uh, I think that's it you know just save it so what are we doing here is that you're using the style manager component style manager class to create the style manager here called sm and using the set style method we're loading the style from the current working directory using this uh, os uh, module here and the name of the style let's run this there we go we have <laughs> beautiful application here as you can see it's it's pretty cool i hope that you enjoyed this part the workshop here we learned how to create the ui components and 
So we talked with number verification API from the API layer marketplace here. Here we are providing the API access key, the number, and sending requests to the endpoint and uh, showing that result here. All right, um, let's continue with slides and I have several things to talk about for you. Okay, let's continue with the slides. So we should talk about the Python FMX app builder here. This Python FMX app builder uh, bundles a Delphi FMX for Python app and Python script into an Android app that automates and simplifies your job to create an Android application. This is free and open source. So if you're creating native and cross-platform applications using Delphi FMX and your Python code, uh, you can use this Python FMX app builder to create, to bundle and to create and release application, release package that you can uh, deploy into store with this uh, tool. Like it manages the bundling, customization process, uses pre-built Delphi Android 64-bit ARM app and allows you to bundle custom Python script, deploy it to your phone and uh, you can also submit to the App Store. It doesn't require Delphi, but Delphi developer could extend and customize this app builder. So you can go to its uh, GitHub page. Here, as you can see, this is the Python FMX builder repository. This is built with Delphi. And if you're using Delphi FMX, which is the package we were using to create that uh, number validation application. The, all the information are given here, the requirements, and the process here. So the versions, packaging, application naming, and the app architecture. The, this is the environment, the uh, JDK and SDK configuration process. Everything is there. And we have Delphi for Python exporter. This uh, for Delphi FMX for Python and Delphi VCL for Python developers. Uh, so you can design your whole GUI graphical user interface uh, using a Delphi IDE, the VCL or FMX frameworks. And then you can export those GUI into Python code so you can continue your development with your Python scripts. So this is the Delphi for Python exporter here. As you can see, you just need to install it using the uh, get it packet manager. There we go. This is just a plugin for your Delphi ID. For instance, uh, Okay, let me use this plugin for you to showcase what it does. Well, as you can see, this is my Red Studio 11. I'm gonna open a sample application. Well, this is a sample app here and it has tab control, the auto items available, and you can just go to the tools menu after installing that exporter and you can select the uh, entire project or exactly one form to export. So I'm gonna go with the current project and give it a title, test, provide the application directory, and you can select the file kind here, like it exports the FMX or TFM file for you in a text or binary format. I'm gonna go with the text and click the export button. And this is the uh, exported file. Well, this is the, the main function for main, and there we go. So as you can see, it doesn't provide you all the code, but it uses the uh, for main.pyfmx file to load it is its um, GUI properties. So it will be exactly similar to the, the GUI design like this one. All right, 
to show you, I'm gonna just open the terminal here. Python copy paste demo.py and as you can see this is the application that is exported from Delphi to Python behaves exactly the same app that you can create with Delphi or C++ Builder. All right, um, thank you for being with me until the end. I hope you learned the basics about these new and remarkable tools, libraries, and packages. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mom and John, for that session. It looks like I have you on here to join me for q and I'm not sure, do you have your camera that you can turn on? Ah, there we go. I see ya. Hello. Hello, greetings. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, have we ever talked before? <laughs> I know no. I've vlogging and stuff around, but I don't think we've ever talked. All right, well, great. No, nice we to, have not. Nice to finally meet you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, Jim. So there's a few, in the last session, there were some questions about the uh, dunder init command, double underscore init. And so uh, Jamie has a question here. Um, it says, a def dunder init self owner. Is owner the application that was defined in um, def main? Yeah, I kind of answered to the uh, question that the def in itself owner is the initializer for the main window and we're using the main window class in the def main function uh, as the mm. entry point as the entry point for the application yeah okay all right uh let's see there's another question here from jamie um says it all seems very unfamiliar ground, very interesting. I love how this is a start to finish how to. Yeah, um, yep, you did a good job with that. I, I agree, it was great to see. You kind of went through the whole gambit of stuff. So that was very, very useful. Yeah, I was following the sessions and I kind of uh, seen that we are going from uh, bottom to top, like basics to the advanced things. And we are the kind of uh, extra uh, session what uh, the people that we are behind that we're talking about this uh, the, the technologies around the Delphi mm -hmm. and FMX kind of extra sessions for you guys yeah yeah but well, that was kind of the idea is we wanted to have the the boot camp you know be some of the basic fundamentals to help help people learn things but also you know have some other stuff that kind of expanded beyond that as well so that was great. Yeah. Uh, Gary's asking if you can set the main form icon as well in here. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. But to be honest, I'm not pretty sure because I think we, if we need to set an icon, we need to add the uh, Win API that Windows module. Uh, I think uh, we have access from. Delphi FMX for Python, but I'm not sure how to do it. But I'm pretty sure uh, in a few days, maybe we can create a demo and add to that demo to the, uh, you know, Python uh, Delphi yeah. FMX uh, repository. Yeah, it seems like I remember talking to Lucas about this in Preathon, and there is a way to do it from Python. I just don't remember what it is offhand. So yeah, making a demo and adding it to the repository, that would be a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, Richard Frank says, thank you, Mum and John, for the session. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. And Seattle Share says, I definitely feel confident using Delphi with Python now. That was an excellent session. Thank you. Fantastic. That's great to great to see. Great. So uh, I noticed you, you did show the um, FMX builder at the end for building Python applications. Actually, we just released a new version of that. Um, mm -hmm. 
just like the past couple of days, you probably saw that we had done that. So it has some new features and debugging support on Android as well. So definitely everybody should check that out uh, if you are interested in it. But thank you so much for putting this session together and uh, kind of getting everybody up to speed on how to do this. This is good information here. Yeah. Actually, we're you guys are doing great job with with these libraries, <laughs> you know. Oh, good. Thank you. I um, actually maybe we can if you have any feedback or suggestions, you know, would love to hear it because we're uh, trying to figure out how to make these better and more useful for everybody. So, yeah, uh, I follow a guy on Twitter that he always talks about Python, and uh -huh. I I kind of uh, messaged with him about this uh, libraries, you know. And yeah. he kind of liked it, but uh, he asked to like, uh, it wasn't a uh, feedback for, for us maybe uh, that I can uh, provide you. Like maybe I can work on that too. Like, you mean, uh, he said that there is no uh, official full documentation about this classes, libraries, and it's kind of uh, gets hard to the new users, you know? Yeah, the getting the, the documentation flushed out is is uh, something we're working on. Because, so I mean, it, it is in DocWiki, but it's written for Delphi and C++ Builder there. So getting that adopted for Python is, is a, uh, a bit of effort. And because we're starting with this huge library of components, right? It's not like we can just be writing as we go. There's a lot of work yeah. left to be done. So we're working on a few things around that, but definitely we'll be uh, we'll be working on that in the future. Yeah, if the uh, developers are good with uh, Delphi, FireMonkey, I think they can handle everything <laughs> because oh, yeah. the yep, Python absolutely. script, Python is very basic, you know, writing code. It's like you just type the required thing that you do on Delphi. It's very similar. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, I think that's it for right now. Thank you, Mom John. It's good to finally uh, meet you virtually and uh, definitely look forward to talking with you and working with you some more. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation for this amazing coding bootcamp. I uh, I mean, like, maybe if there are other uh, webinars that we can do, I can be an addition to the team member. Absolutely. Actually, we were talking to, I was talking to, um, Priyatham suggested that we create a um, Python GUI YouTube channel and have mm -hmm. more content around that. So absolutely, we'd love to have you helping with that and making some content on there and, and stuff as well. So yeah, that would be great. OK. All right. Thank you for having Good. me. Take care. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad to have you. OK, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of good feedback. Everybody was very excited about that. That's great. Uh, let's see what do we have coming up next. Is da, 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 da. wait, is it the end of the day? It is the end of the day. Oh my goodness! I can't believe it. <laughs> so we've made it to the end of the day. Um, we've got another full day tomorrow for everybody, and. Uh, I'm going to remind everybody to be sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, if you're not on YouTube, if you're watching somewhere else, because we are broadcasting this across multiple channels, come out to our YouTube channel at uh, YouTube. It's Learn Delphi. It's the if you youtube.com slash C slash Learn Delphi, and that'll get you to our channel, or you can search for it, or however you want to get to it. And subscribe. Actually, I can put it in the chat too. Oh, there we go. It's already in there. Someone's already taking care of that for me. Thank you. Uh, we actually have qu quite a few people helping out with this year, which is great. It's a lot less, a uh, lot less stressful. <laughs> in the past years, this has been a lot more work for me, and I appreciate having some extra help on this. So anyway, take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. We do a full day tomorrow. Lots of great stuff, and uh, should be. Uh, more content for you. So I hope you're enjoying the, the sessions so far and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care.